Good morning, everybody. Maybe it's time to start. Good morning, uh, everyone, and uh, uh, thank you for being here. My name is Stefania Spina, and uh, I speak on behalf of the, of the organizing committee of this conference. Um, I would like to give you our warmest welcome to this frame closing conference. Um, so welcome to the conference, welcome to Perugia, welcome, welcome to this university which is hosting this event. Uh, this is the University for Foreigners of Perugia uh, that is located in this beautiful and historical building. I may say beautiful, yeah, I think so. Um, OK, uh, first of all, I, I would like to bring you the uh, greetings and welcome from uh, the head of the Department of Languages, Literature and Arts. I hope it was it's the right name. Professor Sabrina Stroppa, who was expected to be here, but had a small accident a few days ago, and so she 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 cannot be here to, uh, with us today, but she asked me to welcome you all here in our university. Um, I hope you had a comfortable journey and uh, I hope you will enjoy um, your stay in Perugia, which is a um, reasonably small town, but it offers many beautiful historical and artistic things to see, so I hope you will enjoy it. Of course, I hope you will enjoy the conference. We are very, very happy to have you all here. And um, we are super excited to share with you research, ideas, etc. And we are even more excited to share with you uh, the results of our frame project tomorrow. Um, by the way, I think you will find um, some general information and highlights of the project in your conference bag. By the way, okay. our welcome also um, is extended to uh, the people um, who is who are connected from um, remotely at this moment. I don't know how many they are, but um, they should be there. Welcome to you as well. Uh, now, a few quick words on the program. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Some few words on the program. As you probably know, today uh, there will be the conference on L2 phraseology. Uh, we will have two great keynote speeches and 13 very promising presentations. And then tomorrow we will present tomorrow morning, uh, we will present the results of our project, uh, starting with another another great um, keynote speech. So let me sincerely thank all the three great keynote speakers, uh, Anna Sianova Shanturia, Phil Darant and Gabriele Parlotti. Thank you so much. Maybe we can clap our hands. Thank you for accepting our invitation and for being here. And thank you also for uh, to all the presenters who are here or remote. Um, now, moving on to, to more practical things, um, I would like also to thank all the organizing committee uh, personally uh, and uh, particularly the local organizing committee here in Perugia, Perugia Stanieri. And uh, I would like to ask you for a round of applause for uh, Irene Fioravanti. Uh, Fabio Zanda. And most of all, Luciana Forti, who made really. Uh, who made a huge amount of work and um, make this event possible. Luciana, I maybe leave you the microphone to tell some practical information about uh, important things. Thank you so much.
Hi everyone, uh, thank you for being here. It's so great to see so many familiar faces and new friendly ones. Um, yes, just a few words on practical matters. So um, first of all, I invite all presenters to come up to the table here and upload their slides in the break before their sessions. There will always be someone here, possibly me and a technician. Um, lunches and coffee breaks will be held downstairs in the library room. I believe there are signs with arrows indicating the pathway, but in case you are in doubt, just follow one of us, uh, members of the um, organizing team. You will recognize us from the badge. We have a green band. There's four of us, as Stefania said. It's me, Stefania, Irene and Fabio. Um, what else? Um, bathrooms are just on this floor. Uh, if you have trouble finding them, come up to us and ask us. We'll be happy to accompany you there. There, um, there has been a small change in the program due to some unforeseen um, circumstances. So unfortunately, um, the presentation that was scheduled for today at 11.45 is postponed to today at 17.00. 50. So that means that um, the presentation that will be given by Adria Dinka is um, now scheduled at 11.45. Um, OK, and um, that's it. Welcome again to Perugia, despite the freezing weather. And um, we all look forward to hearing your presentations and um, all the discussions that will come with it. Thank you. Thank you, Luciana. So we we'll start this first session of the conference. Um, we will have uh, a keynote speech and three presentations. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very pleased to introduce our first keynote speaker, Anna Sianova Shanturia. Anna is associate professor at the School of Linguistics and Applied, Applied Language Studies at the Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand, where she's also director of the PhD program. She works in the fields of applied linguistics, tech linguistics and corpus linguistics. Her main research interests include vocabulary, formulaic language, the L1 and L2 mental lexicon, bilingual, bilingualism, learner corpus research, academic writing and many, many others. In these areas, she has published an impressive number of articles and volumes. Anna will talk about phrasal processing, past, present and future. Uh, I maybe forgot to say that you have 40 minutes. Yes, uh, which will be followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. Thank you, Anna. The floor is yours. I'll stay here. Oh, so I don't just stay here. That's it. Sisu Chapel. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for having me here. Um, it's my second time in Perugia. I was visiting Stefania some years ago, had a wonderful time, and I'm glad to be back. Um, coincidentally, I um, um, I have my sabbatical right now, and I'm in Italy, based in Modena, so it was a short trip. I wasn't coming from New Zealand, <laughs> luckily. All right, so um, Today I'll say a few words about multi-word expression processing um, and I'll cover a few major strands of research that have emerged over the past um, 10 or so years. 
Um, I'll start with a quick um, definition of multi-word expressions. Um, just um, for us to work um, to, to have this definition in mind. So um, I define this strings of language as um, something conventional and something above the word level. So at least two words in length by definition. Now I find these sequences fascinating because they can be studied and they have been studied from many different perspectives. Psycholinguistic and neurolinguistic and corpus and computational and um, speech um, language pathologists have also been interested and uh, clinical linguists have also been interested in these sequences. So um, to be able to fully understand this uh, linguistic phenomenon, we really need to employ different complementary methodologies. Um, to get to the bottom of what these things are, how they are used, how they are processed and so on. All right, so today I will cover a few studies uh, that have um, considered different populations and different methodologies. So we'll look at some L1 and L2 adult speakers. We will also have a look at L1 children and individuals with dyslexia. So these are some of the strands of research that have emerged in my own work over the past decade. Um, this talk is not meant to be an overview, an exhaustive overview because of time constraints. Um, and I thought I would largely, although not exclusively, focus on uh, some of the projects that I had been part of, um, just to show what sort of research um, I do with my students or my collaborators, or my colleagues and so on. We will consider different modalities such as comprehension and production because they are um, important complementary sites of processing. We'll look at different L1s and different O2s, different proficiency levels, different types of multi-word expressions and different paradigms. And I will conclude with a few um, gaps that you would have, you, you'll probably see them emerging through the talk, but I'll sum them up at the end. All right, um, first let me tell you why I'm interested in different populations. Well, L1 speakers are those that we typically use as a baseline. They would have had years of experience using language um, and we typically use them as our point of comparison. Um, however, if we want to look at um, the role of proficiency or exposure to language, then we turn to other populations such as second language learners and um, children learning their first language, um, because in this way we can look at how language um, develops, uh, evolves, and whether there are any differences for different proficiency groups or different age groups in the case of children. And more recently I've become interested in um, language processing um, in individuals with dyslexia. Um, so we will um, look at two studies, very recent ones, um, with uh, these populations. All right. Let's start with comprehension because this is something that um, um, researchers started to look at um, some years ago. So some of the earliest studies are comprehension studies in L1 and L2. Um, this is one of my earliest studies that I did as, as part of my PhD. Um, in this particular study, we looked at um, a bunch of L1 and L2 speakers of English. We looked at the processing of binomial expressions, um, expressions such as bride and groom. One of the reasons why these expressions are fascinating is because if you reverse the order, you get a perfect control phrase. Um, the meaning is the same, the syntactic structure is the same, the individual words are the same, um, lexical frequency and length are, are the same. The only difference is phrase frequency. So bride and groom is frequent and groom and bride is infrequent. So you get a perfectly uh, matched control um, for the binomials. So in this study we had binomials um, embedded in a sentence and the task was to read for comprehension, which you can do uh, because we used eye movements. Uh, I know some of you are familiar with eye movements. You do not need to have an explicit secondary task. Um, participants can read in the, their own pace, um, naturally as they would read a book, um, while their eye movements are monitored. So our question was, are L1 and L2 speakers sensitive to phrase frequency distributions in language? 
this is um, a very um, brief summary of the main findings. We found that L1 and more proficient second language learners were sensitive to phrase type. Now, when you work with multiple expressions, you can choose how to operationalize frequency. You can do it in terms of the dichotomy, in this case, binomials reverse, or you can do it in terms of continuum, phrase frequency continuum. So in this study, we did both. So when we look at the phrase type, um, then only more proficient speakers were sensitive to phrase type, but not the less proficient second language learners. So here, Um, pardon me? Oh, I got you. Okay, never mind. Do you see? See it next to the mic. So the solid line um, is our binomials and the dotted are reversed. Uh, to the right hand side of the x axis, we have the more proficient, and to the left side of the x axis, we have less proficient people. So the more proficient people. Showed a clear difference, and the less proficient people did not show any difference between the two types. However, oops, when we looked at the um, continuous frequency, that everyone was found sensitive to phrase frequency distributions. So we kind of um, concluded that um, people in general are sensitive to phrase frequency distributions, both L1 and maybe to a less extent L2 speakers, but also we um, concluded that um, continuous operationalization of frequency may be more powerful than the dichotomous one. And I have since then included both the dichotomous and the continuous approach in my research and um, and the, in the projects I have been involved in, and we have by and large found the same, um, observed the same um, finding. Continuous definition is more powerful compared to the dichotomous um, grouping. Now, since that study, um, a plethora of studies have emerged and they have all confirmed um, L1 and to a less extent L2 speakers sensitivity to phrase frequency. So this finding um, is now a very um, common finding that's reported in um, research. Um, the vast majority of studies um, have looked at immediately adjacent sequences because they're the most common ones, right? But an interesting question to ask is whether um, we continue to observe the sensitivity to phrase frequency distributions if we modify in some way our target sequence. Now, these two authors um, were some of the first to look at this issue, the processing of modified or non-adjacent sequences. And these are some of my favorite studies in the field, I think, of all times. Um, so these authors used eye movements to um, analyze how L1 and L2 speakers process non-adjacent sequences. Um, and this is just an example of their stimuli. Um, so achieve status is a collocation. Um, ignore status is its control. Then they modify the sequence by inserting um, a three word phrase in the middle. So achieve a more secure status versus ignore a more secure status, right? So collocation is control, modified collocation, and then it's control. Um, Vilkaiti 2016 looked at L1 speakers and Vilkaiti and Schmidt looked at L2 speakers, but using the exact same simulate. So they're very similar studies, but one looked at L1 and the other one, the later one, looked at L2 speakers. But other than that, the, um, the studies are very similar. So they found that um, L1 speakers read both adjacent original and non-adjacent modified sequences faster than their controls. So it seems like for L1 speakers, even if you modify the sequence, they continue to exhibit this processing advantage. However, the second language learners read adjacent, the original ones, but not non-adjacent modified sequences faster than their controls. It seemed that um, multi-word expressions lost the spatial formulaic, spatial formulaic conventional status once they were modified. 
and this modification disrupted the fluency with which they process these sequences. All right. Um, a similar study was conducted by one of my PhD students some years ago. So she was inspired by uh, Vilkaitis studies and um, did something similar uh, with L1 speakers of Chinese. So in this study, that's part of her PhD thesis, she looked at a bunch of L1 Chinese speakers, um, again, adjacent um, and non-adjacent modified sequences. She considered um, different types of multi-word expressions, adjective noun and verb noun. She also used eye movements, which makes these studies fairly comparable. Um, so she had three main conditions, adjacent, um, short, uh, short modification or insertion with two Chinese characters inserted, and then long insertion with four Chinese characters inserted um, in the middle, right? So adjacent, short insertion, two Chinese characters, and long insertion, four Chinese characters inserted. All right, um, can you see the lines? OK, great. <laughs> All right, so we have, I can barely see. Um, so um, controls are in red <laughs> and the collocations are in green. We have um, no insertion, the adjacent items at the far left on the X axis, then short insertion um, in the middle and long insertion at the far right. That was long insertion and then um, short insertion in the middle and the original at the far left. Oh, goodness. Can you see at the back? Oh, excellent. Goodness. Good eyesight. <laughs> All right, so what did she found? Um, now, this is the adjacent condition, the original condition, right? No modification. And as expected, collocations were at faster than controls, right? And the uh, significance was quite, uh, the difference was quite significant. Now, the interesting question is what happens once you modify the expression by inserting two, sim two characters and then four characters? So um, when two characters were inserted, Collocations were still rate faster than controls, and um, again, the difference was significant. But amazingly, even when four characters were inserted in the middle, collocations were still read faster than their controls. Uh, obviously, the, um, the size of the effect gets smaller and smaller, but it's still a significant effect, a significant difference, sorry. Um, you see at the top, um, P point, P, um, 0.04. So the difference obviously gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you make the sequence longer and longer, but it's still significant. The difference is still significant between collocations and controls. So it seems that L1 speakers show phrase frequency effects at different levels of granularity, even with four Chinese characters inserted in the middle of the expression. What about other types of modification? Now we've just covered um, insertion, so where the original sequence um, was kind of kept intact, but something was inserted in the middle, but the beginning and the end stayed the same. Um, but other types of modifications, um, modification have also been probed in the literature. So this is a study um, con conducted by Irene and <laughs> a few colleagues. Um, it's um, in preparation and we're still collecting data. <laughs> so this is very pre preliminary. Um, so please do keep this in mind. All right, so um, Irene looked at um, L1 and O2 Italian, which is um, amazing because most of us look at uh, L1 and O2 English in our field. So it's always nice when someone considers other languages. Um, so a bunch of L1 and O2 speakers of Italian. Um, there were 60 verb noun combinations. Half of these were collocations. The other half was free combinations. 
Now, collocations um, and free combinations were decided in a couple of norming studies where we asked um, L1 speakers um, not otherwise involved in the experiment whether um, a word can be substituted without losing its original meaning. So uh, based on the two norming studies, um, half of these were deemed collocations and the other half free combinations. Um, we also had 60 controls um, in which the verb was substituted uh, with its synonym. So the um, original items were called original and the substituted items were called um, variants. So 30 collocations and 30 controls and then 33 combinations and um, 30 controls with verbs substituted. All right. So there were two phrase types, free combination, collocation, and um, two conditions, original, unmodified, and the variant with the verb substituted. Um, now, the, these sequences were presented in sentence context. Um, again, the eye movements were used, um, and the task was to read for comprehension, as is common in eye movement research, where you do not need um, an explicit secondary task, as you do need, for example, in behavioral research, um, such as um, priming paradigms. All right. Um, there were lots of things, lots of interesting things found. I'll just show you two um, slides. Now we found the main effect of condition. So um, on the left hand side, you see the original item, original, and on the right hand side, you see the variant, the modified item. So original items were faster than modified items, as you would expect, right? So if something is original and extracted from a corpus, it's read faster than um, the same items, item with um, a verb substituted with uh, a different verb. Kind of expected. Um, but more interestingly, we found we found a phrase type condition interaction. So on this figure, you have the left rectangle and the right rectangle. So the left is the original, right? And the right is the variant. And you also have um, two phrase types. Uh, you see at the bottom along the um, X axis. So on the left, you have collocations and on the right, you have free combinations. All right, so. All right, so. What we found was that if you consider the, um, the free combinations in the original and the variant conditions, it seems that they were read with the same speed, right? So whether you modified a free combination or you did not modify the free, a free combination, it did not really make a, a big difference, right? But if you modified a collocation, it did make a difference. So uh, modified collocations were um, read more slowly than their controls um, relative to the original collocations. So it seems that the modification of collocations um, leads to a processing cost, but the processing of free combinations does not seem to um, lead to a similar processing cost. Again, um, the data collection is still happening and these are very early findings but this is what we are finding at the moment all right now so far we have talked about comprehension right because this is something that has been researched uh, more than production it's harder to research production because you need to either have a giant spoken corpus or you need to elicit productions in some way right but it's not always easy to elicit uh, the production of a reverse binomial right um, and you're not going to find um, a reverse binomial in a naturalistic spoken corpus. So the vast majority of the studies have looked at comprehension and not production. So let's um, have a quick look at what has been done. Um, again, um, <clears throat> something that I have been involved in um, in the past years. Now, when I say production of multiple expressions, I mean um, processing studies where articulation of multiple expressions 
was compared to controls, for example. So I'm, I'm not talking about written production, such as uh, writing. Now, in the L1 domain, uh, there are both elicited studies and um, naturalistic spoken corpus studies. That's because there are um, suitably annotated L1 corpus, uh, L1 corpora, uh, from which you can extract articulator durations and look at how things are processed, articulated as a function of frequency. To the best of my knowledge, mo all L2 studies are elicited studies um, because um, there are few L2 corpora, and I'm not even sure if there are spoken L2 corpora that are suitably annotated for. Um, for articulations to be extracted and analyzed. Now, L1 studies um, with naturalistic corpora have um, observed shorter articulatory durations um, for more frequent phrases relative less frequent. Um, so um, researchers have noted phonological reduction, fewer pauses, um, and other um, things that suggest that um, frequency affects the way in which um, we articulate phrases. More frequent phrases are articulated faster with fewer pauses, more reduction and so on. Um, now, this is a study that um, a colleague of mine and I conducted some years ago um, in which we borrowed um, all the stimuli from the earlier binomial study. Um, and we had a bit of a dilemma how to focus on production and not both production and comprehension. So we came up with this task um, in which participants saw the phrase on the screen. They read it silently, then this phrase disappeared and then they articulated it out loud. Right? We needed production, pure production, not contaminated by comprehension, which is why we came up with this paradigm. <clears throat> All right, so same stimuli as in the earlier study that I covered at the very beginning, um, but we focus on the articulatory durations, how long it took someone to articulate these phrases. All right, and again, this is just one um, um, figure showing the main finding. So we have um, L1 speakers, um, dark gray and L2 learners in light gray. We have phrase frequency uh, along the x-axis and articulated durations along the y-axis. So we found, as expected, um, um, L1 speakers articulating um, high frequency phrases faster than low frequency phrases when frequency was treated as a continuous variable. However, when frequency was treated as a dichotomy binomials, controls, binomials reversed, then no group was sensitive to um, phrase time. Um, not so surprising for L2 learners, but we were quite surprised not to find the phrase type effect for L1 speakers, um, although we did find um, fast articulations when uh, frequency was considered on a continuum. So our, our L1 data confirmed these speakers sensitivity to phrase frequency distributions. Um, and L2 data suggested that um, maybe these learners are less sensitive uh, to phrase frequency um, in production compared to comprehension. And maybe it's harder to observe phrase frequency effects in production compared to comprehension. Um, but again, the task was a bit um, unnatural because um, if you compare uh, naturalistic production, what I'm doing now, right? Uh, to elicit production where you read something, it goes away, then you articulate it, it's a bit artificial. But then many tasks are artificial in psycholinguistic. It's not the only one. <laughs> like reading one word at a time, like RSVP, is also highly unnatural. So it would be awesome to um, probe phrase frequency effects in naturalistic production with um, L2 speakers in future. All right. Um, Let's now turn very briefly to children. Um, it's great to um, work with children because they are, even though they're L1 speakers, they are still learning their first language. So we can still look at um, 
the learning process um, in L1 children compared to L1 adults who are already kind of there. You know, they're not going to get any faster, any even if even 10 years later. If anything, you, you just see the ceiling effect and that is it. But L1 children do um, learn things and they um, do things differently um, when they're seven versus when they're nine. Now, these two authors were some of the first, maybe the first to look at um, phrasal processing in children. Uh, they used a repetition task and found that children as, a, as young as two are sensitive to um, phrase frequency distributions um, in that these children articulated high frequency phrases faster than lower frequency phrases. Um, again, with my former PhD student, um, uh, we published a study a couple of years ago in which um, we considered um, L1 Chinese um, grade three and four children um, to see whether or not they were sensitive to uh, the frequency of uh, composition of phrases. Now, eye movements allow you to look at different areas of interest, such as the whole phrase, the whole multi-word expression, as well as the final word, where the effect is often biggest because the final word is uh, the word that's most predictable and hence may be read fast or may even be skipped, which you can look at using eye movements. Um, now this is the data for the final word only. So again, I'm just showing a few main findings, but not the entire thing, of course. So um, we had adults as our baseline, and of course they found they they showed a clear phrase frequency effect with uh, collocations read faster than controls. All right. The more interesting question is what happened with uh, grade three and grade four kids. Now in grade four, we observed an emerging phrase frequency effect and mostly in the late measures and more prominent in the final word analysis. So if we used a behavioral measure, not eye movements, but something like self-paced reading, maybe we would have found no effect at all because you can't look at phrase final word versus whole phrase and you can't look at different measures. But because eye movements allow you to look at different measures and different areas of interest, we found an emerging um, phrase frequency effect in some measures in some areas of interest, in particular late measures and the final word, but not in the earlier measures or the whole phrase analysis. So they're kind of getting there. Not quite there yet, but you can see an emerging effect. And we found nothing at all for grade three kids, um, not in early measures or late measures, um, whole phrase analysis or the final um, word analysis, nowhere. Um, so <clears throat> this study allowed us to look at phrase frequency by considering uh, already a perfectly proficient mature language users, older kids and younger kids. And we see that um, unlike, unlike the earlier study by uh, Barnard and Matthews, he found phrase frequency effects in very young kids. We did not see this um, in grade three kids who were about eight. Um, but um, different modality and different L1, right? Um, so learning L1 Chinese may be a bit different and maybe more difficult than learning L1 um, English. All right, and finally, let's turn to dyslexic readers. Um, now, dyslexia or developmental dyslexia is a reading impairment in individuals with a completely normal IQ. Um, these individuals have difficulties with word recognition, uh, um, spelling. Uh, they typically have poor spelling and they also have difficulties. Um, they have um, impaired decoding abilities. It's a very common disorder that affects around 10% of the world population. Maybe a little bit more, a little bit less. It's very approximate. Now, what we know from existing studies is that people with dyslexia have may have difficulty processing figurative language like idioms, metaphors. They may have difficulty processing unexpected input. So maybe um, something that you're not really expecting at the end of the sentence or at the end of the phrase. So. I kind of became intrigued by this population and with some colleagues we conducted two studies. One, the first one looked at the figurative language processing and the second one looked at um, literal language processing because multi-word expressions are extremely diverse. 
they can be fully literal or fully figurative or somewhere in the middle of this figurative this continuum, right? So this is the first study published recently where we considered uh, English simile. And in particular, we manipulated figurativeness and familiarity, right? So we had um, figurative and familiar, literal and familiar, figurative and novel and literal novel. So we kind of manipulated uh, literalness and um, and uh, figurativeness, literality, literality and figurativeness. Um, again, we used eye movements, which allowed us to look at different areas of interest, such as the similar region, the multi word expression region, the target word, just the final word, where the effect is often the biggest, and the continuation region, everything else. Again, I'll just show a couple of um, figures um, on the. So this is the similar region, the entire, the entire thing, the phrase. So we have readers with dyslexia in green and typical readers in red. So people with dyslexia are slow across the board, which you would expect because they have dyslexia. Um, but we seem to find for both groups of participants, faster reading for familiar phrases versus novel. And if anything, this effect, the difference is big in people with dyslexia, right? And if we consider the um, final word, the phrase final word, the difference is even bigger. So look, for example, if you look at, for example, we have <clears throat> faster reading for familiar versus novel for non-dyslexic readers and an even bigger effect for dyslexic readers. So it seems that people with dyslexia benefit from the familiar nature of uh, multiple expressions to an even greater extent compared to um, people with uh, no dyslexia, or maybe they are um, more surprised by the novel uh, continuation, more surprised than people with uh, no dyslexia. So both groups showed a processing advantage for familiar simile over novel ones. Um, it seems that readers with dyslexia do benefit from the familiar conventional prefabricated nature of multiple expressions. But we also found a subtle semantic impairment in um, readers with dyslexia, re leading to a processing delay when encountering unexpected input. So when something novel was presented, they were like, oh, and slowing down more than L1 um, non-dyslexic readers. All right, um, and this is the final study I wanted to mention today. Um, again, uh, we drew on uh, vocalitis stimuli, but we added more to increase item power. Um, so same items as shown before, but read by um, individuals with dyslexia, and we used a self-paced reading paradigm, and the experiment was conducted entirely um, online during the pandemic. So here we see the data for non-dyslexic readers. Um, we have um, um, collocations, um, adjacent collocations and controls in green and non-adjacent longer ones in red. So um, adjacent collocations where it's significantly faster than their controls. Um, the pattern is there for non-adjacent items in red, but it's not significant. It's kind of marginally significant. And when we look at dyslexic data, again, we see a very similar pattern of results, um, but in both cases, um, it's only marginally significant. So collocations, adjacent and non-adjacent, seem to be read faster than their controls, but um, um, in three out of these four cases, the p-value is only marginally significant. However, we're, we're still analyzing the data and we are finding a lot of um, variability, possibly because uh, it was conducted via the internet entirely online. Um, so we're, it's, again, it's still very much work in progress. All right, so summing up. Um, in L1 speakers, we see a robust processing advantage for multiple expressions over um, novel sequences. 
Um, and this advantage seems to hold even for modified non-adjacent multiword expressions. Um, this effect seems to be less robust for L2 learners. It seems that multiword expressions may play, play a somewhat lesser role um, in L2 learning compared to L1 learning. And some suggested that this may be due to um, due to L2 learners um, having existing linguistic and conceptual knowledge. Um, or L1 children will find that Asian experience with language uh, may be key, with older children being more sensitive and younger ones being less sensitive to phrase frequency distributions. And we also find that individuals with dyslexia also benefit from the familiar conventional nature of multi-word expressions. OK, so what are some of the major gaps very briefly um, that um, we can identify based on this very brief um, overview? Well, the first one is L2 naturalistic production. So we need studies um, that consider um, naturalistic data. And for that, we need a large um, L2 corpus, spoken corpus suitably annotated for articulation, duration, extraction and analysis. Um, Still very little um, research done on um, children. Um, and no studies done on L2 children, only L1 children. So it'd be great to manipulate age, proficiency, multiple expression type further and look at um, um, phrasal processing in children. There have only been like a handful of studies. Now the role of adjacency and modification um, should also be probed further in particular in languages, um, non-English languages, because the vast majority of processing research, of course, is specific to L1 and O2 English, so we need more non-English L1 and O2. And finally, um, more studies um, on multi-word expression processing in individuals with language deficits, um, such as, for example, dyslexia. So um, more generally, and um, this is my final slide, um, the findings we have briefly uh, looked at um, today um, support the idea that the building blocks of language vary in size and complexity, and they're not limited to um, single words. These findings further underscore the role of exposure to language, experience with language, which ultimately determines the strength of representation and processing in various populations. And these findings further sit firmly and support um, well the usage-based um, approaches to language acquisition, processing, and use. An inspiring talk and also for be perfectly oh. in time. <laughs> I had the panel of one minute and you <laughs> finished. So that thank, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. So questions, uh, comments. We have 10 minutes time. Anyone? Yes, Phil. Thank you, Anya, that was great. Um, so the one that you're working on at the moment with the L1 and the L2 Italian speakers, it looked like there was no difference between the collocations and non-collocations, is that right? This That's the slide, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so you, I know you were focusing on the effect of variation there when you talked about mm -hmm. it, but it also looks like the collocations and the free combinations were similar in reaction time. Was Is that right? And was that surprising? Is that what, uh, what you expect? Uh, we looked at collocations versus controls and free combinations versus controls uh, because they were matched. Um, I don't think we looked at um, collocation versus um, combination because they were not controlled. I keep wanting to use the keyboard. So, for example, um, mantener una promessa versus guardar un film. Um, they, they're not comparable because they would have 
been made of words of different lengths and different frequency. So we looked at collocations versus controls and free combinations versus controls. And I'm playing it in this morning. <laughs> Q, does it answer the question? Any other questions or comments? Yes. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's very insightful. Actually, I have a question related to the measures of eye movement. So which measure do you choose? Did you choose for that? Which measure? Yeah, of measures for a particular study for processing, for processing collocations, for example. Uh, that's so in, in general. Yeah, like the dual time of fixation. Yeah, so um, typically I look, I consider or we consider um, total reading time, okay. first pass reading time, fixation count, mm -hmm. sometimes also regression pass duration. Um, it's important to know that some measures, for example, first fixation duration, the early measure, mm -hmm. is not very um, sensitive to phrase frequency manipulations um, because it's um, you would normally consider first fixation duration if the area of interest is a single word. But okay. if the area of interest is a multi-word sequence, then this is not a very informative measure. Mm -hmm. um, so um, first pass reading time, total reading time, fixation count. Oftentimes uh, you also look at um, skipping, mm -hmm. the probability of skipping, um, because the final word is often the most predictable, right? So if I say you can't judge a book by its cover, right? So oftentimes mm -hmm. the final word in a multi-word sequence is almost uniquely predictable. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, you see it's either read super fast or it's skipped altogether because the reader knows what's coming up. And then mm -hmm. if the expectation is violated, then they slow down big time because they, no, they do not get what they expect. So, um, I see, but uh, another question, sorry. How can you make sure the time is related to the processing? from the air movement, I mean, sometimes probably the participants just think of other something else. So they, they stop at the word. So you cannot say. Yeah, well, I guess, um, I guess you need to be careful with the instructions and ask participants to focus on what they're doing and not be distracted. Um, of course, sometimes you get uh, noise because someone, you know, had a phone with them and it Yes, yes. Um, I guess A instructions B when you're doing eye movements, you are very close to your participant, not next to them, but you are in a sort of tiny room next to them. And you can see in real time their pupil moving. I see. Mm -hmm. And I remember once when I was doing my PhD, I was there with my participant, and what and you can actually see what they're looking at. It's incredible. And they do not know that. And the <laughs> participants started reading the first line. Diagonal move to the bottom, then next trial. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> yes, yeah. um, and of course, you have a lot of items and a lot of participants so that if there is any noise, it kind of, you know, uh, kind of gets lost in the, um, in, uh, the amount of data. So you normally need to make sure you have um, decent item power and participant power. Yes, and then, yeah. of course, if someone is completely weird, then you get rid of their data. Yes, yeah. But the person is actually with them looking at their reading. Um, and as soon as they're reading not in the way you would expect, like, you know, not mm -hmm. reading is not really linear, but it's kind of more or less left to right. If someone is, you know, skipping and moving to the bottom and making this diagonal move, clearly they, they, they have skipped the um, the entire page. So you can keep an eye on the quality of all. See, the thank you, thank you. But it also will be very interesting if one participant start from the beginning and then to the end. Also will be my thinking. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? We have maybe time for one last question. Yes, Gabriele. This is a rather theoretical question. In the last slides, you mentioned usage-based linguistics and usage-based accounts of language. I'd like to know your position about what type of linguistics this is and what type of contribution your study on multi-word expressions can make to the general study of language, because sometimes it's presented like a, a radical alternative to traditional structural linguistics, or it can be seen as an expansion and as an extension of you know, traditional structural 
language analysis. How do you position yourself in this debate? Yes, um, I think everything I've done in this um, in the, since completing my PhD um, has looked at phrase frequency in one way or another. And um, most studies, if not to say every single one, has been in line with the sort of predictions of usage based approaches. So it's not um, this. There is it's not about um, the nature of these sequences, it's the sheer fact that they are common. And if something is common, um, it is processed differently from something that is not very common, even though there are exceptions. So frequency defines most of the things I do, but there's one exception, and this exception is idioms, proverbs, some metaphors. Sequences that are extremely infrequent, but nonetheless enjoy the exact same processing advantage. There's been this wonderful study by Van Lanka and her colleague. He looked at kind of zero frequency idioms and zero frequency um, controls. So frequency was matched and idioms were still processed faster than controls by kids and adults. I think it was in L1 Swedish. Um, but here we have high familiarity and saliency, right? Idioms are quite interesting, they're idiosyncratic. So if you saw or heard rainy cats and dogs, which has pretty much zero frequency in the B and C, then it kind of, you know, is never more. But anyway, we'll get to your question. Um, the way we learn language, the way we process language is ultimately defined by how often we've seen something. Um, you know, if you've seen something once, it uh, makes no difference to how you process it. If you've seen something twice, again, you haven't learned it, but maybe there's some memory trace. You've seen it three times, you feel like, oh, I think I've seen it. No idea what it means, but I've seen it. You've seen it a fourth time. Oh, maybe I can, I can guess what it means based on the context. So frequency pretty much um, defines how we use language, how we learn language. And I don't see it as a radical alternative um, to the more traditional approach. Um, I think it's my maybe naive understanding it's become kind of mainstream <laughs> in the field um, that um, it's um, the defining characteristic of how people acquire language and how they use language. Um, and I think it's important to look at different populations and look at different modalities, different methodologies, so that we can say that it's not about L1 processing of adjacent ones, but it's also about this lexical O2 processing of non-adjacent modified um, I find it quite interesting that we um, observe phrase frequency effects even with sequences that have been modified significantly where the first part and the second part are really far, you know, far away from each other with like, several words intervening. And I think this is some of the strongest evidence that, um, you know, we're just statistical learners and users. Yeah. OK, so Anna, thank you so much again. Thank you for a beautiful presentation. We can now move to our first presentation of this session. Ciao, Daniele, grazie. Catherine Ackerley and Eric Castello from University of Padua or Padova will talk about exploring phrasal verbs of action and motion in learner and native speaker narrative writing. Uh, a few moments to start the presentation you will have 20 minutes and then q a thank you so much the floor is yours can you hear me okay hello everyone good morning so today we are, can you go back to the, okay, so today we are going to present um, the results of our study on uh, verbs on action and motion in uh, uh, narrative writing. Um, so first of all, let me, we will just, I will just give you a brief introduction to uh, and review some studies on phrasal verbs and then we will move on to our data collection, our methods, results, and uh, some conclusions. 
OK, uh, phrasal verbs. Uh, well, they consist of uh, basic definition of a verb followed by one of more adverbial particles. Um, we can broadly speaking divide them into two categories, those that are literal, no idiomatic in meaning and basically they uh, often signify motion and location direction and uh, phrasal verbs that are more non-literal meaning and they tend to be idiomatic expressions and lexemes such as puts uh, somebody up and then there's a third category of phrasal prepositional verbs consisting of a prep, of a, um, a particle and a preposition um, we will refer to all of them as pv in our study presentation today um well according to research um cognitive research mainly but not only um, motion can differ, the expression of motion can differ across languages. Um, and uh, differences can be accounted for in terms of lexical verbs, particles, um, and to, that are used to express motion, manner and path. And English in particular allows um, speakers to pack information about path, motion and manner into the same clause, like in the example that I've shown you. Um, well, with regard to studies on the difficulty and on also the, the learner um, ability to, uh, to learn, to use phrasal verbs, they are difficult to acquire and they therefore are a sign or can signal proficiency, language proficiency, the achievement of language proficiency. Um, studies have proven an underuse of phrasal verbs, both in spoken and written English. Um, also, um, because students prefer using single word uh, verbs instead. And uh, this is due to the inherent complexity of phrasal verbs and an L1 interference. OK, so um, we conducted our data collection as part of the Corefl project, the University of Granada's Corefl project, which, which consists of a learner corpus of various L1 backgrounds. We used the L1 English corpus. Uh, these are freely accessible on the Internet and we have contributed to the Italian components of the second version of Carefl. We collected texts from 201 first year modern language students at our university. They completed a language profile questionnaire, a proficiency test, and the prompt from their writing for the writing task was to describe what they can see in this video clip that we're going to show you now. So it's taken from Charlie Chaplin's The Kid. It's a four minute clip and basically, as you can see, Chaplin has found a baby abandoned on the ground and he spends the rest of this clip trying to get rid of the baby. He puts it in various places or gives it to people and then he runs off. OK, so this is to give you an idea of what the phrasal verbs in our study are about, where how they are elicited. OK, so here's the data for our corpus um, um, divided into sub corpora according to the levels of the Common European Framework of Reference. You can see that um, we collected the largest number of texts for, from our B2 level students and far fewer from A2 level students. In fact, we have discounted the A2 level texts from our study as they were so few. And we're interested in investigating the frequency of phrasal verbs of action and motion across um, the B1, B2 and C1 levels. And um, we are interested in which lexical verbs occur with the most particles, which particles occur with the most lexical verbs. And then we're also interested in investigating learner and native speaker phraseology 
and the particular nuances of meaning that are expressed by the use of certain adverbial particles. So um, we tagged our corpora by part of speech and we identified the phrasal verbs by searching for lexical verbs in combination with, le with adverb particles. And we used both antconc and sketch engine because we didn't get the same results from both. So we did a lot of cross checking and we had to manually check for certain particles that weren't automatically identified. And then we did more cross checking in the phrasal verb dictionary and we categorized the phrasal verbs according to the lexical verbs, particles and um, their use across the um, efficiency levels. And based on frequency, we selected phrasal verbs um, to, uh, for the exploration of phraseology, and we use ANCONC for identifying this phraseology. OK, from this table, you get to see uh, the that we uh, um, analyzed 1614 uh, instances of phrasal verbs, which um, actually are 196 different phrasal verbs. And overall, there is a statistical, um, a significant, a statistically significant difference between the, U, the frequency in the native speaker corpus and in the, tot in the um, total of the uh, non-native speaker uh, corpus. Um, you can also see, you can also notice an increase in the normalized frequency of uh, frequency of phrasal verbs in each subcorpus. So basically, the higher the linguistic competence, the higher the their use. Um, okay, this slide is about the number of particles that um, sort of attract more verbs, as it were. So, for example, you can see that walk attracts 12 particles, followed by come, go, take, get, run, drop, and so on. And these are some examples of verbs, phrasal verbs. Um, and these slides um, plot, uh, shows the, the, num the lexical, uh, ver sorry, the particles that attract, um, you know, most of the uh, the highest number of uh, verbs, for and as you can see, up is the one that attracts more verbs, which in a way is in line with a more general finding that up is the most common particle in phrasal verbs overall in the language. OK, so this table shows uh, the breakdown of um, phrasal verbs in terms of um, frequency across the um, our four subcorpora, and um, the most frequent is pick up. And um, we've had a look at this um, together with pick back up. And this is followed in terms of frequency by run away. And we've grouped this together with walk away and go away because um, they're similar. They have similar meanings in terms of motion and direction, but Another group of verbs also has similar meanings in terms of motion and direction. We've got walk off, run off, go off and make off. And we can say that the meaning of all of these verbs is similar, although we have two different adverbial particles. And then we also want to have a look at other verbs that end in off, pass off, hand off, drop off, which also have a similar action um, in our texts and in the video clip. So I'm going to show you um, two actions now and uh, because we have investigated how these two actions are described in our corpora. So as you can see here, let's put the volume down. As, as you can see here, um, Charlie's found the baby, then he puts it back again and he actually repeats the action. The action two is basically the same action. OK, so let's see what our um, students have done to describe the action. Now, um, the graph represents the total number of descriptions of the action. OK, um, and represents the percentages of the verbs used. So 97% um, of the native speakers who actually described the action, because not all students described the action, 97% used the verb pick up. And this is also popular among the C1 level students, 
whereas the B1 level students prefer to use the single verb take. OK, and this is also pretty common um, by the B2 students, but we've got um, fairly, fairly equal amounts there. What about the second action where the action is repeated? It's totally different and we can see that the native speakers here in yellow, they're using pick back up to denote repetition. And pick back up isn't popular at all with the students. Uh, we can see that they like to add the adverb again. They use the phrasal verb take back. And we also have in grey take. And this is used in conjunction with phrases such as take once again, take a second time, take a yet another time. This reflects somewhat Italian phraseology. Prendere ancora una volta. OK, so um, we have a slight difference. We've also got some creative language like re-pick up, which I like. OK, and but what's more striking is the phraseology used by the B1 level students because we can see real strong L1 influence here because we've got take the baby in his arms, takes him in his arms, which is a direct translation of the Italian prendere in braccio. And remember that they didn't use phrasal verbs um, to describe the first action. OK, and now we've got the um, um, more of a breakdown of the phrasal verbs that ends with the particle away. We've got run away and take away, which are used in all subcorpora. But go away, which has the same meaning in our corpus, is not used at all by native speakers. As for the off particles, We've got walk off, run off, which essentially are not used by the learners, just by a couple of the C1 level students. They're used by the native speakers and the native speakers also use okay, very low frequency, but it's present in our corpus, go off and make off. And you can see that in general, the um, learners are not using the um, particle off as much as they use away. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how the learners use away at B1 level. So in this picture, we have a B1 level student describing how Charlie goes away. And in the second picture, Charlie, oh, sorry, the man walks away. The native speaker uh, example here shows that Charlie Chaplin runs off. And then walks off. OK, and Eric's going to talk in more detail about the frequency of these particles. Okay, to ensure comparability among individual speakers, we normalize the data according to the frequency of tokens produced by each speaker to the basis of 1000 words and then we plotted the uh, the distributions and you so you can get to see the distributions. Um, so basically the native speakers, you notice they use both away and off in combination with these verbs, um, whereas as you can the learners use very the, the particle of very very infrequently um yeah and then we if well to we checked whether there was any statistical significant statistically significant difference at all between the subcomponents and we ran a Krusko Wallis test and as you can see there is no statistical a uh, significantly different, uh, statistically different difference. OK, whatever <laughs> in uh, regarding a way, whereas there is the, um, there is a, stat uh, a significant, uh, statistically significant difference <laughs> for off, especially with regard to with, with regard to the NS component and the lower levels. OK. Um, so now we would just like to explore some of the concordance lines. Actually, these are all the uses, all the uses that at B1 and B2 level of the of the particle of. As you can see, the learners don't really use of to express motion. Just the first one, and it's it's a bit, uh, um, uh, it's a bit, it's also wrong. I mean, they also make a mistake in the first line. So the cigar. Is cigar fall off, right? 
Um, whereas at C1 levels, um, the learners, this is a selection of all of them, they actually use off also to express motion and we see run off, runs off. We all we also see the verb drop, OK, drop off to a lady, which is probably not so correct, but still there is this attempt and um, and other uses. The natives actually native native speakers use um, on an all array of verbs to express motion. So walk to even walk and run, but also take also make go sprint, right? And also they use an array of verbs to express this hand over to someone movement. So they all use horn, they use hoist. Um, and, and what is interesting is that this uh, off seems according to also the concordance line, concordance lines, it seems to express a negative connotation. And this is also kind of attested in the long in, in dictionaries, learner dictionary in particular, because as you can see, the definition of runoff has this idea of people, you know, a person leave a, um, a place um, in a way that people disapprove of. So this is negative. And so this negative connotation is probably something that the learners still have to learn to get more proficient at uh, describing uh, this, do, doing this kind of writing. OK, so what can we conclude from this? brief study. Well, we have seen a wide range of phrasal verbs to describe motion and action, and the frequency of use increases according to the level of proficiency. We've identified some lexical verbs that are highly productive, such as walk, and some particles that um, co-occur with a high number of verbs, such as up, off and away. And this kind of study can help to identify those verbs and particles which could be of most use in the development of language learner materials. We've also seen that some phrasal verbs can be essential. Some people say, well, there's always an alternative to a phrasal verb, a single verb alternative, or perhaps they just enrich the language and can be used by the higher levels. But some are actually necessary, as we assume with the case of pick off in the description of the first action where nearly all of the native speakers um, use it. We've seen that learned phraseology is influenced by the first language at all levels, but in particular at B1 level. Even at C1 level, learners um, lack precision in their choice of verb particle combinations. They're not entirely um, sure about exactly how they can be used. We've seen how this particle off adds finer shades of meaning, and there is this negative connotation that um, the learners don't seem to be aware of. We, we think that off adds to the idiomaticity of phrasal verbs. Away has this literal meaning, off is slightly more idiomatic, and this is something that our learners don't seem to have got to grips with. Um, so we think that studies such as this can help to identify those phrasal verbs that are essential for the B1 level learners and that can be of use in the development of materials for teaching advanced and specific vocabulary for the higher levels. We'd like to compare this data with spoken learner corpus. In fact, there is data collection going on in the Corefil project for um, spoken descriptions of um, the same video clip. And um, yeah, as I've said, uh, these findings can inform the creation of teaching materials. And this is something that we would like to do as we um, collected data from first year university students. And we've actually got those same students in the second year now. So um, we're going to be working on phrasal verbs with them. Sit. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine and Eric, for your presentation. We have five minutes for questions and comments. Yes, Helen. Thank you very much. That was really interesting and lots of uh, ideas that we could also do with students. I think this would be a really fun little project as well. Um, I was, um, I mean, it was a very nice graph when you saw the frequencies of the phrasal verbs from the lower proficiency levels to the native speakers, but I noticed that you were using word based. Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Normalization basis. 
um, was it a thousand words or 10,000 words? And was wondering whether it might be worth, or maybe you've already done that, so question, can we normalize per verb phrase? And what would then, the, what the, the pattern look like? And then later on you had actions that were, I think you annotated the corpus for, for action. Um, I think that's a really nice baseline and it'd be really nice to see comparisons because that could have methodological implications for other studies that take word based um, baselines that may skew the results. I don't know. Um, so you mean this part? Yeah, exactly. Any other questions? Anna? Thank you very much for the lovely talk. Um, a, a very quick question. So you mentioned the um, the video was four minutes. Um, how long do you take participants to um, do the narrative? Did you, did you measure, did it vary, did it make any um, yeah, difference? We, we, have, we have got that data. Um, we didn't take it into account mm -hmm. in this analysis. Uh, they were basically given, uh, we had a 90 minute session in which we explained what they had to do. Mm -hmm. We introduced them to the task. They had to complete the questionnaire and the proficiency test. And um, there wasn't a limit on uh, time for writing this, but if we wanted mm -hmm. to examine the amount of time that they took, we, we could do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So s someone might have produced their uh, piece of writing in five minutes, someone Absolutely. might have taken half an hour. And absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. They are free to, yeah, they are free to, you know, write, uh, take their time to, to write. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, we didn't show the average number of texts, but um, the text length did vary. And you could tell that some students did it pretty quickly and, and others wrote lengthier texts. Um, we didn't, uh, the prompt didn't give any indication of the kind of detail that they were supposed to provide. So some students were incredibly detailed and they wrote interpretations of the story, how they made it, how it made them feel, etc. And others wrote, wrote a very short summary indeed. So um, yeah, we have variety there and that is something that could be investigated as well. There's also the issue of the A2 level students. Some of them were actually pretty good. We had 13 texts and a couple were way above two, uh, A2 level. And we think that they spent so long doing their texts, they didn't leave themselves enough time for the test at the end because they actually wrote the text first and then they did the test. And so that's another reason why we left them out of the study because we weren't actually convinced that what they wrote was A2 level, they weren't A2 level. OK, maybe one last very quick question, Jenny. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you for the oh, sorry, uh, very interesting talk. I think really how you zoomed in to the specific uh, parts of the video and how that was encoded at different levels. Um, I'm not familiar with this corpus. Um, you said it's there's different L1 backgrounds, and I was wondering if you know of any work that's been done on Germanic languages that would also other Germanic languages that would have that particle. Um, Speaking yeah. in the microphone. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, it, if you have a look, it's it's on the internet. If you look up Corefel, then you will find that there is also a German component. So yeah, that is something. Spanish and German. Yeah. First. Yeah. That would be interesting to look yeah. at proficiency and L1 it background, would. right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. maybe you don't see the proficiency effects for languages that do have that no. similar particle. Absolutely. That would yeah. be interesting. Yeah, that's all the work of the University of Granada anyway. So we've, we've just done the Italian part. Very Thank you. Thank you, Catherine and Eric. Thank you so much. And uh, next presentation will be online. Um, Alfa, can you hear us?
Yes, good morning, Hello. everyone. Can you hear me? Good morning. Uh, so you can probably share your slides. Yes. And uh, you will be talking about uh, phraseological patterns in English non-finite clauses, a corpus-based study of business English. We... Apro teams, yeah. Okay. No, I don't need to. Sorry. Can you see the slide? Yes, we can. We can see the slides. So, Alpha, you have um, 20 minutes and I will. Sorry, I will have to um, say, remind you um, orally the time you have left. OK, 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 you can start. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, before before I start, I would like really to extend my heartfelt thanks to the organizing committee. Um, uh, for their efforts in putting together this event. So, as you can see, my talk is about exploring phraseological patterns in English non-finite clauses, a co based study of business English. Um, this is the outline of my talk. So, I'm going first to start with the scope and focus of this study. Um, this study focuses on non-finite clauses, um, which types to infinitive clauses, ING clauses, and uh, past participle clauses. And unlike um, previous studies on non-finite, which gave primary consideration to the verb in the matrix clause, this study focuses on uh, non-finite patterns headed by three headboard targets, namely nouns or pronouns, adjectives, and adverbs. And these targets are chosen in order to give better chance of uh, hitting up in varying categories of non-finite and the phraseological patterns. Um, because maybe attention to this phraseology in academic writing may help the FL learners in general gain more insight of the wider context and use the target patterns in an appropriate way that ties well with the specific communicative purposes in the disciplinary community. Existing studies, however, are typically about the syntactic and the functions of non-finite. They are not phraseological in nature, and thus they may be at risk of first masking the real complexity of occurrence patterns in the data. Um, second, obscuring the full meaning bearings and therefore uh, making generalizations about the use of non finite structures in a given discourse. Um, to give you an idea about the corpus uh, that I compiled for the purpose of this study, it's made of two different genres. Um, academic and news discourse. The academic is um, a representative sample of academic text collected from uh, journal articles, from four renowned journal, um, journals, and uh, students' uh, dissertations, MA dissertations and PhD thesis collected from five different institutions in uh, Tunisia, uh, faculties about economics and management. And uh, the news texts are collected from uh, The Economist and Financial Times. Uh, as you can see, the total number of words is considered sufficient for exploring um, uh, lexical grammatical features in general. So what are the objectives of this study? First, to extract and investigate the use of non-finite clauses in the phraseology in a business corpus compiled by the researcher. Second, to analyze the distribution of non-finite patterns in the phraseology across genre. And here we have two different genres, news, versus academic, and third, to examine how semantic and discourse sanctions are included in non-finite clauses and how they vary across genre. So the methodology adopted in the study, I started by compiling the corpus. I used a stratified random sampling, um, except for the uh, dissertations of students and thesis. Uh, these were based on convenience sampling, requiring the consent of the students. Then I annotated the corpus using Nudge software package for the parsing and the uh, for the parsing and tagging. Um, I analyzed the corpus quantitatively and qualitatively. A quantitative analysis is a frequency-based approach, and the qualitative is a is a phraseological-based uh, approach. And also, it encompasses an inventory of semantic and discourse functions of non-finite. So. I started with a frequency-based uh, analysis in an answer to the first research question about how the phraseological patterns in these non-finite structures vary across the corpus. 
and I started by uh, measuring the lexical diversity and uh, lexical density uh, in an aim to investigate the heterogeneity or homogeneity of the data and the corpus. And the results confirm the homogeneity of the academic subcorpus, it means the journal articles and the Tunisian dissertations in terms of standard type token ratio. However, it was a bit different with the business and news. Um, the lexical variety in the business and news um, appears to be high. And um, you know that new media, uh, unlike other discourse types, displays lexical variation full of new words, new coinages. Um, the second thing is that the, there is a statistically significant difference between the three subcorpora in terms of their lexical diversity and lexical density. I use the uh, tool of automatic analysis of lexical diversity of Guy. Um, I found also that the Tunisian novice academic writers use fewer lexical items than their counterparts in the journal articles. And um, findings of lexical density, namely uh, types and tokens in the Tunisian dissertations, were found to be closer to the results of those in the business news rather than the journal articles. Um, um, to continue with the target words, the phraseology used with the non finites, um, and when I say the target words here are the nouns, pronouns, adjectives, or adverbs. The most salient uh, patterns found were the adjective or nouns followed by the two infinitive. These were uh, overused by the Tunisian graduates, um, which are often referred to as lexical grammatical teddy bears. Uh, on the other hand, they underused other patterns, such as um, adjective followed by uh, ing or adverbs followed by ing. Also, there was no significant difference between the three subcorpora in terms of their association score. For the association score, I used the mutual information cube. Um, also, there was a higher frequency of split infinitive in the uh, academic corpus, in the journal articles and Tunisian dissertations. But these were rare in the business news, and it would be due to its prescriptive objection. There was also um, the use of superlativeness uh, frequently in uh, the business news, but also in the Tunisian uh, dissertation. And we know that um, the domain of academ academia, it has its own conventions, uh, which prescribes, along with other rules, a limited use of uh, superlativeness. But uh, um, examples gleaned from the Tunisian dissertation, there were uh, phrases such as, um, this is the first study to investigate, which were used more frequently. Uh, while comparing the list of academic nouns with the core academic word list of Gardner and Davis, it was found that 32.7% uh, uh, of these academic nouns were found in the journal articles. However, only 17.5% were um, found in the Tunisian dissertations and 10% in the business news. This also indicates um, a fewer use of academic nouns uh, with the Tunisian dissertations. Um, another thing, there was a frequent use of first-person uh, plural pronoun we in Tunisian dissertations, though the dissertations were single authors, um, but there was a frequent use of uh, the plural pronoun we. And part of the explanation um, could be the influence of the French language, because uh, students are instructed in, in, in French language. Um, as you know, the French language rhetorical conventions, uh, they use on or nous as an aphorial we, where the author refers to himself alone using the plural pronoun. Another thing was found is that the, um, uh, the phrases of uh, nouns, or like past participles, or what we call the passive structures, were more prevalent in the academic uh, discourse, reflecting an affinity of indirectness and uh, uh, impersonalization. And when it is used in the business news, uh, it, it denotes a more active representation of facts and events rather than agents. Um, there was a fairly even distribution of open structures as the values were less than one using the deviation of proportion and the normalized deviation of proportion. But when further dividing the, each text into 20 parts, an uneven distribution was found. Uh, now, an overall hypnosis of comparing the subcorpora uh, in terms of using these patterns uh, revealed interesting results about the differences and striking similarities. Um, the non finite patterns were divided into 16 patterns. So, when comparing the journal articles with the Tunisian dissertations, 11 out of 16 patterns were significantly different. 
uh, but when uh, comparing the two different genres, business news with the journal articles, um, more differences were found. 14 were significantly different. However, the picture is a bit different when we compare the business news with the Tunisian dissertations, as only seven out of um, uh, 16 patterns were significantly different. And this may raise the question of whether the Tunisian uh, writers are tethered closer to uh, the news discourse style than the academic style as in the journal articles. And to completely understand this uh, phraseology approach and, or, or a semantic approach is needed to understand where the similarities reside. So I'm going to move on to the phraseology based um, analysis. I relied on three basic micro searches using an inductive corpus driven approach to capture the variety of phraseology. So, um, using knowledge regular expression operator whereby the head word preceded by the cleaning operator here. So, we have the cleaning operator is the asterisk. So, it can be one lexical slot preceding the adjective or noun for back to infinitive, or it could be two or more than three. So, and, so Nofa, um, you, you, have, you have 10 minutes left. Sorry, 10 minutes. Thank you, thank you very much. So, um, um, drawing on this phraseological elements of these two examples, um, it was found that the phraseology uh, varied in the three levels of micro searches across uh, the corpus. Um, if I show you here the, um, um, the two tables which record the quantitative results in terms of normalizing frequencies of the phraseology, uh, we can see that the first uh, phraseology of one lexical slot preceding the adjective or the noun um, uh, takes the lead um, in the three sub opera whether in the journal articles, in the Tunisian dissertations, or in the business streams. Let me get back to the results. So, uh, the, um, another thing is that the Tunisian academic writers showed the mature phrase complexity, particularly in the use of adjectival and nominal phrases, which were not quantitatively different from the journal articles. Uh, the types of modifiers also varied widely, and uh, range it nearly from repeating the same types of collocates. So we find the modifiers more and very collocating with adjectives like important and difficult more frequently in the Tunisian dissertations. Also, they relied heavily on nouns modified by attributive adjectives. And then uh, I will show you what are the most uh, frequent use of collocations in the sounds. Um, also, there was a frequent use of prepositional phrases, mainly of phrases in the Tunisian dissertations. However, in expert writers' uh, support, they, um, they relied on extensive phrases and embedding in noun phrases with other prepositional phrases. Um, finally, infelicitous combinations, however, were found in the Tunisian dissertation. So we find collocations uh, such as hard effort, or strong ability, or good. A solution of good ability, which were nowhere to be found in the expert writers corpus. Um, let me show you also uh, the two graphs here that illustrate the percentage of occurrence of the adjectives that pre-modify the head nouns followed by uh, to infinitive. Uh, these are the two academic uh, sub corpora of the journal articles and the Tunisian dissertation. If we focus on the second graph, about the Tunisian dissertation uh, phraseology, we can see that the most frequent noun phrases here are a new way or the previous study or uh, more attention. These are the most frequent nouns as attested by the Collins Copeland grammar pattern. Uh, so Tunisian novice academic writers rely on these combinations. For them, they represent, uh, uh, as I said, like uh, lexical teddy bears. They are the safe choice for them. So they were used more frequently. Um, to con continuing in the same context of phraseology analysis, the mean and contribution of non finite patterns range from restricted phrases, so we find phrasal verbs um, in addition to other conventionalized phrases, such as in so doing, uh, in order to, to semi restricted phrases where lexical thoughts can be substituted by other lexical items, um, uh, such as generally speaking or roughly speaking, to um, combinations getting the figurative sense. So the business news here abounds with non-finite phraseology, which has figurative meaning. Um, if we look at this graph, we can find here the, um, uh, we can see that the business news has the highest frequency of phrasal verbs, whereas the journal articles in uh, Tunisian dissertations use less. Um, another thing also is that um, in the use of restricted non-finite phrases, these are much more frequent in the Tunisian dissertations. 
and uh, the journal articles recorded the highest proportion of semi-restricted phrases. I move on to the last part about uh, the semantic and discourse preferences encoding in the mental math structures. So I relied on the framework of uh, evaluation of Susan Winston, exemplified by the trace rather system of evaluation, including status, value, and relevance. Um, I also use the categories of modality, epistemic perception, and biotic desire, along with the view and positions, internal and external. Internal is more subjective. External is more neutral, objective, or reflective. And these are provided by SMC. I extended also the function of value to include not only attitudinal values uh, and the subjective judgment, but also um, the affect, including expressions of emotions and uh, feelings. And the last parameter, of evaluation is relevance, which is meta discursal, and it refers to identifying the significance of the information given, so it is content oriented, um, uh, uh, or it can be also uh, uh, about the part of the discourse. Um, sorry, sorry, you have five, five minutes left. Thanks. Five minutes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so if you look at this graph, it, um, uh, it presents the overall uh, frequency and distribution of evaluated uh, non finite patterns. And as you can see, the semantic functions associated with category A, which represents the more objective or neutral side, are prevalently more frequent than category B. Um, Tunisian advice writers also use non-finite semantic patterns that invoke dyontic inclination. So we find phrases such as it is more important or more necessary, um, uh, which uh, uh, invoke uh, dyontic or obligation more than expert writers. There was also significant frequency preponderance of relevance markers, namely in the evaluation of content, and it is clearly observed uh, in the Tunisian dissertation as well. Um, the three subcorpora use fewer non finite patterns under the category of uh, effect. And uh, it was found that the Tunisian novice writers used emotionally, lexically charged items, so find adjectives like. Uh, anxious or uh, keen, uh, among others. Now, when comparing um, uh, the, uh, let's say, the semantic patterns in the corpus, and when we focus on the last uh, column, uh, particularly when comparing the Tunisian dissertations with the business news, we can see a non-significant difference in the use of modality and value uh, when, when we compare these two subcorpora, which are different genres. This entails that in terms of modality patterns, the Tunisian students show a tendency to evaluate their claims in a way closer to the news discourse than that of the academic uh, prose. So I come to the conclusion of my uh, presentation. Uh, this study identified a number of findings in relation to the investigation of lexical grammatical patterns and uh, phraseology of non finites in the domain of business. Um, if we rely merely on the of occurrence, this so uh, for the frequency of the target structures with estimates about the dispersion and association measures can be um, informative um, as the deviation of proportion or the uh, mutual information cubed. Uh, also, Tunisian advice academic writers based on these results, need further instruction support in how to vary this uh, their phraseology uh, use and how to evaluate their claims. Um, finally, uh, EAP learners and teachers can exploit the outcome of the corpse based investigation of the non clauses in the current study, namely the salient patterns and, and the core in, in a particular genre, like the business genre. And, in the study to state their claims and construct their arguments in conformity with disciplinary conventions. I have come to the conclusion of my <clears throat> presentation. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Olfa. Thank you, and uh, I'm sorry, I, I forgot to mention your affiliation before, which is um, University of Monastir. Uh, yes. OK, um, any questions? Uh, the, the sound was not perfectly, perfectly clear, but I hope you had the possibility to follow the presentation. Are there any questions? Or comments? D 
did you uh, sorry Olfa, did you mention how how um, did you uh, you mentioned dispersion? Um, did you also mention which kind of measure of dispersion is I mean uh, you consider to use or you have used? I use the deviation of proportion of this. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Olfa, and uh, uh, thank you for being thank here. You. Um, even you, you could not join us here in Perugia. Thank you again. Thank you. And we can maybe move to our last presentation be, be before the first coffee break. Um, we will now have Chin Chui, Chui King. Uh, I'm sure I didn't pronounce correctly, from the University of Bologna. Sorry. Yeah, I know for you it's easy, not the same for me. <laughs> um, she will speak about collocation processing in writing and translation between Chinese and English, a corpus based and key logging analysis. And the floor is yours. 20 minutes. It works, it works, yes, yes, no problem. Uh, good morning, dear all. My name is Qing Chiu Qing. I'm a PhD student from the University of Bologna. Um, uh, thanks for the organizing committee. I feel very privileged today to be here to present my PhD research project in front of you. So before I proceed, I would like to start with an example from the movie Matrix. Uh, Neil asked Oracle, are you saying I have to choose whether Trinity lives or die? Oracle replied, no, you have already made the choice and the Chinese translation is provided. So as you can see from this example, we usually say make a choice instead of saying uh, perform or conduct a choice. And in Chinese, it is the same situation. So why so? Because it is the, uh, the two words are frequent co-occurrences. So here comes to my topic today, that is uh, collocation. The title of my thesis is uh, Collocation Processing in Translation and Writing Between Chinese and English, a corpus space and key analysis. Today, I will firstly give a brief introduction by providing the rationale and proposing the research questions. And then the, res the research design, including the participant, task, test, and method will be further explained. Because my uh, project is now taken in shape, so we haven't had the preliminary result. So I will just focus on the data processing and the analysis plan. OK, uh, so why we choose the topic collocation? Because we believe that collocation facilitates language development and plays an essential role in producing fluent native-like language. And using corporal to, uh, to study collocation can provide us with direct information about the collocational patterns produced by the L1 and L2 users. Uh, multiple studies have proved that processing collocations not only reflect the collocational competence and the linguistic fluency, but also reveals the psychological effort in cognitive processing. So in our case, how do we, uh, how do we process uh, collocations. So to operationalize the processing of collocation in this study, we choose pauses as our indicator. And uh, a study in 2006 indeed found out that pauses might be an indicator uh, of uh, psycholinguistic valid multi-word expressions, but they need more data set and further pause information to confirm their findings. And then it comes to the question, how can we know the pauses or how can we record the pauses? So in this study, we use keylogging. Keyloggers enable researchers to register the typing flow and reconstruct the activities at the keyboard. So from the keylogging data, we could know the typist typing speed, the start and end time of each keystroke and pauses and other information. Uh, when, it's, when it comes to pauses, 
we got another problem because it is obvious that not all the pulses should be considered or the pulses of interest because of the typing noise or now different typing behaviors. So we need a threshold. Uh, in this study, we have a baseline set as 200 milliseconds and the pulse below the threshold will be considered as lagged and will be excluded. OK, based on this, in a nutshell, my study will focus on native Chinese speakers use of collocations in L1 and L2 text production as, as keylogged. And within a corpus-based approach, we aim to analyze the aspects of collocations such as syntactic dependencies or syntactic relations and the corpus metrics, including fre frequency, mutual word information, uh, sorry, mutual information, log dice score, and combining this data with the pulses information recorded by the keylog input log. By doing this, we are trying to bring the product and process oriented perspective together. Um, three research questions are proposed. What is the correlation between collocations and pulses? Does the correlation show more evidence in translation than that in writing? And does the correlation show more evidence in L1 than that in L2? To answer these research questions, let's move to the research design. So as for the participants, 18 Chinese master students measuring in translation and English language and literature were recruited as our participant. They are uh, L2 is English and a uh, B2 level uh, language competence is required. So all the participants were required to conduct the four, uh, four tasks. Uh, including one writing and one translation task in each language. And beside this, uh, we also designed a typing test before the four formal tasks. So here is the information about our typing test. Uh, this is actually an adapted input log official copy task. Uh, this text includes typing, copy a block once, copy a sentence once, copy a sentence and copy several word combinations and copy a text. And the, the context in blue are our extensions to the official one. Uh, why we want to do this? Because uh, the, the aims are twofold. Firstly, we want our participants to get familiar with the experimental setting. And secondly, what is more important, we want, because different participants have their own typing behavior and the typing speed and the post behavior. So we will use this data as the individual baseline for further analysis. And then about the research design, the method. Uh, uh, in general, all participants were required to perform the tasks uh, using their own laptops with the input log on during the whole process. And after that, they are required. They were required to upload the final text and the input log, input log files. After we got the, uh, the two types of data, we will follow the following procedures to do the data processing. Step one, we will identify collocations by syntactic dependency parsing. Step two, we will use corpora to count frequency and association measure scores. Step three, then we will select our potential collocations. Step four, then we will locate the pulses proceeding and within the potential collocations, and then exclude those with pulses lower than the threshold 200 milliseconds. Then we will explore the correlation between collocation and the pulses. Here is the general plan. Oh, sorry about the format. Uh, and the tools included are syntactic dependency parsers for each language. And the, we use a sketch engine is adopted for corpora and the corpus metrics data. And we use the input log Chinese version to do the key logging. Uh, uh, the, the Chinese version is not officially released online, so we asked the, the uh, professor from the University of Antwerp, Professor Luke Van Weyers, for help. So he provided us with the beta version. And besides this, we also use a screen recording software called EV, uh, because just in case, for example, if you cannot figure out what is going on during the writing and translation process, so at least you can go back to the recording to, uh, to, for a double check. Um, about the processing and analysis, uh, I will start with the input log inbuilt data. More specifically, I will use the general analysis uh, from the, uh, the software input log because it provides all kinds of data, uh, include uh, each, each action, each action such as your mouse movement, your key presses, your deletions during the typing. 
and then we could know the exact start end and action time of each key presses of each key press and also the post time is uh, provided however when we use input log we have some problems uh, because of the specific Chinese linguistic features. So the, there are some mistakes when it's come to the post location. So we need to revise the post location manually to do the data cleaning. And then when it comes to the processing collocation with the metrics and the pulses, uh, let's take a verb object relation as an example. I used the BNC corpus in sketch engine to do a collocation study of the keyword choice. And the result is sorted by the log dice score in a descending order. So I pick two verbs as the collocate, which are make and offer. Uh, so now just imagine you are typing and the dots indicate pauses during your typing. I will make a careful choice. And uh, I will offer a choice, a good choice. So about the pauses preceding the two verbs make and offer, what would you expect? Uh, as for this example, uh, I have three uh, questions. Question one, are the pulses proceeding and within Mac shorter than those of offer because of a higher log dice score or because of other variables? Question two, how about that in translation and in writing? As we know for translation, because there is a source text, so translation is a kind of restricted production. However, when we uh, write, we have more space. We can choose the expressions we like uh, without taking the, the sentence structure into account. So uh, in this sense, as for the verb object relation, we want to know are the pauses before verbs in translation sh shorter than those in writing? And then the third question is that, how about that in L1 and L2? Uh, for instance, still uh, in this example, are the pauses before verbs uh, in L1 shorter than those in L2 because we are more proficient in L1 using? These are the questions need, need to be further explained, uh, explored and answered. And in my case, the L1 is Chinese, so we will have another look at the Chinese example. Uh, sorry about the format again. OK. Um, I basically did exactly the same procedure in Sketch Engine by using a Chinese co uh, corpus. Uh, I did a, key, a collocation study of the keyword, uh, which is a Chinese noun, and I chose two verbs as the collocate. Uh, now we are trying to, uh, with, with different log dice, uh, log dice score. Now we are trying to type in Chinese. 我会做出选择. Probably you are curious why I'm typing in this way because I'm not typing Chinese. Uh, actually, we don't type Chinese characters directly. When we want to type in Chinese, we firstly need to think of the uh, phonetic representation, which is called a pinyin. For instance, we want to type ni hao. We firstly need to think of the pronunciation ni hao, and then we type the five letters n i h a o on the keyboard. And then after that, uh, a window having several options just to show up on the screen. We read all the options and we choose the characters we want. So that is how it works and we call it PE input method. So the, the example is uh, it means I will make the choice. OK, another example is 你, 你必须在两者之间进行选择, which means you have to make a choice between the two. So in this sense, if we want to know the, the, the pauses preceding the Chinese words, we actually need to uh, we actually need to look at the pauses per, preceding the letters, preceding the letters. In this sense, it makes the Chinese uh, Chinese data comparable to the English ones. So after that, we will further explore the differences uh, in English and Chinese and in translation and in writing. Uh, so the, the data analysis is the next step. I hope I could get the preliminary results soon and share it with you. And uh, here's the references. Mm, thank you very much for your listening. Thank you also for your perfect timing. Questions, Anna? 
Thank you so much for this um, absolutely fascinating talk. I think it's the first processing study using key logging that I've ever heard about. So that's super novel. Thank you for that. I have um, two quick methodological questions. The first one is, um, why did you choose MI and log dice? I'm just curious what logic you followed in choosing your association measures. And my second question um, is, what guided you in your selection of the 200 millisecond threshold? Thank you. Yes, about the first question uh, about the first question, actually about the mutual information score and the log dice score, we, it is not clear uh, whether it's related to pulses or not. It's just a uh, try because it, they are the two uh, variables. Are, sorry, the two score are more important in uh, collocation studies, so we will. It's just a preliminary selection, I would say. And about the second question about the threshold, mm, the 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 lowest level is 200 milliseconds, but we still need to check whether we need to raise the threshold. So to to say like a 400 milliseconds, because we need to uh, see the data of each participant, and then we will see the threshold. Why 200? Why not 150? Why not 100? Why not 300? Why did you start with 200? Were you guided by anything in the literature? Yeah. Yes, basically like 200 uh, from 200 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds. Because I think it's a threshold that would be acceptable in sort of. Um, kind of more traditional processing studies, uh, but it's um, key logging. So we're just wondering, you know, um, whether you drew on the more general processing literature um, mm -hmm. in this in this threshold selection. Yeah, basically studied from the literature review mm -hmm. and also because I have another project before and uh, we set the threshold as 200 mm -hmm. milliseconds. Thank you. I'll be really looking forward to hearing more uh, about you. the result. Thank you very much for your suggestion. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Nate. Yes, thank you very much. Also very much looking forward to the, the results of this. Uh, really nice to see more process uh, related research. I also have a methodology question. I noticed that you used for the English uh, reference corpus the BNC uh, written component, I think, and then for the Chinese use the web scraped uh, French, uh, the what's it called, um, uh, cow corpus or oh yeah, the 1010. Um, which is much, much bigger, right? This is an order of magnitude bigger, I think 10 billion words compared to 100 million uh, for the BNC. So I'm just wondering if the, yeah, what the methodological choice is there. Why not use the English version of the uh, the 1010 online corpora? Uh, thanks for your question. I just used the two corpus to make the example, but it will not be my final corpus because I haven't decided yet with my supervisor, so I need to do a, do, more, do further um, uh, study. Thank you. Questions? Yes, Ellen. Yeah, thank you very much. That was fascinating, really interesting stuff. I was wondering um, whether you have any hypothesis as to what the effect of translating might be. So I imagine that when you're translating, you have to go back to the original and that might cause other kinds of pauses that might not be due to searching for a word or for the matching, you know, collocates, but might be related to just memory. What was the text? What was the, f the sentence and how you you might incorporate that? I see uh, because we use the key login data. So if the participants really go back to the source text, so we can see from the logged uh, data set that the participant is uh, focused on the source text. So we will we'll exclude the pauses in that section. So I will just focus on the data during their typing, the real text production. No, the key logging. I'm just curious. The key logging, when they key presses. So if we really have the threshold, if the, uh, for instance, if the threshold is too long, so probably there are some problems. If the threshold is regular, uh, if the po the pause is regular, so we could know the participant is typing regularly. But it will be interesting to cooperate with other tools. But for now, I only have key logging. Thank you. Very quick question or 
Yes, Anna. Thank you. A really quick question. I'm just curious, um, who are you working with in Bologna? Uh, Professor Silvia Adriano. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I was expecting the first one. <laughs> OK, thank you, Chins. Thank you so much for your really fascinating presentation. And um, A very brief communication. Um, those of you who had not the time to register this morning can do it now in the during the coffee break. We will have a coffee break uh, now, and uh, it's downstairs. It just follow some some of us. It's not so difficult. We will be back here at 45, 11:45 to this next session. Thank you so much. Welcome, welcome back, everyone. So we have a um, schedule change as previously announced. So thank you so much, Andrea, for accepting this change once again. So the next presenter is uh, Andrea Dinka from West University of Timisoara, uh, who will give a presentation entitled The Growth of Academic Phrases, a Contrastive Corpus-Based Study on Phraseological Complexity in Romanian Learner English. Thank you, Andrea. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, so today I'm presenting on behalf of the team who worked on this study. Um, we are an interdisciplinary team of researchers from the field of um, applied linguistics and uh, information technology. Uh, we currently work at the CODU Center that is hosted by the West University of Timisoara in Romania. Um, the idea for this study actually came in one of our meetings uh, and we asked ourselves, can measuring phraseological complexity provide insight into what uh, differentiates novice L2 academic writers from expert L2 academic writers? And by novice L2, I mean uh, students, Romanian students, who uh, write uh, genres uh, like essays, research papers, etc. And when I say expert L2 academic writers, I mean Romanian scholars who publish their research in, interna in, in, in international peer-reviewed journals. Um, now, uh, previous work uh, on complexity has shown that complexity develops with L2 proficiency. Uh, especially in the case of sophistication. Uh, research found that there are some categories that improve uh, very much at uh, very advanced levels like C2. Um, however, um, what happens with L2 writers who are, who are at different stages in their academic career? So as I said, students who maybe at some point may want to publish internationally uh, and have a career in um, uh, uh, at the university. For the Romanian learners of English, actually there's no research on phraseological complexity uh, in academic writing. We do know some things about the phraseological profile, let's say, of students. Um, we uh, did some studies concerning lexical bundles, for example, and here we found out that uh, Romanian students overuse the limited number of academic lexical bundles. They preferred content related bundles over discourse related bundles. Uh, and then in terms of expert phraseology that they used, when we compared the students with uh, phrases extracted from the academic phrase bank, we again found that the students used uh, only a few expert academic phrases and they tended to overuse those. However, when it comes to um, researchers, or when it comes to uh, Romanian researchers, no study whatsoever has been done on their use of um, phraseology in English. So this brings me to the research questions of the present study. So we would like to um, identify a phraseological complexity profile of novice L2 writers and, and of expert L2 writers. And we would like to see what are the differences and similarities in terms of phraseological complexity between the two groups under investigation. Mm. Now, in terms of methodology, the data that we used for this study comes from two corpora that we built at our research center. Uh, 
So first we have uh, data uh, that we call Novis L2, which is uh, a data from a learner corpus. It's uh, by English L2 Romanian speakers. These people are students. They come from four disciplines. We have uh, papers from humanities, political sciences, economics, engineering and IT. We tried to uh, make it as balanced as possible in terms of disciplines. And then we have a variety of, stud of student genres like essays, research papers. We have some theses as well. Then the two other data sets that we have uh, are of expert writing and they both come from another corpus that we built, uh, which, which targets expert writing in both Romanian and English. And here the expert L2 uh, contains writing produced by the Romanian scholars that, pub that publish um, uh, in, in, in journals around the world and uh, expert L1s who are native speakers of English who again published in high impact journals. Now again, this corpus uh, contains four disciplines that are similar to the ones from the learner corpus, and we have only one genre represented here, the research article. Uh, now, when building this corpus, we made sure that the writing we included uh, came from high impact journals. So. That's why we can say it's expert writing. Now, these two corpora are also freely available on, on the Internet, so you can check them out if you want. Um, now, for the pre-processing and the processing of our data, um, we have uh, our data is stored in text files, uh, one file per text. So we had to remove some specific tags and then we did all of our uh, uh, um, the, the part of speech extraction, the uh, uh, lemmatization and the uh, phraseological pair extraction using Python and more specifically the Spacey library. Mm. For now some definitions. In this particular study, uh, we uh, define phraseology as the co-occurrence of two uh, linguistic units at a frequency higher than expected on the basis of chance. And for measuring phraseological com complexity, we look at sophistication and at diversity following the work of Paco and colleagues. Uh, we target uh, three uh, dependency pairs. We look at uh, a mod like uh, adjectival modifiers, adverbial modifiers, and direct objects. Now, for the uh, for computing diversity and sophistication. Um, we had to uh, experiment a little bit with the measures. So for diversity, we actually we followed the uh, Van der Veerd et al. method from 2022, where we uh, computed the average number of uh, unique uh, pairs in 100 word windows. And then the number for each dependency was computed for each file. We performed the cross call Wallace test for statistics, and we also performed post hoc tests to compare each two groups and account for statistically significant differences. Now, for sophistication, we first tried the method provided by the uh, Van der Veer et al. study, but for some reason we got highly inflated results. So that's why we decided to try out Paco's method from 2019. So what we did was to compute PMI scores for each of the pairs using the native expert corpus. And then the pairs from Novice L2 and Expert L2 were searched were searched on the expert L1 list of dependencies. Uh, then the pairs from the L2 corpora that had a frequency lower than five were excluded. Uh, and PMI scores for each dependency pair uh, were calculated for each of the L2 uh, corpora. Mm, now to uh, show you some results and to discuss these results. Um, we uh, the results we got were quite mixed, let's say. For example, in the case of uh, objective of modifiers, we found that the novice L2 uh, writers use significantly less, uh, less diverse um, uh, physiological units than the expert groups. However, when it came to the adverbial modifier group, we had uh, a different result. That is, the Romanian scholars publishing in English uh, used less diverse adverbial modifiers, which was quite interesting. Um, 
In the case of direct objects, uh, we found that the expert L ones use the most diverse um, phraseological units. And then interestingly, the novice L2 group followed and then the expert L2 was the last uh, one. For sophistication, um, what was interesting was that um, in the case of uh, uh, the Verbian modifiers, the uh, expert L2 uh, used more sophisticated um, uh, phraseological units. But in the case of direct objects, both groups uh, used less sophisticated uh, units, way less. Mm. Now, if we are to compare uh, the diversity and sophistication for these groups, as you can see, we had quite mixed results. Um, for example, the novice L2, yes, they use less diverse adverbial modifiers, but when it comes to sophistication, they perform relatively well, let's say. Uh, in the case of Romanian scholars, they, they use less diverse adverbial modifiers, but the, those uh, adverbial uh, modifiers are quite sophisticated. Um, probably the one of the most interesting findings we had here was in the case of direct objects uh, um, at the uh, sophistication level, because uh, previous studies indicated that sophistication in direct objects is an indicator of C2 proficiency, uh, and we were quite surprised to see that uh, Romanian scholars were also scored quite low um, at, at, at this category. Now, um, we, we need to uh, perform more uh, qualitative types of analysis here because from the right now, from the uh, uh, test that we perform, uh, we, we can conclude that complexity doesn't, complexity doesn't really seem to grow um, from novice L2 to expert L2 writing. This is something that we kind of expected. Um, however, here we do have um, a challenge, let's say, because uh, we did get some errors in part of speech tagging and then which led to errors in uh, lemmatization. So we will have to look uh, to look at that as well in order to uh, see if it's just a problem of uh, computing or it's actually uh, a language problem. Um, there is not a clear distinction between novice L2 and expert L2 in the level of complexity, uh, which is something that we did not expect. We somehow believe that uh, the expert L2s would perform better in uh, the in uh, phraseological complexity. So some possible explanations for, for this, um, maybe the novice L2 writers use some phraseological teddy bears that include um, uh, uh, adverbial modifiers. So um, the, the Romanian scholars, when they write uh, in uh, uh, research articles, they may discard those phraseological teddy bears, but at the same time, they don't replace those teddy bears with something else. Um, as I said before, um, the sophistication is uh, quite low in expert L2 writing, and this doesn't correlate with what we expected and from what previous studies uh, showed when it comes to language proficiency. So this may um, may mean uh, teaching implications for both L L2 groups, both uh, Romanian students and Romanian scholars. Um, what we would like to do next to expand this study, um, we would like to introduce a Romanian academic uh, writing corpus, so a, a, a L1 Romanian for both the student writing and the expert writing. Um, in order to see if there are any uh, issues with L1 transfer or to see if, uh, I don't know, the uh, Romanian students and scholars may overuse certain uh, phraseological units. And that's why they scored so, so little in um, 
complexity. We are already we, we have started to um, uh, experiment with this. And here are some, let's say, uh, preliminary uh, results. We again have a little challenge here because the POS tagger for Romanian doesn't work very well, so we need to find a solution for that. But for what we for, for what we uh, identified so far, we did find some frequently used and overly used um, uh, phraseological units. For example, in the case of uh, adverbial modifiers, very big, very good, um, and, and so on. Okay, that was all for for me. Um, now I would gladly answer questions. Thank you, Andrea, for this very interesting talk. So questions? Yes. Yes, thank you very much. A very interesting uh, study. Uh, it's also nice looking at different L1 backgrounds. Um, I was interested by the results about diversity specifically, because um, in the study um, that I did, right, we also didn't see any differences between the natives uh, and the learners with diversity. And the question was, how much diversity is actually necessary, right? I think sometimes with complexity, we think more and more and more is always going to be more and more proficient, right? But what is actually required for the task itself? And if you think about looking at journal articles, right, having a high degree of uh, phraseological diversity maybe is actually an indicator of not a very good writer because you want to have coherence and cohesion, right? So, and that comes through re repeating certain phrases throughout so you can guide your reader. So I'm just wondering if you have thoughts about how complexity maybe interacts with the communicative goals, right? Maybe um, like the Kinika, sorry, somewhere, uh, uh, their work on, um, yeah, the, the, uh, the communicative goals of a of a task. It's actually a, a very uh, interesting path that we we can actually uh, maybe uh, look into. Um, these results that we have here. Um, well, we, we didn't really think about what, what you just said. Uh, so as I said, that would be really good to, to look into. Now for, for what we found here, um, it's quite, mm, let's say it's mixed because yes, novice L2s, they, they do perform less in uh, the first category, but then in the second uh, category, um, the, they, they have higher, uh, higher values, they have uh, higher uh, diversity. So for now, we don't really know, but that's a really, really good observation. And for sure, we are going to look into that for the for the paper. Yeah, and yeah. then also thinking about right this because there's so many different topics that they're writing about too. Mm -hmm. And topic at least we know has an effect on lexical diversity. So it yeah, be exactly. logical that yeah. also in phraseological diversity yeah. as well. And it's also it's also about the genre because yes, for the for the expert corpora, we only have research articles, whereas for the novice L2, we have a lot of, of, of text. Yeah, exactly. So maybe we can, I don't know, sort them based on the text genre and see if in the uh, research article, because they also write uh, research articles to see if maybe they, uh, maybe the, the, the results are, are different when compared to essays, let's, let's say. So. Other questions? Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting. I was wondering if you considered adding to the picture novice L1, um, a novice L1 corpus, because I was wondering sometimes some patterns could simply be due to recency of training if they all had training in academic writing. So I thought that might be an interesting comparison to see how they relate to expert L1 writers. Yes, yes, we we plan to uh, add corpora for student L1 and for scholar L1, uh, uh, Romanian students and Romanian scholars. Yes, this is the next, let's say, step that we would like to, to add. 
Um, yeah. Okay, so, so English L1 or that would be entirely on Romanian, right? Uh, so what we want to do is um, add corpora of Romanian L1. Oh, OK, yeah, so yeah. that's academic writing. Yes, oh, for, OK, for so. students and for uh, scholars and to see if there are any uh, differences. But as again, as I said, we have to see how we can uh, figure out the uh, part of speech tagging for Romanian so that we can extract those categories. Yeah, thank you. Are there are questions. We have time for a couple of questions more. Thank you for your presentation and sorry. Um, you had a slide where you mentioned about extraction and you said that in a method that you used, the uh, results were quite inflated. Can you say a little bit more about that? And also when you say in the results that the sophistication scores you found were quite low compared to what? What do you mean exactly as low? Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, for the first question, uh, when we performed uh, sophistication using the, the, the method that the method that is in the, the uh, van der Veer the tall study, um, we got very high numbers. So the uh, my colleagues actually they they took that decision, let's say to uh, experiment with uh, the, the other method uh, because they they said that they didn't really seem accurate these these results but of course what what does accurate mean <laughs> actually yes 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 yeah compared to yeah um so this is all i know about let's say this decision to switch to the um, to to the other method yes yeah and in regards uh the uh sophistication so mm, we um we yeah we we consider that the uh, direct object category category the, the results were quite quite low because we were expecting to find uh physiological units that would have pmi higher than three so we that's why we we expected to have maybe i don't know 3.5 or three, i don't know four or something like that so that is why we we said it's it's quite low but here, since we used um, a corpus of academic writing, of expert academic writing, and we didn't use a general corpus, um, maybe some of the uh, physiological units didn't really make it past the, the threshold. Uh, if we had used a, a general corpus, then maybe our results would have been a bit different and the people, the, the both uh, L2 groups would have scored maybe higher uh, of these categories. You're welcome. Time for one last quick question. OK, OK. Uh, yes, I think uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I think that my question is a bit in line with the last question we just heard. I struggled a bit with your terminology of uh, doing better and doing less and uh, more sophisticated, less sophisticated. For instance, in case of was it sophistication of direct objects that the uh, novice L2 writers used less of these units, but sophisticated ones. Um, can you quickly elaborate a bit on yeah. this maybe? Yeah. example the expert l2 so the romanian scholars they used less diverse yeah okay. uh, adverbial modifiers but when we look at sophistication of the same category they scored quite high so this is what i was trying to say that while they use less diverse uh, physiological units in this category they are sophisticated um, why we were, were interesting to see which of the groups perform better was also because um, our research is quite informed by practice and we our goal is also to provide uh, pedagogical uh, 
uh, let's say, uh, results or uh, pedagogical uh, applications for these groups because our uh, research center also works closely with the teachers that teach academic writing for both students and um, scholars. So that's why we are interesting to see which what are the let's say the issues and which groups performs better and which group performs maybe not so good. So yeah. OK, thank you so much again, Andrea. OK, the next presenters uh, are Manaz Aliyar and Sianova Shanturia from Victoria University of Wellington. Uh, the talk is entitled Reading versus Listening to Authentic Materials in L2 Italian. What leads to greater vocabulary learner gains? Thank you, Manaz. The floor is yours. Uh, so in my talk, I'm going to first uh, briefly uh, talk about the gaps in the literature, and then I move on talking about our study design and the results, and I conclude with uh, talking about the findings. So um, the importance of vocabulary and thereby vocabulary acquisition studies is commonly and widely. Uh, you might have heard this quote from Winkley saying that without grammar, very little can be conveyed. Without vocabulary, nothing. Um, however, vocabulary learning, vocabulary learning is a hard and laborious task for uh, language learners due to various factors such as the great number of uh, vocabulary uh, items needed to uh, use language fluent or other word-related factors such as polysemy or let's say uh, the great number of uh, word expressions. But what makes uh, vocabulary learning even harder is um, there are practical limits to the amount of vocabulary that uh, language instructors and teachers can teach in the in classroom. So that's why it is important to study incidental vocabulary acquisition as well, because uh, incidental learning from meaningful input is essential to second language learning uh, vocabulary development. And by investigating uh, incidental vocabulary acquisition, we can find ways to facilitate their learning process. So, consider the previous studies have investigated incidental vocabulary acquisition from different modes of input. So, for example, from reading, from listening, from reading and we have a few comparative studies as well. And here I'm going to talk about two comparative studies. The first one being by Feng and Web 2020 on incidental vocabulary learning from a documentary, so from an authentic method. We had a viewing condition, a listening condition, so they listened to the audio only of the documentary, and a reading condition who read the transcript of the documentary. According to the results, also, incidental vocabulary learning occurs through all conditions, and they found similar amounts of learning across all three conditions, and the gains were retained one week later, so they had a delay process a week later. And also, we also didn't find any relationship between frequency of occurrence and vocabulary learning. Second study 
in the study by Web and Chang 2020, so a recent study. Uh, students are vocabulary learning from a graded reader. So this time, not an authentic, but a material design specifically for uh, language learners. They had a reading condition, a listening condition, and a group who read while listening to the audio of the curated. So according to the results, uh, also sort of vocabulary learning happened through all uh, conditions. So, so reading, listening, and reading while listening. And by um, listening was most effective, the reading and the listening conditions contributed to similar size uh, vocabulary gains. And the gains were, most of the gains were retained four weeks later. So they had a delayed uh, process or review. Despite these great uh, studies, there are still some gaps in the literature. So for example, uh, lack of comparative studies and more specifically lack of, um, let's say, ecologically valid uh, comparative studies. Moreover, we have limited research on incidental vocabulary learning from listening in general. And in particular, uh, to the best of my knowledge today, we have no study on incidental vocabulary learning from listening to authentic audiobooks. Uh, most of the studies focus on L2 English, and we have very few studies involving advanced learners. So these bring us to our research goals. In our study, we aim to investigate incidental, incidental acquisition of novel L2 Italian vocabulary, both single words and multiple word expressions uh, from uh, authentic materials. And also we aim to um, evaluate and compare the effects of reading to the effects of reading, uh, listening, sorry, on incidental learning of both multiple expressions and single words. So, as for our methods, uh, we have adopted a pre test, post test, and three week later, delayed post test. Our participants were Iranian university students who had advanced Italian proficiency level. So, we had a reading group, a listening group, and a control group. We used Lamica Geniale as our input. And we uh, targeted 41 Italian vocabulary items from the book. I, I'm going to provide more details about uh, target items in just a moment. As for our measurement instrument, we focused on the meaning aspect of the items. So we had a um, forming association test, a meaning recall, and a meaning recognition. And finally, as a procedure of a study, we had the students take the pre test. Then a week later, they received the materials of the book. For the audiobook, and they had four weeks to read or listen to half of the book in their free time and for pleasure. So they were instructed to pay attention to anything that just read for this, just for pleasure. So here are some more details about the items. So as I just mentioned, we had 41 items, 22 of which were single words, 19 multiple expressions. The frequency uh, in the book in that half of the book range uh, from 3 to 18, and they were all low frequency words in Italian. So uh, checking in light of the progress, the frequency uh, range from 0.5 to 339 hits per million token. Uh, their lengths vary from one to four words or four to 15 characters. And I just wanted to quickly mention that we also took into account ambiguity, compositionality, and figurative aspects of the items, but since they were um, not significant in the context of our study based on the results, I'm not going to provide any uh, further details on that. So uh, we analyzed the data using mixed effect modeling in R, and we used time, item type, lexita, which is prior vocabulary size, uh, proficiency, items length in character, and items frequency of recurrence into the model, and we ran one model per test form. I'm just going to provide uh, details about just one test format as a time restriction, but uh, overall we observe similar pattern across the board. So here we have the results of the mixed effect logistic regression model for meaning recall of the target items. And as you can see, both condition and time were significant. Frequency is not significant. That one, and that was the case across all three test formats. And further, all three two way interactions were significant. So let's have a look into these interactions. So, 
at the control group. So the first one here. If you get the delayed post test result. And the delayed post test result. So as you can see, the, the results for the control group are kind of identical. So um, they, they didn't layer anything because they were exposed to the uh, to the material, so the input. But moving on to our reading group in, in green, as you can see, there is considerable learning happening from, from pretest to immediate post test. And then the gains were retained three weeks later. The same goes true uh, for the listening group as well, except that the gains is even greater. So we have more learning happening for the listening group. And also the gains were retained three weeks later. Another interesting point here is that if you look at the, the, the slopes, so that's, um, I mean, even though the, the control group or even all of the groups, they knew a little bit more multiple expressions at the beginning. They learned or they picked up incidentally more multiple expressions after the treatment. So this loop doesn't change for the control group, but it does change for both um, the reading group and the listening group. So if you can see, well, the listening group knew almost the same, but the, the slope grows for I mean, after the treatment. So let's not have a look into the overall learning gains for all three test formats. So here we have the poor meaning correction, the meaning recall, and the meaning recognition. In red, we have the results of the pretest. So that's what students knew before the treatment. And then in, in green, we have the results of the immediate post test. So as you can see, there is significant and considerable amount of learning happening after the treatment. In blue, we have the results of the delayed post test, which shows that the, the gains were retained three weeks later, which is an indicator of durable learning. Another interesting point here is that if you compare uh, the reading group and the listening group across all three test formats, they outperform the reading group consistently. So the gains are greater for the listening group. So to summarize uh, our findings, we can say that L2 incidental vocabulary learning occurs through both reading and listening. Overall, while um, both mode, I mean both conditions led to considerable amounts of vocabulary gains and retention, the listening condition led to greater incidental vocabulary uptake. We didn't find any, any relationship between frequency of occurrence and learning gains. Neither did we find any relationship between learners' prior vocabulary size and um, language proficiency and learning. So let's see how our findings compare to the results of previous research. So past studies showed that both reading and listening can improve vocabulary knowledge, and that's what we also find that both reading and listening um, contributed to uh, incidental vocabulary gains. Next, uh, past studies showed that uh, the reading and listening contributed to similarly sized gains. However, uh, according to the results of our study, we saw that uh, listening contributed to greater incidental vocabulary uptake. And finally, um, the results of uh, previous research showed inconsistent findings regarding defects of frequency. And in our study, we didn't find any relationship between frequency and recurrence and vocabulary. So to conclude, we can say that authentic materials are a valuable uh, source of auto input to enhance incidental vocabulary acquisition, that authentic materials are beneficial for learning both multi-word expressions and single words, and authentic materials can be particularly beneficial for advanced learners. Here I have a question mark because in this study we had only advanced proficiency level participants. So this can be an avenue for future research uh, to conduct a study, uh, I mean a comparative study involving uh, different proficiency levels. So thank you very much.
Uh, thank you, Manas, for a very interesting talk and for your perfect timing. Uh, questions? Yes. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. I was wondering, maybe I missed it, and I apologise if I missed it. Um, how do you know whether the learners actually read the book and actually listened to the book? Because you said it's in every time, so yeah. And um, yeah, that would be my question because I love the findings and I'm wondering whether maybe it was easier to listen to the whole book than to read the book and yeah. whether it was just maybe an effect of having actually, you know, done yeah. this thing. <laughs> We had a uh, qualitative part, so I interviewed some of the participants. I didn't include that, you know, because of uh, within the time. But uh, we also had interviews with uh, all groups, so there uh, I could also sort of confirm that they actually read the book. Other questions? Yes. So really interesting findings. And did you do you have any explanations for those? findings, I mean, the two key things about the listening being better and no effect of frequency. Do you have any hypotheses about why that is? Significant effect of frequency with others when you do effect. I think that, that might be because they were as learners. So, you know, when you're prone to learning, even with one occurrence, the word, uh, but that's only my guess. Uh, instead, for the listening group, I think um, the fact that you know the the joy part of the listening to an audio book because um, maybe some of you know the book, so it's an interesting book, and um, the narrator has a real lovely voice. So even the, the audio book is beautiful. So it, you know it it observes you when you listen to. So I think that can be one of the reasons. And also it's easier to listen maybe to your audiobook rather than reading. So you, you got involved more easily. Um, so and also that was confirmed in the in the interview. So I asked participants, both like the reading group and the listening group, um, if the task was difficult. So while the reading group, even if they were advanced learners, struggle a little bit with the task. So to, to finish on time, the listening group just you know listen to that easily. And the fact that they picked up more uh, multiple expressions would be maybe explained by the fact because they listened to them, they could like pick them as trunk. Why? Because when you read and you don't know the word, you don't really know that it, you know there are uh, a sequence of words that have a meaning all together. But when you listen because of the pauses of the narrator, you you can say, okay, this is you know I need to look at in a whole to grasp the meaning. That answer. Thank you. OK, we have time for other questions. Yes, Eric. Thank you. Very interesting uh, talk. Um, well, just a couple of clarifications and a little comment, perhaps. Um, so uh, do you have any knowledge about whether the students, for example, uh, kept, kept a diary or wrote down this Brazil phrases? Because that may can also make a difference if they you know, are very dedicated to the task. And <laughs> out of curiosity, Amica Geniale is in Naples, sort of dialect, so it's very, t I mean, I couldn't really understand it, not all the parts, so. Ah, okay, okay, because I remember watching, okay, so the movie, uh, so your listening was not based on the movie because that was really very tough. <laughs> OK, so the novel, but there are parts in in dialect, aren't there? Single words, so that's yeah, OK. Yeah, I know, yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, so they couldn't impede the comprehension. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, if they if you um, have any knowledge, yeah. Okay, 
the vocabulary spice. So we, we can't really say that's the vocabulary test. Second, we didn't, I mean, we asked them specifically to just read for pleasure. We don't need to check grammar. We don't need to check vocabulary, just read the book as you would, you know, a normal novel for pleasure. And in the interview, I asked, like, at least those students that I interviewed, I asked them if they check the meaning of the book, they write them down. Mm -hmm. And they said no. So probably it's safe to say that they didn't, but I can't say that for all the students. Yep. But still, I can say that the, the results are, you know, incidental learnings because if, you know, if you read a book out of context of the study in that way, and that's what you're doing with the book I gave you, so that's how you learn. So I still the results should be really relevant. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Yes. Thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting, this study. I have a few questions. Uh, you mentioned that you had sort of three tests to check for um, word meaning association, um, meaning recall, and meaning, and meaning recognition. OK, can you say something about the format of these tests? Sure. Uh, so the word meaning association, uh, we provide a student with a synonym of the target word. And in the, uh, it was a multiple choice. And the options were uh, three distractors, target item, and I, I don't know um, option. So that was the four meaning association test. Then we had the meaning recall. They needed to provide a translation of the target item in Persian. And so from Italian to Persian. And for the uh, meaning recognition test, they were the target item in a phrase, so it a context, but a context that wouldn't tell you what's the meaning of the book, obviously. And um, there were options in question again, so they choose. And the tests were uh, in this order, and if it had been said two different things. Mm -hmm. Just out of curiosity, how many items were there? 41. And they were discussed, I mean, we had uh, fillers. So there they were overall 60 items, I mean, 60 questions for each test format. All right. Quite long. Yeah, so they they had they had to uh, they took part in these three tests on the same day. Two different days. Two so different the, days. The first day, uh, we administered the uh, form uh, meaning association test and also the comprehension questions and a, uh, a questionnaire. So that way we could kind of disguise the test. And the second day, there were the two other uh, tests. So the meaning uh, recall and they couldn't go back. So they take the meaning recall. So they answer what they knew and then they take the meaning recognition. So the answers will be affected by the, the first uh, format. Thanks. Thank you. We have time for a few questions more. OK, uh, I have a curiosity about the control group. Um, uh, I, I guess that they were not employed in any reading or listening activities, right? OK. Related to the OK. Uh, OK, OK, thank you. Thank you so much for your clarification. OK, other questions? Sorry, I didn't know we had more time. So um, you mentioned that you took uh, into consideration also compositionality, figurativeness, and ambiguity. Exactly how did you take into consideration these factors? So we had native speakers rating the items. So if they consider them, for example, ambiguous, ambiguous, and we got the mean and we uh, fit that into the model. So that's a zero one question, right? So for the ambiguity, yes, it was ambiguous, non-ambiguous. For the other, we were rating from zero, uh, from one to seven. All right. Thank you. OK, so thank you again, Manas. Thank you so much.
the right to have military So I'm the only one here, Silvia and Adriano, because they are not here. So. Spero che vada bene così. No, 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 va bene no, 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 Okay, the next presentation is a turn between L1 and L2 patterns, collocationality levels in L2 English production by speakers of L1 Italian, given by Maya Milicevic Petrovic from University of Bologna. Thank you, Maya. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope it's okay with the mic like this. Okay, do tell me if I need to do something. Okay, so I'm presenting joint work with Adriano Ferraresi and Silvia Bernardini, and I would actually like to start by acknowledging that it is uh, mostly their work that is at the core, as you will, as you will hear as I go along, but unfortunately they couldn't make it uh, for, for the conference. Um, so what we are essentially trying to do is uh, achieve this modest goal of bringing together uh, the study of collocations in second language acquisition and translation studies. So each area is complicated enough on its own, but we are trying to explore how it how uh, they can feed into the into each other. So after some background, I will tell you something about the previous study that has already been published by by Silvia and Adriano, and I will tell you about what we are uh, working on now, trying to make many methodological decisions. So the talk will be more about questions than answers, I, I, I believe. Uh, so we are looking at a very typical combination, so L1 Italian, L2, L2 English, uh, but the corpus that we are looking at is slightly less, uh, less typical, we could, uh, we could say. So the background, uh, this is a corpus based study, so we take a corpus based approach to collocations, obviously, so we take them to be combinations of words that are commonly used uh, together and that can be sort of detected and measures uh, measured using uh, various association measures. I'll be mentioning some of them later on, and it is rather well known and this audience needs it doesn't need much. Uh, much more information on this, that in L2 production, collocations tend to be problematic, so they are not used as much as in native, native speech, and when they are used, there is a tendency to use very frequent rather than very strongly associated word combinations. Now, what is possibly less known that something similar sometimes happen in native production as well, specifically when translators translate into their native language, similar patterns are actually actually found. So it is not just about the L1 or the L2. It there are other factors. There are other factors involved. So uh, clearly in some cases there is some influence of the other language involved. So the L1 or the source language of translation, 
but also some possibly more general tendencies. Um, so translations, uh, even professional translations into the L1 are often described as being uh, more conventional than non-translated spontaneous production. So they tend to use more frequent, more common collocations as uh, as well. So it's not all about the influence of the source language and just a word of caution on target language. In this presentation, it does not refer to the L target language in the second language acquisition context, but the target language of, of translation. So I hope not to make too much confusion with that. And as we know, this is just a tiny bit of the literature available on these two on these two domains. So uh, one thing that we add uh, in, uh, to this picture is learner translations. So learner translations can be defined as translations by non-professional translators, typically students of translation, so translation trainees. They can be either in from the L2 into the L1 or the other way around. What is particularly interesting for this study is the context where students translate into the L2. So not what is very typical in the professional world. Uh, why is this particularly interesting? Because this kind of corpus uh, has already been described as a source of, as a sort of two in one resource because it helps us understand how the translation competence is acquired, but also how the L2 is is acquired. So in translation studies, there is a, there has recently been a lot of work on uh, learner translations uh, in this direction as well. This kind of goes well uh, also with recent tendencies in language teaching where pedagogical translation is also seeing a bit of a come come back after some time of being almost almost banned. And uh, the last perspective here um, that where learner translation translations add something is this big picture of all these different bilingual contexts having their own specific properties, but also being somehow connected to each other. Uh, cross linguistic influences everywhere. These general tendencies that are not related to specific languages, they are everywhere. So this is where we want to try to place our uh, our research. We are specifically starting from a framework that has been proposed by a translation studies scholar, Heidi Kotze, but that actually uh, aims to uh, capture other kinds of contexts as well. So the constraint uh, language, uh, con constraint model, constraint language uh, model states essentially that uh, any kind of language use is guided by an interplay of a series of constraints. Some of the most important ones are listed here. So in our case, what is particularly relevant is this uh, text production constraint because this uh, independent text production is what I'm doing now. I'm not translating. So this is well, let's call it spontaneous production more, more or less. Uh, when someone is translating, this is entirely dependent because uh, there is the need to render the something that was already there in the source source text for all the other criteria. Uh, our uh, learners are uh, in the same category. So we're looking at multilingual language activation, written uh, language. We are looking at, if not near native, very high proficiency. And we are looking in our case, because they are students, we are looking at non-experts, non as you will see when I when I move on to the description of the, of the corpus. Another uh, theoretical, bit that we are taking from translation studies that is a bit more specific to translation studies um, concerns explanations for these phenomena. For example, if in a translation we spot a collocation that seems a bit odd in the given target language. So if we want to look at what could what the cause would be. It could be that um, in the target language, this there is no really salient collocation corresponding to this. So it, there could be some sort of draw from the source language prominence. So essentially like in the L1 and L2 combinations, both languages are somehow always present. So things that are very prominent in the L2 are easier to acquire. If something is instead very prominent in the L1, it will stay with us for longer and so on. And the third factor um, uh, 
proposed as a possible explanation of the, yes, this is a model by Sandra Sandra Halverson is connectivity. So how often um, translation pairs essentially occur together. So the initial idea, so the gravitational pool mostly referred to the pool of the source language, but then there were several versions of the model. That's not so, so important. Um, so uh, she essentially even though um, had even though she had in mind initially translation only, she essentially believes that this framework can be extended to other contexts as well. So another thing we wanted to do is whether something along these lines, because these factors are we know present in L1, L2 combinations as well, whether there is a way of adapting, adapting slightly this model for second language acquisition context as well. So this is this was the starting uh, the starting point. Now, um, a previous study by uh, Ferrez and Bernardini recently recently published uh, posed three research questions that were related precisely to how much these different influences were present uh, in translation versus writing that is not translation. So this becomes clearer here where I describe the, the corpus. So it is this was not really a pilot study, but an exploratory uh, largely study uh, an attempt to see how comparisons between these uh, language varieties work or can can work. So the corpus the corpus was a bit opportunistic, so our own students were included students in the MA course in specialized translation. L1 Italian, C1 level of uh, L2 English, and we know this because they had to take the Oxford placement uh, placement test to enroll. And what was collected in the corpus were their various exams, classwork, homework, and so on. So all was written language, but for the production that is not translation, so let's call it spontaneous production in English, they had to write essays in corpus linguistics. So maybe not fully spontaneous, but it was not a translation. And then in their various translation courses, they translated from Italian into English argumentative texts in the domain of social sciences. So there isn't really like a full match in terms of content between the subcorpora, but there is an overlap. Um, the essays, OK, the essays were around 100 and one student, one essay. Uh, translations were more complicated because uh, all students contributed more than one translation. So actually, in the end, the unit of analysis was the student, not the not the text. Um, so it was averaged across uh, individual production. So 19 students and a total of 130 texts. So the translation corpus, because the texts were shorter, was much smaller. It was around 10 times smaller. So it really you know, we are aware that this is not balanced, ideal and, and so on. Um, the corpus was also post-tact and syntactic uh, dependencies uh, using universal dependencies were uh, annotated. And actually the way collocations were extracted, there were several steps. The first one was that collocation candidates were identified based on uh, a selected set of 16 syntactic relations. So you have some of them here. I hope this can be read. So some of the common ones, adjectival modi uh, modification, so something like key element uh, or nominal modification, something like time, uh, time, uh, time period and various other uh, relations. Now, some of these combinations were not really proper collocations. They were either too technical or just random combinations. So what was disregarded were those that had very low combinations that had very low frequencies and also combinations uh, that corresponded that had a very low T score in a reference corpus. And in our case, uh, the reference corpus was a subset of the UK Webus, Webus corpus, so UQAC. Let, let's go, let, let's let's pronounce it like uh, like this. It was a subset of 130 million million words. So this is where we got the frequencies in the T scores from. And well, in this at this point, uh, Ferraresi and Bernardini. And uh, then uh, those uh, those combinations that were kept uh, received uh, based on the same reference corpus, MI and log dice scores with again the idea that mutual information detects locations that are not, not not necessarily frequent, but that are where the items are really strongly associated with each other. 
whereas log dice is a bit of a midway between neutral information and t-score so it is a bit less frequency based than t-score but more frequency based than than a mutual information and uh for for seeing whether more uh, colloca whether translations or essays were more collocational uh texts were uh, compared uh, at in individuals uh, were um received the median scores for their for their text and what was found is that uh, in this case unlike what happens in translations into the l1 translations are more collocational than spontaneous well spontaneous production essay writing okay so it's a pattern that is the opposite from what happens in the l1 in the l1 we tend to be more collocational when we write spontaneously in the l2 we are less collocational when we write spontaneously so obviously task effects as as everywhere are are present and this goes for both measures and you can see of course there are fewer texts for the translation for fewer subjects for the translation corpus but the trend is quite strong especially for the for the mutual information now the other two research questions uh, were addressed in a more um, exploratory way uh, looking only at the, because it was difficult to obtain all the information automatically so a subset of collocations was studied further to see um how many of them had very strong collocates corresponding collocates in italian and how many of them were very connected to each other which was measured through occurrence in bilingual dictionaries so i will very quickly jump through this because i want to say something about our next steps and our worries and and so and so on so essentially what was found is that um there was no major difference between uh, essays and translations in terms of how connect of, of this connectivity parameter. So um, translation equivalence uh, between between Italian and uh, and uh, English. What was interesting is that um, those uh, collocational pairs that were found in both languages tended to occur in both kinds of texts. Okay, so there is something about it, but this would need more. Uh, this would need elaboration. Uh, and then for studying the L1, uh, the L1 uh, prominence, the Italian equivalents were extracted again, also for a subset, and uh, their corresponding log dice and mutual information scores were obtained from the Italian web corpus. And it was found that in almost all cases. Um, the source collocations were either equally collocation, strongly collocational, or uh, more collocational than the target ones. So, you know, there is some hint of L1 of L1 influence. So a lot of this was exploratory based on a smaller sample. What we would like to do is move forward and try to understand what to do with all with all this, essentially. So one thing that comes to mind really in statistical terms as well is to kind of try to reverse the analysis in a way, because what Ferraresi and Bernardini looked at was how text production modes, so translations versus essay, how essays, how this predicts these different outcomes, collocationality levels, uh, levels of collocationality of corresponding L1 items and so on. We were thinking of trying to turn these these three into independent variables, and because this was the original idea of this gravitational pool hypothesis, seeing how these factors influence the, the final outcome. Then, where we got a bit stuck is if we have the collocationality level as the outcome variable and look at all these as predictors. There is a bit of an overlap because already in you know the notion of collocationality is related to salience and frequency and so on so we seem to kind of tackle similar things in both dependent and independent variables so that's one uh, one issue then another issue is um 
how exactly do we measure L1 prominence in second language contexts? In translation, it's easy because we have the source text, so we know what we are looking at. So is this way of looking also at translation equivalence? Is does it make sense? So we are still considering considering that. And we're also wondering whether in grouping the data by subject as unit of analysis is the best approach or do we need to look at individual collocations as the outcome? I see some nods, so hope to, hope to get some, some feedback later on. We'll be happy, happy to hear about it. So we are essentially, yes, at the stage where we're trying to make this, uh, these, uh, these decisions. Um, we were thinking of possibly because there is always some underlying baseline with all of these comparisons. We were thinking of maybe instead of looking just at you know, general collocationality level, calculating a difference between the collocate uh, with respect to native production or spontaneous native production. But we're not sure that really, really, uh, really works. So you know, a lot, many decisions to 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 take still. Now, what we would like to highlight for now, because you know, we, we do have, we believe that there are some interesting findings in, in all of this already, uh, and that might help in future decisions as well. I would like to highlight that this, it, it is really interesting that there is this sort of scale where non-mediated native production is the most collocational, mediated, so translated or interpreted as slightly less, but the other way around in second languages. So, um, that brings us back to the old story of task effects in, in second language acquisition, uh, but maybe slightly different perspective as well, because obviously there is a difference in opportunities of use of collocations. So in second languages, it seems that when we are pushed by the source text to use something, we will use it and you know we will somehow get out this knowledge that we somewhere have that might not come out if we um, if we just write an essay. OK, so things work, work uh, differently. Um, so yes, it seems that in, in both cases, with both translation and essays, there is this uh, interplay of L1 and L2 influences as uh, as well, even when we look only at the at the L2. So yes, we collocations are a fascinating <laughs> topic, but yes, they are a bit difficult to study. So, you know, being between uh, lexicon and grammar and being uh, a not very discreet uh, phenomenon, it, it doesn't help in setting up uh, um, follow follow up uh, follow up studies. And while trying to decide about all these smaller things, we I must admit we sort of a bit started doubting that at least the, these models that we are now looking at can be so directly applied in, in L2 context. So uh, at least the gravitational pool, pool model. But what we do believe is very useful in general is learner, uh, learner translation corpora. So that seems to be uh, an additional source of L2 data that is often disregarded, but that can add new, new information. So any feedback on the method is most welcome and thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Maya, for this fascinating talk. Questions? OK, I have a question. Uh, you use both MI and log dice, and the results seem uh, different. Um, um, MI res um, translations, if I remember correctly, yes, have a uh, highest MI scores than the log die score. So I was wondering if you uh, consider also the um, the difference between the two association measure, uh, in particular MI, which uh, depends on the, the size of the corpus and uh, it is not based on a standard design uh, scale with uh, uh, a maximum value contrary to uh, log dice. So um, uh, Gablazova and colleagues uh, said that uh, log dice should be a more re reliable association measure than MI. So I was wondering if you uh, consider this limit. 
stage not in such such detail so we are aware of the differences in how they are calculated so here uh, i sort of skipped over this but both comparisons were significant so we did this bootstrap t test with, which takes sub samples and then repeats the the test multiple times and for both measures the different there, there is a difference it is just that it is more obvious in the in the mi uh, so i my guess would be that the difference in how the measures are calculated contribute to the size uh, of this mm -hmm. difference between the two groups, but it seems that whichever way, well, not whichever, at least for these two measures, different ways of measuring collocations still give some sort of difference in which translations tend to be slightly uh, more collocational than than essays, okay. but yes, of course, that would be one one part to consider consider as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Other questions? Yes. Thank you very much. It's a great project. I'm a big fan. Um, I was thinking what you mentioned at the end when I saw this uh, analysis that. I wasn't sure why the unit is the text on the left and the um, participant on the right. It seems that we're aggregating a lot of things. So uh, yeah, my question would be why not uh, use look at individual collocations? Uh, that that would be the next the next step. Okay. So I I must admit that possibly one of the reasons why uh, the by subject so it, it is actually by by text on the left yeah, yeah. corresponds to by subject mm -hmm. because it is one text one sure. subject. So uh, one very simple answer to be completely honest is that this is an approach that we have already used in other studies. So mm -hmm. this you know very familiar and this was one of the reasons. Uh, uh, another reason was that this was kind of fairly straightforward to calculate also automatically. Mm -hmm. Individual collocations would require a different approach, which does not make this a bad approach. It's just that we are we, we have not done that yet, but uh, it is very likely that 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 might be our, our next step as well. The aggregating is due to the fact that for translations, uh, each student contributed at least two and some even up to 20 translations. So we 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 had to aggregate that their data. Otherwise, the corpus would be very, very mixed. It is already because uh, there are multiple translations of the same source text, so mm -hmm. it is already not an entirely independent mm -hmm. sample. And that's one tricky thing with learner translation corpora that they tend to be like this. So we wanted to take out of the equation at least uh, the, the, the individual part where it was easier to aggregate. So that, that was the reason. Yeah, that makes more sense. Um, the one thing that I'm wondering whether this might be um, um leaving out the effects of of type versus token frequencies of the collocations do you know what i mean like if there's a, a collocation that's very very idiomatic and also very frequent a sort of uh, phraseological teddy bear whether that drives some of these um uh, figures so could be so i we think that at the very least uh this perspective should be complemented by by the one uh based on individual collocation so they might might not be necessary to select one versus the other but combining them definitely definitely fully fully agree so we just need to get down to <laughs> to do it to doing the study <laughs> thank you very much Okay, we have time for one last question. Yes. Uh, yes, a clarification question. Um, I'm not very familiar with these corpora, Loro corpora for translation, um, but um, is there any instruction in these cases uh, given to the students? For instance, if students have to translate an essay into uh, another language, um, are they told, for instance, to focus on particular aspects or is it completely free? So that would be my first um, clarification question. And the second one, um, did you the influence of genre, did you also 
uh, look at all do they exist other learner translation corpora for instance of of liter literary texts uh, which may yield completely different results specific instructions so typically uh, the translations that go in the uh, trans uh, learner translation corpora are class assignments or homework assignments where they where the students receive a source text and are told to translate it into a target language mm -hmm. uh, one uh, the probably the biggest corpus is this must corpus at the university of Louvain. Uh, um, and because it contains, it's a very collaborative work, contains translations from uh, between many different languages and so and so on. But the share, the shared thing is students are never told to focus on anything specific in the text. It is translation exercises more, more than more than anything. So it is just whichever texts they are working on in class and then uh, they are usually saved in well, within the corpus with a lot of metadata that describe the task. So usually data is saved on whether they were allowed to use a dictionary or not and many, many different uh, different things, but they don't receive any specific instructions as 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 such. Now that that's for the for the first question. For the second question, uh, we have not looked at any other genres. Uh, so because this was data collected, this is an in-house corpus. Well, we could we could call it like that. So we have not yet looked at any other genres, but that would definitely be one one possible way of moving forward. So the reason one of the reasons why we have not looked at other genres yet is that we are trying to understand how to set the procedure on what is already available and then the next steps would be adding adding genres but i absolutely agree that this this could have an effect so thank you for thank you for the suggestion okay thank you so much again thank maya you. okay now we have lunch downstairs and we will back at the 2 and 10 yeah. OK, I think we are ready to start again. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed lunch. <laughs> so. Excellent to hear. There'll be more to come. OK, so it is with great pleasure that I present Philip Duran, our second. Keynote speaker. Philip Duran is Professor of Applied Linguistics and Education at the University of Exeter. His research to date broadly falls into the themes of writing development, English for academic purposes, collocation and corpus linguistics methods. He has worked on collaborative projects aimed at analysing the development of writing in children's first, second and third languages. He has published some key studies on collocation and language learning, which probably most of you have read repeatedly because they're very, very interesting and very, very useful. Um, and he has also recently published a guide for research with Routledge last year, which is entitled Corpus Linguistics for Writing Development. And this is another key resource, especially for um, researchers in our field and for beginning researchers, but even for advanced researchers. Um, the title of his keynote is Learner Corpora and Phraseology. Philip? The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Uh, Stefania, thank you for organizing this lovely conference. It's, it's such a nice, um, friendly, supportive environment, isn't it? I mean, it's so nice to have this small group of people who really know what they're talking about and who are you know, so constructive. And it's been it's been great to, to hear the talks this morning. Um, thank you also for giving me the best slot of the day. When I saw the timetable, I didn't realize how lucky I was with the slot. I'd be coming in when everybody is full of cheesecake and wine. And I <laughs> so in such a good mood. So I hope the cheesecake is putting you in a really good mood and that the wine is sort of dulling your critical faculties so that you don't notice all of the uh, mistakes that I make. Um, the, the title is really broad, isn't it? Um, I 
wrote, wrote this very broad title um, several months ago when I didn't know what I was going to be talking about. I thought learner corporate and phraseology can probably cover pretty much anything I might say. Um, I haven't actually got a study or anything like that to present to you. I really just wanted to take this as an opportunity to think through some methodological questions um, that I struggle with. Um, and I was really pleased actually to see some of the issues that I want to talk about coming up in a lot of the papers and the questions that we had this morning. Um, so I hope it's relevant. Um, I'm going to be, it's mostly theorising really about the methodology, but I'm going to be drawing on some data um, of my own just as examples. This is in no way any of this a completed study. You know, none of this has been peer reviewed. This is really sort of a quick and dirty analysis for the sake of this conference specifically, just for the sake of this presentation. Um, my starting point, though, um, is this. Um, so this is a picture that I use sometimes in my teaching. I've used it in talks sometimes as well, um, which I think about a lot um, when I'm thinking about uh, learner corpus research. Does anyone know this picture? No, oh, you do. Ah, well, there you go. OK, ah, brilliant. So this this is a picture, but do you remember who it's by? You weren't paying attention. Come on. <laughs> it's, so th this is a picture by uh, Salvador Dali, um, and it is it hangs in um, the Salvador Dali Museum in Florida. Um, and the reason, so this this picture, I'll I'll show you the the trick of the thing in just really quickly. This painting hangs at the end of a long corridor. Um, and the reason it hangs at the end of the long corridor is that they encourage you to come up and look at it close up and you can see it's like a woman standing in front of a window, kind of a cross shape. And there's this kind of, I don't know, God thing coming out of the sky and it's all that sort of thing. And then they encourage you to turn around and walk to the other end of the corridor and turn around and look at it again. Because when you look at it from a distance, you see this, uh, which is the same, the same picture from a long way, just shrunk down. OK, so that becomes that. And the reason I really like this is I think it's a great analogy for um, what we do with corpus linguistics when we're doing quantitative analysis of, of a corpus, that we've got all of these texts and we're looking at them close up and we can see all of these details in them. And it's really, really interesting and we can say interesting things about it. But also, when we stand back and look at it from a distance, which is, I think, what we do when we use quantification with a corpus, a different picture can come out and we can see this pattern that we couldn't see when we were up close to it. And hopefully that pattern is kind of surprising and tells us something new. And to me, that's the really exciting thing about corpus linguistics. Um, you know, it's People talk a lot about the advantage of corpus linguistics. You've got big data, loads of things. You can make generalizations and so on. But to me, the really fun thing is not the fact that you can make generalizations. It's the fact that you can see these patterns that you hadn't noticed before or you hadn't thought about before. Um, you know, like collocation, like semantic prosody, things like that. That once you know about them, you think, well, yeah, that's obvious. But until you stood back and saw that big picture, it wasn't obvious. So this this is the, I'm, I'm going to come back to this analogy a few times through the presentation. Um, I want to talk about two specific um, methodological challenges that I always find when I'm working with a corpus, with a learner corpus. Um, I'm going to call one of them the challenge of quantification. I'm going to call the other one the challenge of interpretation. Um, and those are the two points that I really want to discuss. So what are these? Well, the challenge of quantification is really about how you can sum up, how you can capture what's in a corpus using numbers. Okay, So, I mean, this is obviously a really counterintuitive thing to do, right, is that you take a text and you summarise it with numbers. Um, the people who aren't in our field, I think, find this a really foreign concept. So, concept. so I work in a school of education, and in my school of education, people are really obsessed with the idea of, are you a quantitative person or are you a qualitative person? And to me, I'm like, well, I mean, that makes just no sense at all in, in the context of corpus linguistics, because I'm both of them all the time. Um, so the idea of taking language and summarising it as numbers, I think is counterintuitive, but it's what we do all the time, and it's the real core of, of corpus linguistics, right? Um, so for the purpose of this um, talk, where we're talking about 
phraseology, I'm really interested in the idea of summarizing collocation use with numbers. And how do we do that? And what does it mean? Um, so what does that look like? So this is a text from um, the corpus that I use. This is a corpus of children's writing. Um, so if we wanted to quantify collocation, we might do something like this. We might say, well, I'm interested in uh, adjective noun combinations. So I go through and I find all of the adjective nouns. There are the adjective nouns. And then I say, well, OK, I've got loads of text. <laughs> now, how is, I, I go through and do this for all of these texts and there's, I don't know, 3000 of them or something. How can I possibly understand that? No, I can't understand that just by looking at the text. I need a number to sum it up. This is really the kind of the, the up close. You know, I, I can't make sense of it really. Um, so I want to summarize it in some way. So here's a way of summarizing it. So this is a quantitative summary of adjective noun combinations in all of those texts. So this is really like the standing back from the picture thing. Um, what I've quantified here is the percentage of adjective nouns in the corpus which are academic. And by academic, I mean that in um, an academic corpus in the British and Ameri uh, British, uh, so, uh, Brit uh, British academic written English corpus, the Boer corpus, they meet certain frequency criteria. So appearing more than once a million words, high mutual information score, that sort of thing. Um, so this was um, a study that I did using um, my growth and grammar corpus. So this is the corpus of um, L1 children's writing in England. So we're working here with about 700 year six texts. So year six kids in the UK, they're about 11 years old, 10, 11 years old. Um, so they're at the left end, left hand, there, uh, left hand end of the graph. Year nine texts, so three years older than that, about 600 of those, 500 year 11 texts, so that's year, that's 16 years old. Um, and what I find is in students non-literary writing, so when they're not writing stories, basically, the percentage of combinations which are academic collocations increases. Nice. So it goes up from about 8% up to about 15%. Um, whereas in their literary writing, so in their stories, it stays flat across the year groups. OK, so that's nice. There's, I've used the numbers to summarize this whole mess of stuff. I've gotten all of that summarized in a nice little graph. Brilliant. OK, lovely. Wasn't that nice? I can write my article um, and it's all finished. Lovely. Um, obviously, I'm going to suggest that there are some problems with this. That's why it's a challenge. It's not just easy. Um, so what we're trying to do here is simplify the data. So the data are really complex. We've got all of these texts. There's lots of things happening in the text. Somehow we want to simplify it so we can see these big patterns. We want to stand back. We're going to lose information. We're going to lose the detail, but we might see a broader picture. Key thing is we need to do that without distorting the picture, without changing the picture or giving a misleading picture. So to me, that's the challenge is how can we simplify the data so that we can see the big picture, so we can see the big pattern, but we don't distort the picture. Um, the problem of interpretation is trying to say what those numbers mean and what kind of theoretical significance we can give to those numbers. Now, the love, well, another lovely thing, apart from the surprising patterns, another lovely thing about corpus linguistics is that we're dealing with real language in use. Ideally, you know, we're dealing with authentic texts. We're not dealing with something that someone did in a laboratory. We're not doing dealing with something that someone wrote because I told them to write it. We're dealing with real languages, real people use it in real contexts. That's wonderful. Um, a lot of the time when we're analyzing a learner corpus, we want to make claims about a student's or a learner's language ability. And that is part of what feeds into the language that they use. But there's obviously lots of other things that feed into the language that they use, right? There's what are they writing about? What type of task are they being given? Who are their audience? Or more importantly, who do they think their audience are? And how do they conceptualize that audience? What are their own personal preferences? What language do they like using? Um, what do they know about register? What are their aims? 
what about their other cognitive skills? What about their concentration skills? Um, what, what do they know about the world and the writing situation? What equipment have they got available to them? Are they writing on a word processor? Have they got a dictionary available to them? Has the teacher given them some input in advance of everything that's happening? So all of this stuff is feeding into the language in use. So given that all that stuff's happening, what conclusions can we draw from our data? How can we possibly say something about their language abilities, for example, or their knowledge of register conventions when all of this is feeding into the, the language in use at once? And I think I don't have an answer to that question, but what I want to avoid is kind of this situation where we're just saying, oh, look, you know, this happened in the corpus, therefore I can conclude this about the student's language abilities. Okay. Um, so when I look at data like this, I need to be able to say, well, what's, what's the reason for these patterns? Why is this increasing and why is this staying the same? Is it just that they're getting better? Or is there something else happening there? What are all the things that are happening that's, that's causing this pattern? OK, so I'm going to go through an example um, again, coming from, from the growth and grammar corpus, looking at adjective noun combinations and sort of work through an example of quantifying collocation use and then thinking about what that means and really trying to pull out all of the problems. Um, so here is the text that I showed you earlier um, and I'm going to take take you through this as a, a method that people often use for quantifying collocation use. So quite often what we do is we find all of the combinations, so all of the adjective noun combinations, and then we take them out of the text and we put them in an Excel spreadsheet or something. OK, so that's our first simplification, right? We've taken them out of the text. We, we did have this big complicated text on the left. Now we've just just got this little spreadsheet with five rows and, and two columns. Um, then the next thing we do is we put some numbers to them. We do the quantification thing. So I go through and I say a valuable experience. Well, that occurs in the Bohr corpus twice. First word appears 316 times. Second word appears 2413 times. So it gets a mutual information score of four. And I put all those in my spreadsheet. Right? That's usually the first step that people take. Then um, uh, we take the mean of those numbers and say, OK, so this text gets a seven. So we started off with this big complex text and now we have a number. We say for collocation, this is a seven. Um, that's nice in a way because it enables us to, to make our graphs and so on. But we've obviously lost a lot of information there. Um, we then take another abstraction. We put that seven into the whole list of all of the texts in the corpora. So um, we've got uh, 2000 texts or whatever it is, and we put them all together um, and then we come up with our graph. OK, so um, this is what I ended up with when I put all of the mean mutual information scores um, for that corpus into a graph. And it gives us some kind of interesting patterns. So if I looked at this, what can I conclude? Well, again, at the bottom, we've got the literary writing and we don't see much of a difference. It kind of fluctuates, doesn't really go. It, it's low all the way through. Now, that's quite interesting by itself because my reference corpus was an academic corpus. So I'm saying, well, if we get those mutual information scores from an academic reference corpus, we can see a genre distinction between the stories that the kids write and the more kind of academic style writing that they write. Brilliant. OK, that's quite interesting. We also get for the other ones, so we've got um, writing for their English, so the English non-literary writing, that's things like literary criticism that they're writing. Um, humanities, so that's mostly for uh, history texts, and we've got science. And what we see there, I guess, is a jump from year six to year nine. So that's year six is primary school and year nine is secondary school. Um, so we see a jump from primary school to secondary school, and then it's kind of evened off after that. Great. OK, so I could look at that and I could say, well, that's kind of an interesting pattern. I'll report that. There's my article. Off we go. Wonderful. Um, you might have noticed there's a step which many people take that I haven't taken here yet, um, and that's to do with the fact that mutual information scores. Give kind of weird results when you have very low frequency combinations, right? So these are some 
low frequency combinations from the British Academic Written English Corpus, uh, Calmerian Zombie and Flamboyant Rambling and Padded Dashboard, Itinerant Kidnapper. So probably none of us would want to say that these are pucker collocations, right? But they all get really high mutual information scores. So for this reason, many people, when they're using mutual information, and I've seen people uh, do it here today, is we get rid of those low frequency ones. So we'll just say if something appears with low frequency in the reference corpus, we'll just we'll, we'll take it out of our results. So for example, going back to my text that I started with, we've got three here which have really low um, C frequency, so the, comp the, the collocation frequency. So valuable experience only occurred twice, fantastic opportunity only occurred twice, brighter future only occurred three times. So we might say, well, let's take those ones out and we'll adjust them at the mutual information score. We'll just use the, the ones that appear frequently in the uh, reference corpus. OK, so I can rerun my analysis with this new kind of more reliable version of the mutual information score, which just uses things that are frequent. What do we get then? We get a completely different pattern. Um, that's a bit scary, isn't it? <laughs> so, so what have we got now? It's kind of really low for pretty much everything apart from science writing, where it starts off really high in primary school and then drops statistically significantly. <laughs> <laughs> it's year nine and year 11. OK, so this is a concern, isn't it? We've got these two completely different patterns. I made a fairly small change to the methodology, something that people do all the time. Suddenly we've got a totally different pattern. So what's going on here? OK. Um, just a reminder of the steps that I've taken to get here. So we started off with the text. I found the adjective noun combinations in it. And then I looked up those items in a reference corpus. I took out the ones that low frequency, got mutual information for the other ones, summarized it with a mean score. And then I put all those mean scores together and summarized all of that in a graph. So there's lots of steps of simplification here. Um, let's look at each of them. Well, particularly, let's look at the, the, the second one first, where we've gone from the spreadsheet full of mean mutual information numbers and we've gone from that to the graph what's happened there if we dig under the surface a little bit um, well if we look at the full range of the figures so instead of instead of yeah that spreadsheet we can get a density bar right there. Um, it shows the whole spread of results. So the blue one is the red one. And we can see almost the whole contribution right with the around six of the steps. Year nine is a bit less spiky, something like about um if I go back to my spreadsheet it is all in the same class who have all come with the mean mutual information score of year 16. Um, and that's kind of giving us this little which of course is affecting the overall average. So why? What happened there? Well, let's go and have a look. So we need to look at text 6339H, 6442D and so on. Let's go and have a look at those. Um, so this is 339H and these were the combinations from there. Um, and we can see that the term Petri dish with a mutual information score of 15.899 appears twice. And all of the other adjective noun combinations don't appear at all. So they got zeros 
So the mean mutual information score for this text is 15.8899. Um, if we look at the other ones from that group, get the same thing, get the same thing. So for this class, we had a whole class of kids there who are writing this science report where they're using the term pet tradition. They all use it twice. Um, and they don't use any other adjective noun combinations that appear in, in the corpus. Uh, right. So the other important thing here is all of these NAs. Now, when I look at that, that worries me because we're losing a huge amount of information there, right? I've gotten rid of those because they were low frequency combinations or they didn't appear in the reference corpus. I had to get rid of them because the mutual information score wouldn't be reliable. But I've lost so much information. You know, can we really say that that 15.889 captures the collocation use of each of these texts? Probably not, because we're only looking at a very small number of the adjective noun combinations they're using. If I put those back in, Okay. And we can repeat the pattern if we look across the other types of texts. So the English non-literary writing again. OK, so from this, what can we conclude? tentatively, because this is I'm saying not peer reviewed. This is just an example I put together for this uh, presentation. Um, but primary school children, the year six ones, use far more combinations that are infrequent in mature academic writing than the secondary school children. So they're using far more combinations which are, were off the scale in terms of the mutual information. We didn't include them for the mutual information because they're so low frequency in the reference corpus. Um, and in the science writing, when they do use frequently attested combinations, they tend to be very, very strongly associated ones. So they're, they're using mostly things that aren't in the reference corpus. If it is in the reference corpus, it's a really high MI one. Um, and it looks like it's associated with specific tasks. So there was one particular set of writing that included the thing about the Petri dish, and that really influenced what they did. Um, so that kind of, well, OK, so so what can we say methodologically about that? So the method that I used, and it's a method that lots of people use. I've used it myself. Lots of other people have used it. You know, the whole idea of phraseological sophistication. Um, it compresses information into mean scores twice. So we got a mean for the text, and then we got the mean of all of the means in the texts. And that loses a lot of information. It does bring out inf interesting patterns, so it can bring out interesting patterns. 
but it can be misleading. And it's so important to go back to the full range of scores to see what's happening to, to help understand that pattern. Um, and also we need to go back to the text, the individual text to understand the patterns. And that kind of can, brings me on to the second thing. So my second problem um, was the problem of interpretation and this idea that there's so many things that feed into the language use. Uh, now, going back to our examples again, what happened here? What was feeding into this language use? Well, if we drop the spreadsheets for a minute and go back to the original texts, we can get a sense of that. So this one, um, let's read the, the first few sentences. Microbes experiment. We went to the college to grow microbes in Petri dishes. First, we divided the Petri dish into three sections. In section one, we put a fingerprint that had touched soil. In section two, we put a fingerprint that hadn't touched anything that hadn't been washed. Leave it there. The next one, we went to the college to grow microbes in Petri dishes. Does this sound familiar? Um, we divided a Petri dish into three sections. Then we labeled them one to three. So that first sentence obviously is identical. Um, the second sentence is almost identical. Um, so that the, the first one had a first at the beginning and it used a number three instead of spelling it out. After that, they do diverge a bit. So in section one, we put a fingerprint that hadn't touched that had touched soil. And the other one, it says after that, we put a fingerprint in that had been put some soil. So you can see it's diverging a bit there. Um, the third text, we went to the college to grow microbes in Petri dishes. <laughs> we divided a Petri, uh, the Petri dish into three sections and then it diverges again. So clearly these kids have been given a format to follow, right? Um, the first sentence is the same for everybody. The second sentence is almost the same with some minor variation, right? And then after that, they, they split, split off a little bit. Um, okay, so what what can what can we say about this? So I think these texts are telling us as much about the learning context as they are telling us about these students' language abilities. Right? So you know, going back to to this thing, um, we're we're getting something about their language abilities, but we're getting probably much more about the writing situation and about the subject content. Yeah? So it's telling us about those things. But I think this is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it's quite nice that corpus research can tell us about all this stuff. It's not just telling us about language, but it's telling us about how language gets used in context. And so we're learning about the context as, as well as, as, as learning about all the other stuff. But we need to do all of this careful digging and going back and so on in order to understand what it is that we're learning about. Okay. I have another example that I'd like to share. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll read this out because they're not that easy to, to read. So this is from a year two text. So the text reads, should the SpongeBob live under the sea? We have been discussing whether SpongeBob should live under the sea. Many people believe that SpongeBob should live under the sea because firstly, he soaks up water. Secondly, he washes the rocks in the sea. On the other hand, many people believe he should not live in the sea because he is not a fish. <laughs> in conclusion, there are many great reasons for and against SpongeBob should live under the sea because there is his house. What do you think? <laughs> oh, they're wonderful, aren't they? I love, I, I really love working with these children's texts. They're so nice. Um, here is another text from the same class. Um, should SpongeBob live under the sea? We've been discussing whether SpongeBob should live under the sea. Many people believe that some SpongeBob should live under the sea because firstly, SpongeBob can suck up the sea. And secondly, SpongeBob can clean the rocks. On the other hand, many that believe that SpongeBob should not live under the sea because he isn't a fish and he lives in a house and lives beside the sea. 
In conclusion, there are many great reasons for and against whether SpongeBob should live under the sea, but I believe that SpongeBob should live under the sea because that's where his home is. All right, it's it's clear what's happened here, right? So you've got the thank you. Um, we've got the the teacher um, is trying to help the students understand how to write an argumentative essay. Yeah, I mean these are six year old kids. Yeah, and the the teacher has clearly given them a, a template to follow. And there's clearly been here. You can imagine that the situation they they have had some kind of class discussion about it, right? You know, they they've come up with a whole let's let's discuss what about whether should SpongeBob should live under the sea. And all the students have put up their hands and they've written up on the board what are the reasons for, what are the reasons against, and so on. And so the content is the same, slightly differently expressed. Um, but they 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 they've obviously it's the the the, the product of a of a class discussion. Um, we also get variations on it. So again, this is from the same class. Should gingerbread man be eaten? <laughs> the reasons are great. He should he should. Many people believe gingerbread man should be eaten because firstly, he's quite mean and he runs away from the cow and the silly old horse. Secondly, the cow and the silly old horse are hungry. On the other hand, people disagree. They think gingerbread man shouldn't be eaten. In conclusion, there are great reasons why gingerbread man shouldn't be eaten. All right, and then we've got should Sleeping Beauty stay asleep? We've been discussing whether Sleeping Beauty should stay asleep. Many people believe that Sleeping Beauty should stay asleep because firstly, she has been sleeping for 100 years. Secondly, she wants to be lazy. <laughs> Lastly, she doesn't want to go to work. On the other hand, some people disagree. That's because she's been sleeping nearly forever and so on. Um, Obviously, what's happened here is they've got this template. They've done a class discussion with SpongeBob. They've practiced it with SpongeBob. Then they've all got off and they found their own topics. They've done different topics and they've used the same template. This is how you write a argumentative essay, reasons for and against coming to a conclusion, blah, blah, blah. You choose your own topic. You come up with your own reasons for and against, write your thing. Um, and we've got I've got 34 texts in the corpus on that written by 21 different children and all on different topics. Um, so what does that mean in terms of our corpus analysis, do you think? Well, it means our corpus analysis is going to look really silly. Um, so the phrase um, or the lexical bundle, as we could perhaps could call it, on the other hand. So on the other hand, if you're analysing academic writing, on the other hand, is probably one of the first phrases that you're going to look for because it's always the most frequent lexical bundle in every academic corpus, right? On the other hand, and if we look at years six, nine, and eleven, we get ah, oh, look, you know, we can see on the other hand is indicative of their um, increase, their, their increased academic writing potential as they go through the year groups. Um, but if we put year two in, um, it's way, way, way more frequent than anywhere else. Why is it way more frequent than anywhere else? Well, it's because we've got 34 texts that are all following exactly the same format and all using on the other hand. And because they're quite short texts, the frequency per million words for on the other hand is like really, really high. Um, so we get our quantitative overall picture like that. Now, I think what I'd like to say here, I guess, is that when you see a, a graph like this that looks really counterintuitive, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's something wrong. Perhaps it just means that the data are telling you something different from what you'd expected, and you can then dig into that data and find something really, really interesting, useful from that. You know, I dug into that data and I found this really cool thing about how children are taught how to write academic essays and how they learn phraseology through that. So I think these counterintuitive results, which might not be telling us about language ability and might not be um, what we'd expected, can give us clues to some really interesting things. OK, so wrapping up. Um, quantification can bring out really interesting patterns, but it can also be really misleading, especially if we think that our numbers are telling us something directly about students' language ability. Um, um, and I think it's especially important when we're dealing with phraseology. 
because phraseology is so tightly bound to contexts. Yeah, I mean, it's true for lots of things, um, but a phrase like on the other hand is so closely keyed in to one specific um, communicative job that this kind of thing I think is going to happen more frequently with collocations, with let's go buttons, with phrases than it does for vocabulary or for features of syntax. It will happen for them as well, but I think it happens even more for phraseology. Um, also, I think those contexts play crucial roles in learning, so I think they're things that we need to know about. We should learn about all this stuff that's happening, that's causing these odd patterns, because that's what learning is. You know, learning doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, learning is tightly, tightly linked into context, and we need to be learning about it. Um, and the broad brush quantitative analysis, you need to be need to be interpreted with caution. So we need to have this constant movement, I think, between the kind of the stepping back with the big picture and hey, look, it's Abraham Lincoln and the getting close into it to see what are the details of the picture are. And if you're just looking at one of those, then we, we miss really important things. Um, yeah, so we need fine grained analyses, so that's not necessarily reading the text. It might be a more detailed quantitative analysis. So what, a lot of what I showed you here, it, it wasn't reading the text. It was doing a more fine grained quantitative analysis, like looking at a density plot showing the whole distribution instead of just looking at the mean and the confidence interval. Um, but also going back to the text and reading the text and finding out what's happening in the texts. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for this great keynote. Any questions? Well, that raised my head early on and then jump in. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Phil. Always um, wonderful to listen to you. Um, I have three questions, okay. but they're quick because I may not get a chance. <laughs> Another chance. Um, the texts about SpongeBob, uh, Gingerbread Man, yeah. and Beauty. yeah, how old were the kids? They would have been six or seven. Six. six. Six or seven year olds. This is pretty amazing for a six year old, considering some words were like should plenty of correctly spelled words. I'm but yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, as you say, lots of spelling errors and stuff. Um, but you know, they've they've clearly been strongly mm. supported. You know, mm. this heavily scaffolded text. Is it a regular school or some? Yeah. Okay, yeah, school. okay. Um, I noticed you were not deleting the titles. You kept the titles and you were not deleting, um, pop, I guess, you were not deleting adjective noun um, or target collocations, combinations included in the titles. So my, my practice would normally be um, excluding, uh, deleting the titles and excluding everything that was already provided to them in the prompt. But I noticed you kept the titles. So the, the, the prompts were taken out. Anything, From the analysis. Anything, anything mm. yeah. So and anything that looked like it mm. wasn't written by the student. Mm was taken out. Mm, OK, so you just kept it on the example, but these were. So, well, the, the, yeah, so the, the, the heading would be in, but say if there's instructions, you know, do this mm -hmm. or if there's a question, they get taken out. Mm -hmm. But like you had to my microbes experiment. So that was kept. Yeah. OK, all right. Um, and but it my, doesn't, doesn't fit the analysis. It's not added to the I mean, not this one, but another one does. Yeah. Obviously had hundreds of texts. Um, and my last question is about you dealing with um, spelling mistakes. Yes. Were you correcting all of them? Well, hopefully. So that, that was the transcribers' job. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the corpus, we've got both the original spelling preserved and we've got the corrected version. Um, mm -hmm. With this sort of thing, also I'm using the corrected version because mm -hmm. if you go looking for those in reference corpus, you're not going to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. So your approach was to correct every single spelling mistake um, Yes, as, you know, every, every single spelling mistake that was spotted mm -hmm. by the transcriber. You know, as mm -hmm. I go back and carry on working with the corpus now, I occasionally notice one that they've missed. Mm -hmm. But that that was the policy to, to have. So we, we've got a, a tag in the corpus, which is mm -hmm. like a spelling tag. Mm -hmm. And it says this is the corrected version. This was the original mm -hmm. version so that you've got the option of which one you want to use. Were there any instances of phrases so misspelled that you wouldn't know what the intended meaning was? Yeah, so I mean, <clears throat> I think not just that, there were whole sentences where you couldn't mm. even read it. So this is like one of the um, perils of working with 
texts from very young children is that sometimes they're just illegible or undecipherable. Mm. So we've got some texts in our corpus that mm. are, you know, when, when you look at the correct version, they might be two words long because that was all the transcriber could make mm. out. Um, so that's that's something that happens with these sorts of things. With this analysis, we mm. just had texts where there was a substantial amount of text in there that mm. we were able to make sense mm. of. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much. <laughs> Any other questions? So if I may, um, <laughs> two questions then, but again, quick, hopefully. Thank you for a very uh, interesting presentation. And my first question is also about the unit uh, of analysis. I was thinking to what extent Petri dish is even a collocation. I mean, I mean, it is two words, but in, in a sense, it's one concept, it's like alarm clock or course book, depending how we spell it. It's just Petri dish happens to be spelled separately. So there's, a, I think, another layer in the analysis which makes it even more complex. Um, I, I agree. So on, on that one, I'm really left at the mercy of the parser that I'm using. So, you know, for this one, I um, parsed it using the standard parser. And if that counted something as a, an adjective noun combination, then it was counted as an adjective, except for semi determiners, because that parser has an annoying habit of tagging everything that I would call a determiner, an adjective. So I th those were corrected in a post tagger, but everything else, it was down to how the parser tokenized the text and the part of speech te uh, tags that it gave it. But it, it does, it does, sorry, it, it does tend to be quite accurate with adjective noun combinations. That's why I focused on those ones. And there are some combinations that it, the accuracy looks quite dodgy on, but for adjective nouns, it tends to be fairly mm -hmm. good. Yeah, but well, generally, I think the definition of the multi word unit sometimes also brings yeah. another complication to the research. But another question, which is perhaps broader, is where does it leave us? I mean, because you were saying, OK, so what's the value of the quantitative analysis in the in the first place? Because I mean, we want to have this bigger picture, but then in the end, and I, I get frustrated very often with my research as well, I tend to go for quantitative research. And then when I look close at my uh, at my result, I think it doesn't summarize anything in the first place, right? Because there are so many but this and but that. But we want to generalize. How do we generalize if we can't trust our uh, our results? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about generalization. I, I think where it leaves us is it leaves us being quite exploratory in our research. I, I think you know we we start off thinking that we're researching one thing, and we might turn out to have researched something else by the end of it. Um, and yeah, we, but at we, the we, end, we want to have some take home message like, yeah. you know, children do learn <laughs> words and phrases or they don't learn words and phrases. <laughs> I, I think they can, there can be take home messages, but the take home messages probably need to be quite tentative uh, because, you know, our, let's be realistic, our, our, our corporate, as much as we'd like to believe that they're representative samples of a population, they never really are they're never really randomly sampled um, and it's really hard most of the time to make an argument that it's genuinely representative of a broad population because most of the time we don't even know what the broad population looks like. So I think wh whatever approach we're taking, we need to recognise that those results are tentative. I think the value of the quantitative stuff to me is that it shows me what things to look at that you can say, uh, well, you know, there, there's there's obviously something going on, something weird going on there. Let's go and, and have a look at what it is. So to me, it's it's kind of a, a guidance rather than ah, yeah, this is this is the answer. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Uh, thank you for your really fascinating data. My reading of your of your data is not so much about pr uh, the pros and cons of quantification. It's uh, I think it has more to do with sampling. So the pros and cons of uh, some kind of systematic, illicit, controlled sampling versus the sampling that you did that was freer, you know, more in the wild, so to speak. So I I, I think that this type of analysis really has to do with the, how we select the text for our corpora and. Because what you showed, some people could call it, you know, like systematic bias, error, whatever, sampling error or things like that. But on the other hand, we all know that if you collect very, uh, you know, controlled 
text, then you have other disadvantages. So what, what is your opinion about this and how, how we assemble our corpora, especially for uh, the developmental analysis like yours? I, absolutely, I think we're, we're caught in a dilemma that the, the only way out of it, I think, is for a research funding body to give us like 100 million pounds to collect a, a, a fantastic corpus. Um, but, you know, since that's not going to happen, um, <laughs> the, the, the only way out, of it, I suppose, is to caveat all of our results very strongly. Um, I mean, you're right. Many people, if you're interested specifically in language development, people just say, well, let's forget about authentic texts. Let's go in and elicit something under controlled conditions where I've controlled the topic, I've controlled the genre, I've controlled what conditions it's it's uh, it's elicited under so that all of those other things that I had in the picture of what affects language use, I'm just bracketing them out. Um, fine. I mean, that's that's an approach people use and I wouldn't criticize it. I think that's a perfectly fine way of doing things. Um, but it also it also means you've left all of those other things out. And I think all of those other things are interesting and important as well. Um, so you don't get the insights into what's happening in the classroom. And also it assumes a lot of knowledge on the part of the. Um, well, I can put this. So if the type of text is something that changes as people are progressing in proficiency or are getting older at school. If that is part of what changes, it doesn't make sense to hold it constant. You know, if, if you if if you give a year two student the same task to do as a year 11 student, already you're dealing with fanciful data because that's just not what happens. And that's not what you know, that, that's all definitely going to be a, a kind of falsified impression of language development. Um, so I think there's no easy way out of it. It's just a case of making sure that we're aware of the issues so that we can interpret our data accordingly. Or, or, or if you know someone who wants to give us 100 million quid to you know, randomly sample a perfectly representative corpus, then that would be nice as well. OK, that's all we have time for, I'm afraid. So let's thank Phil again for his keynote. OK, next up, Ellen LeFol and Raffaella Bottini. We will be presenting on the effect of the reference corpus on lexical and phraseological sophistication measures, reflecting on their reliability and validity in L2 English. The floor is yours. I'm from Lancaster University and today I'm presenting with Ellen LeFall from University of Cologne and we're uh, going to present a study on the effect of the reference corpus on lexical and phraseological sophistication measures or to be more precise oops the curious effect of the reference corpus <laughs> to cite the title of the paper that Ellen and I have just submitted. So we're going to reflect on the reliability and validity of sophistication measures and today we're focusing specifically on L2 English speech. Uh, so we're all familiar with the construct of lexical sophistication, so the original definition by Reed uh, refers to the proportion of unusual or advanced words, so infrequent um, in a text appropriate to the topic and style of the communicative event. So this definition refers to the frequency of words, uh, of individual words. But the construct of sophistication is obviously uh, a bit broader and is multidimensional and includes uh, a whole range of features, including also multi words units, so expanding to phraseological sophistication. So in our project, we focus just on the first part of the uh, construct, looking at the individual, the frequency of individual words and their appropriateness to the topic and style of the communicative event. And to operationalize lexical sophistication, there's a range of measures that we can use. The more popular, the most popular one uh, is based on mean frequency values in a text. So in this case, we extract the frequency score of each word in a target text that we want to analyze. We use a reference corpus to do this, and then we measure the mean uh, score either for all words or just for content words or just for function words. And the idea, so the interpretation, is usually based on the assumption that the lower 
the mean frequency score of a text, the more infrequent the vocabulary uh, is and the more sophisticated it is as well. So this is the usual assumption that we use, and this is something that I'd like you to remember because we'll go back to it later on. So here we have an example of a text taken from the Ignal corpus, so an L2 English corpus that includes both, both spoken and written language. This is a monologic um, spoken transcription. Well, monologic transcription, transcription of a monologic <laughs> spoken production. So what we do to um, calculate mean frequency scores for lexical sophistication is that we use a reference corpus. Let's say we use an automatic tool, one of the existing ones, and let's say the tool comes with a written reference corpus integrated in it, and the written corpus is the BNC 1994. So if we use this reference corpus, then we extract a frequency score for each of the words in the target text out of the reference corpus, and then we calculate the mean frequency of the whole text. And we can distinguish content words and function words if we want, so CW and FW. Uh, if we want to change the reference corpus, let's say we want to match the mode of the target text, which is a spoken language, and let's say we want to use the spoken BNC 2014, we can use the same procedure and we can extract a frequency score from the reference corpus for each word in the target text and then measure the mean frequency score for content words and, and function words. What we can see here is that there are large differences across the results that we get from the two reference corpus. And this is already, uh, well, this highlights a potential issue. And what is even more concerning that is that this is not an issue regarding just the analysis of an individual speaker. Let's have a look at what uh, happens when we compare different proficiency levels. So here we have two speakers, spoken production, B1 level, B2 level. We use a written reference corpus. We measure the lexical sophistication scores, so mean frequency scores of all words, content words and function words. And in yellow, we have the lowest scores, which indicate the most sophisticated um, words that in case of content words are used by the B2 learner. If we use a spoken reference corpus, we get the opposite pattern. It is now the B1 learner that uses more advanced or more infrequent content words. So this example highlights a possible issue that also involves language testing because language testing in language testing, we use these kind of measures to predict learners proficiency levels. And if we don't have reliable measures, uh, well, how can we measure our learners proficiency and how can we replicate studies and how can we compare results across different studies that use different reference corpora and yes this brings us to our uh, research question and our interest in what could be the potential effect of the reference corpus in uh, when we use these types of measures and in particular uh, for this particular presentation we're going to focus on just the uh, extent that the reference corpus um, uh, has an effect on um, the mean content word frequencies of learner text, and we probably will only have time to look at monologic speech. And we're comparing different reference corpora um, that we're using that represent different modes and different registers. So this is the target corpus that we looked at, the ICNEL that um, Rafael has just mentioned. Um, we chose this corpus um, because it actually controls for a lot of things. So we could say it's not so much now naturalistic, um, ecologically valid learner text because it's it's very controlled. The spoken data was collected on the phone, so it was a, a, a very strict procedure. Learners had a certain amount of time, they had a specific topic, um, but all of this is then controlled for, um, which then enables us to look more specifically at the effect of the reference corpus, which is what we're interested in in here. And it's also worth mentioning that there's some L1 data in there, so that's an interesting comparison point. Um, and we are interested in the replicability of, of our research and replicability in, in learner corpus research in, in general, and this is an open access corpus so that we could redo these analysis with different types of measures. Um, the reference corpora that we chose are three uh, general English um, corpora that I'm sure you're familiar with, and then three uh, academic um, corpora, or rather in each case um, a spoken corpus and a written corpus 
and then the combination of spoken and written. And if you're wondering why this strange combination, um, that's because it's actually very common in a lot of existing tools to measure uh, lexical complexity. And so this is actually something that's very often done in, in studies. So we thought it was an interesting and important comparison to make. Um, about the method, I'll go over this very briefly, but we have to process the data in very uh, the usual way. When we talk about content word, uh, mean content word frequencies, we're actually uh, referring to lemmas here. That's important to know. So we lemmatized all of the text. Uh, we extracted um, word list or lemma lists from the six reference corpora that I've just mentioned. And then we measured um, lexical sophistication um, using uh, Rafaela's Lex Complexity tool, which um, will soon be available on, on GitHub, um, on the basis of these six reference corpora. So um, the nice thing about the tool is that you can um, add your own lists and use your own list, um, custom list to create um, or to measure these uh, measures and you get a very detailed output so that you can also see which words are not included at all in the reference corpus um, so that can avoid some sort of petri dish effects um, that we just heard about. <laughs> Um, and then in terms of the analysis, we're looking at um, linear mix effects regression modeling in order to try and tease out um, which of the effects are the strongest. Uh, so we, we expect that there will be some topic effects. For instance, there are two topics in the, in the corpus. Um, and so we can uh, tease that out and, and really look specifically on the effect of the reference corpus. So on to some results. So we're going to look at the results that uh, only regard mean frequency scores of content words today and just looking at the now spoken monologues data set and we have that symbol on the bottom uh, just to remind that. So just looking at the observed um, mean frequency scores for content words, uh, we can see uh, here they, they're visualized um, based on the three reference corpora, so the written, the spoken, and the combination of the two across proficiency levels. And we can immediately see that uh, using a spoken reference corpus produces higher mean frequency scores in the mid uh, part of the, of the graph. And then we have higher scores for L1 speakers of English and higher or more proficient speakers of English. So basically, uh, it looks like speakers produce more frequent words when we use a spoken reference corpus to measure their sophistication, so they might produce more typical language of the spoken mode. Um, if we use academic reference corpora, we notice exactly the same pattern. So the spoken academic corpus in the middle, which is only which only composes lectures, so monologic speech, that's the L, uh, produces higher mean frequency scores for content words. So if we look at the, uh, if we compare simple linear regression models that predict uh, mean frequency scores for content words, and we just use a single fixed effect for each one, we can see that the reference mode actually describes by far the most variance in uh, scores for content words. So the reference more mode actually accounts for 29% of the variance. The topic accounts for 6% of the variance in CW scores, in content word scores. The proficiency only accounts for 2% and the register uh, accounts for 0.17%. When we put together all these fixed effect in our um, mixed effect, uh, considering also the random effect of speakers, uh, we can see that the full model explains 74% of the variance and we're going to have a look at the um, estimates now. So we use this, the, in, the baseline values the written reference corpus, the general register, the L1 proficiency, and then one of the two topics, part-time job. And we can see 5.29 is the mean um, content, is the mean frequency score for content words when we have the intercept, so when we use all these baseline um, uh, variables. We can see an interaction, first of all, between the language mode and the register, which is statistically significant when we use the spoken uh, reference corpus. But what is even more interesting is what happens across proficiency levels. So we can see here that uh, the less proficient the learners, the, sh the smaller the mean frequency score of content words. So basically, low proficient learners use less frequent vocabulary. And this is something that we wouldn't normally expect. Let's have a look at the um, uh, scores predicted by our model. So here we can see that 
the patterns that we observed in the initial graphs are actually similar. So our model predicts exactly the same thing. With a spoken reference corpus in the right side of the graph, we have higher uh, mean frequency scores for content words across the different proficiency levels. So what does this mean? Well, it means that when we measure lexical sophistication uh, in, uh, in, a, in spoken production using a spoken reference corpus, we can see that the reference corpus matches well the language produced. And we can see that uh, learners basically, especially high, highly proficient learners, produce words that are more typical of the spoken mode. And for that reason, they, use, uh, they get higher frequency scores. If we look at the um, the role of the register, again, comparing the different reference corpora uh, and also the general or academic registers, we can see again that the predicted scores, uh, the scores predicted by our model are higher when a spoken general reference corpus is used. So just to remind you, the spoken general reference corpus is the spoken BNC 2014, which consists of everyday conversations informal language, which is um, interactive. But actually here we're, we're looking at spoken monologues. These learners are producing monologic speech. So what is happening here? And in the uh, academic reference corpus, we're actually um, considering just the lectures included in uh, in, Bo in uh, Bayes. So monologic speech. So uh, the language that the learners produce in these spoken monologues should be closer to the Bayes uh, corpus, reference corpus, rather than the BNC spoken 2014, which is actually made of conversations. So I'll just show you some examples. Here we have extracts from the corpus that show that these learners are taking part in a monologue, in a monologic task, but they're actually uh, talking on the phone. So these um, spoken productions are recorded on the phone and they're using um, informal language that is actually typical of interactional language. It looks as if they're addressing an, inter an imaginary interlocutor and they're using, so here we have the content words underlined and they're using very informal uh, adverbs in red, adjectives in blue and verbs in green. So these are all linguistic features that are more typical of the informal conversational spoken language represented in the spoken BNC 2014 rather than uh, the academic language represented in the base that we used. So this is why we got higher, well our model predicts higher mean frequency scores when we use the spoken BNC 2014 because the language is closer to the reference corpus. So let's see how we can summarize these results. Yeah, so briefly a summary so for um we look and think about some of the implications and um, what we see from uh, the models that um, Raphael has presented is that the content word scores, so these mean content word frequencies, are considerably more influenced by the mode and register of the reference corpus than by the speaker's proficiency level. That's obviously problematic if we're going to use these measures um, to estimate or to um, predict uh, learner proficiency. For the spoken monologues of the ICNEL, we find that the content words that the most advanced learners use are um, typical of the spoken mode and of the general register, which was in our case as very interactional, uh, friendly, mostly uh, conversations. Um, we saw that in the actual uh, text or extract that Rafaela presented. It's also a feature of the task itself because the way the task is presented is already in very informal language and, and um, may also trigger the participants to think of it as a imaginary interlocutor situation, even though it is a monologue in theory. Um, it's also the questions, the topics are about giving opinions, um, whereas the lectures are much more informative than they are argumentative. So again, we see some, some quite strong um, task effects here, which in future I might call the SpongeBob effect. I'm thinking about changing my terminology. <laughs> um, so we find that the more proficient the speakers, the more frequent um, the content words are. And this is not what we would expect if we uh, think back to the scale we had earlier on. Um, so this uh, research has some theoretical implications um, because we really need to um, 
rethink this construct of lexical sophistication um, and uh, we're in favor of adopting what Phil and others have suggested, um, looking more at register appropriateness. But this changes um, the direction of the scale um, because if we have low mean uh, frequency values, we have infrequent vocabulary and at the moment we're saying therefore sophisticated, therefore better and actually it might be therefore less typical and not so appropriate. Um, this obviously also has methodological implications. Um, as I mentioned, we're very interested in uh, replicability um, issues. Um, what does that mean in terms of building community, community, commu cumulative knowledge? Very difficult to pronounce. Um, because at the moment we've got studies that on the one hand say um, that these uh, CV scores are increased when a learner proficiency increases, in other cases they decrease and we have the intuition looking at the literature that some of these effects are probably entirely driven by the reference corpora. Um, so this really needs to be looked at carefully. Um, it may mean also that we need to think of some procedures to validate the kind of reference corpus that we use for particular studies. And here I think we may need to remember um, Phil's slide with all of the various aspects that play a role. So definitely task effects and uh, register and all of these other aspects, um, which brings the question as to is this possible? Is this feasible to, to really have a good, uh, a, a valid reference? Uh, for some of these measures and of course practical implications because these are measures that are currently used that are built into many existing tools um, uh, for language testing for um, other kinds of um, applied linguistics um, fields um, and so we here would recommend using a tool um, like Rafael's tool where you can actually um, you have control over the word list that you're using and that you have control over the reference corpus that you're using and you're very aware of which words are and are not included in the corpus because that's part of the output of the tool and so we don't have sort of petri dish effects or rather the NA effect that um, Phil also showed um, because this, this can really skew the results as well. So yes, uh, we look forward to your questions. If you want to find out more, especially about the uh, written essays, which we didn't have time to discuss, um, we have a preprint online and you can look at the curious effect of the reference corpus in the written essays as well. Great, thank you very much for that. Are there any questions? Comments? I have a question about the NA effect. Um, so it's really striking the way that the frequencies based on the spoken corpus are all higher. Now, I'm guessing if you search for a word that's in the learner corpus, and it's not in the reference corpus, it gets an NA. I bet you get m more NAs when you're using a spoken reference corpus because the spoken reference corpus is smaller. Is it possible that that's a reason for the mean frequencies being higher when you use spoken corpus? Because you it, it's only including words that are relatively high frequency because they're the ones that are in the spoken corpus and low frequency words are in the written corpus, so they don't get an NA. Um, I think it's certainly the reason why we have the biggest spread. I don't know if you noticed that as well. So the higher we also have the biggest spread. Um, that's definitely the reason why we have this huge, uh, huge spread. I'm not so sure about the difference though. Yes, we can, yeah. Well, something that comes to my mind is also linked to diversity. So in spoken language, lexical diversity is lower. So it is true that the spoken reference corpus that we use uh, is smaller than written reference corpus, but at the same time, the vocabulary that we produce in spoken language is characterized by smaller diversity scores. So we do have the output and we looked at that and uh, there is definitely some, uh, well, some of the, there are examples of words that gets a, a zero score when we use a spoken reference corpus, but um, I think it, it could be, this is something definitely to look into more, but I wouldn't say it's uh, probably one of the main effects. But At least not with this particular, it's just very limited in terms of the task and topics. Um, but I think it's very likely to happen in terms of a range of topics that you can't control that at all. And something perhaps to, uh, to do in the future, and something which was uh, suggested in another conference where we presented this, was to use perhaps the L1 subcorpus. So the language produced by L1 speakers in the ICNAL as a reference corpus. So, so that you get all the that. <laughs> Any other questions? Comments?
Yes, thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, I was wondering because I think if I remember correctly, it's mostly uh, lower level learners you have in the corpus, right? From A1, A2, to you don't have C1 or C2. So I'm just curious to what extent maybe this is a curvilinear effect with proficiency, uh, that with the uh, frequency, right? That you do want learners to use more frequent vocabulary up to a point, and then there's a point where, okay, if you really are academic, then you're using more infrequent vocabulary, right? So I think we probably see this curve with uh, with the word frequency specifically. So if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, and, and actually then I'll add something that has come <laughs> just to my mind. Yeah, this corpus, the Ignat corpus only includes low level uh, speakers, so A2 till uh, B2. But um, my main research was focused on the Trinity Lancaster corpus, which, which on the other hand includes upper intermediate level uh, learners and C, up to C2. And the pattern was the same. So the, the Trinity Lancaster corpus contains spoken production and the more advanced the learners, the more frequent the language they, that they were producing. And um, so when I interpreted that and I looked at the examples and I looked at the transcripts, I could see that the more proficient the, the learners were, the better they could grade their language depending on the interlocutor and depending on the register of the task. The task was informal conversation and they were talking in some of in two of the tasks. They were talking about a topic that they had chosen, so they were familiar with that topic. The assessor was not familiar, so they had to make it clear and accessible to a person not familiar with the topic. So they were using words which were more frequent, so they were more aware of the interlocutor's needs. And so I'm, I'm not sure whether there's anything else that we could add to say. That's a very good point. Uh, and, and as usual, all of these studies are limited by the corpus, you know, the corpus themselves. And it's a really good question what's happened between that gap, if we call it a gap between B2 and, and the L1. The other thing that we did notice when we looked at the data is some of this L1 data in the exam, I don't know if any of you worked with the exam before. I'm not so convinced those are L1 speakers. I can see some dots. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I was rather surprised uh, that way. But I don't think it's had an influence for this particular study, but I was wondering for other kinds of um, analysis, it's really worth looking at the data. And the other point that uh, I wanted to add was that so to kind of take into account the different size of the reference corpora, we use normalized frequency values, which is something that is not always the case, or at least it's not reported. But in any case, existing automatic tools output um, absolute frequency values for these type of lexical sophistication scores. We normalize it per thousand words to take it into account the size of the reference corpus. And this is something else we should, we should consider when we look at lexical sophistication scores, especially for comparability issues across studies. OK, great. Let's thank Raffaele Bottini and Ellen Paul. And welcome Agnieszka Lenko-Simanka, who will be presenting also on behalf of her colleagues, Peter Pezik, Michael Adamczyk. Sorry about the pronunciation, but I hope I got a lot of right. OK. I must admit I'm uh, very nervous presenting before such a sophisticated, knowledgeable uh, audience and uh, Professor Duran has stolen the best um, slot, but I still hope that the effects of cheesecake and wine, wine hold, uh, so be gentle. This is uh, very much work in progress. When I submitted the abstract, I hope that the study will be finished by now, but of course it had to be moved for various reasons to the back burden. Eh? But I'll be very interested in your comments and thoughts and um, uh, the topic is, uh, um, well, the, the role of uh, phraseology and uh, uh, and um, measures of uh, phraseological complexity in the assessment of L2 proficiency. And perhaps I want to start with some background. Back at the university, I'm, uh, many roles that I perform in my university, as we all do. Um, I'm the head of the um, uh, 
language proficiency exam for English and each uh, each uh, session exam session we have about uh, over 2000 students uh, participating in the exam uh, quite a few of them uh, fail and uh, this is when they come to me and complain and they want an explanation when they failed and usually they have no questions about multiple choice questions uh, or reading comprehension listening comprehension but they always want to know why they get that many points for the writing uh, and I find it always very frustrating that very often I can't really explain to them in a very tangible way and I ended up saying this is an error, this is an error, this is an error, this is an error, because this is something measurable. So this is something that, uh, that I'm afraid convinces them, uh, whereas I know that this is not really why they got a, a, a failing monk. So th th this is in the back of my research. I'm looking for the ways of assessment of uh, proficiency based on learners production, which will be uh, on the one hand um, objective, reliable, but at the same time uh, explainable to the students. Of course, at the moment, uh, assessment of L2 proficiency is done, uh, and I, I mean in writing, of course, I'm not talking about proficiency done by other uh, met uh, methods. Uh, it's either used by raters who use descriptive scales and who try to turn the, um, the qualitative description of what they read into a measurement into a number, which is a mark or, or, or a number of points. And of course, the, the, the challenges of this type of assessment are object, objectivity, uh, but also reliability. On the other hand, uh, increasingly we have uh, assessment done by, done by artificial intelligence, by the, these large language models, but the, the, the principal challenge of, 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 of these models, they, they are very reliable, they're very objective, except that we really don't know what they are doing. OK, <laughs> so they, they, they give a mark, they produce a mark, but it's very hard then to go back to the student and say, oh, OK, um, so uh, so we, we are looking for the golden mean, something that will be objective, fast, so automatic, but at the same uh, at the same time um, explainable. And I believe based on a model of language proficiency. And of course, the literature presents several models of language proficiency. The one that we uh, are all familiar with is uh, by uh, Lyle Bachmann, uh, seeing language comp uh, competence um, and proficiency consisting of several different components, grammatical, textual, and so on and so forth. But of course, there's a, a different model of la uh, language proficiency postulated by Hausen and uh, Kuiken, uh, where uh, proficiency is uh, equated with performance. But of course, we uh, we had um, in the plenary that this equation is not really a good equation and and then of course the performance can be described in terms of complexity accuracy and fluency so the the, the question that i'm asking in my uh, uh, after this <laughs> longish background is to what extent uh, measures of complexity can contribute to assessment of l2 proficiency and i'm particularly interested in phraseological complexity for various reasons of course one of the reasons is because this is the topic of this conference but also <laughs> but also because we i think nowadays the the focus of language teaching and uh, uh, and language description also moves to phraseology. We, 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 we have become increasingly, we are increasingly more and more aware of the role that phraseology plays, uh, plays in language production uh, and in proficiency. So of course, phraseology can be defined in a variety of ways. We have the linguistic feature approach, a more traditional uh, approach to defining what are different phraseological units, but we also have this distributional approach. Uh, it's either uh, uh, n-grams or statistical collocations, and this is what I will be focusing on in this, uh, as many other presentations on st statistical collocations. Uh, and of course, we've been in 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 this conference we have been. Uh, uh, discussing and, 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 and different measures of association of statistical collocations and uh, or perhaps we haven't been discussing them, but we've seen that many different measures have been used and I really want to refer to a nice overview pre um, uh, done by our organizers, Pina, and also thank you for organizing this conference, which uh, actually uh, sort of pulled together all these um, all these uh, measures of association and pointed out what aspect of association they actually best capture 
Um, so, uh, as we can see, uh, for example, the, the mirror frequency in reference to corpus talks more about diversity and repetition, whereas strength and uh, rarity um, okay, ex are expressed by MI score and so on and so forth. Of course, uh, in the last few years, there have been quite a lot of stu uh, studies that try to uh, sort of find a relationship between the measures of lexical uh, uh, of phraseological complexity on the one hand and the, um, either the differences between different levels uh, or uh, the, the, the rate of scores. Uh, the, the, the studies that I want to uh, mention are the studies by uh, Granger and Bestken who were probably among the first looking at uh, phraseological complexity and my scores and how they either discriminate between various levels or in the other study how they um, uh, how they relate to uh, the assessment by human raters. Uh, the study which was most inspirational and that's why I'm uh, quoting he was the study by Paco because I taken up a lot of methodological solutions from her. Uh, the study published in 2019 when she looked at how uh, EFL learners use of adjective modifiers, but also adverb modifiers and verb noun collocations. Um, discriminates between different proficiency lev levels uh, and she looked at relational collocation. She was probably one of the first researchers to look at professional uh, relational collocations. That is not just uh, collocations were not defined by the proximity, by, by, the, um, by, the, by the phrase structure. So the research questions that uh, are posed for my research is, is there a relationship between phraseological complexity of learner written production and their perceived, uh, perceived quality. And if we want to translate it into more <laughs> tangible terms, is uh, the same question. Uh, is there a relationship between various measures of collocation as association and scores attributed to learners essays by human raters? And I'm looking at holistic scores and analytic scores for vocabulary. So the data that I used in this study were 500 argumentative essays, uh, which was a selection of the uh, of essays from the certification exams. As I said, over 2000 students, I, uh, randomly, uh, a random selection of 500 argumentative essays. Um, um, and they were all written on the same topic. The topic is not really important here, but they were assessed holistically by 10 experienced ra uh, raters working in five tandems. So, so uh, each essay is um, assessed by two raters and then they agree on the final score. Um, but for, for the purposes of this project, they, the same essays were reassessed uh, again uh, with this, by the same raters, uh, but using an analytical scale. So a different score was given for vocabulary, a different score for uh, accuracy and uh, for content and organization. So these are the data that I actually collected uh, for, uh, for, um, uh, for the assessment. So we have holistic scores by rater one and two, but also analytical scores and the ones that I'll be using in my study are the holistic uh, scores given by two raters, not the, 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 great, the, the mark that they agreed on at the end, but uh, the, the ones that they uh, gave independently and also the scores for vocabulary in the analytic measurement. As for um, the, the, the measures of association, of course, we had to start with uh, text processing. The text was passed with spacey and we uh, looked at five types of relational collocations, uh, noun subject, uh, noun verb, uh, verb noun, uh, adject adjective noun and uh, adverbs with verbs and uh, adjectives. And we used five measures, five measures uh, of um, association uh, uh, frequency, mere frequency, but also MI, log dice, uh, delta P forward and backward. And the reference corpus was uh, the British National Corpus, which in our case, because it's written in English, seems to be a good reference. Uh, but also we introduced two additional um, measures, um, collocation originality. So to what extent uh, this collocation doesn't occur in other essays? So the learn, if the learner uses a, um, this collocation, does it occur frequently in other essays or not, and also collocational yield. That is, how, what is the number of collocations actually used by the students? Um, so these are my variable altogether. 
All right. Uh, number is in italics because uh, we didn't use number for uh, in some of the analysis. We have to go back to this idea. There, there were different discussions whether we need to use number and I'm afraid I can't explain them now. And uh, um, OK, so these are my results. So first of all, I know that the correlations were just the initial step. We, we looked at what are the correlations between on the one uh, hand uh, the, the scores and uh, the different measures of uh, association between the collocations and these are uh, uh, these are the results for all uh, all relations uh, so of course there is first of all <laughs> quite a high correlation between holistic scores for ho holistic scores and scores for vocabulary as we can see it's statistically st significant but also very uh, very high but there are no other correlations which is already the first indication that nothing is going on in the data which in, in, indeed sorry to pass, has been uh, confirmed in a regression uh, model uh, as uh, Am I in the right place? Yes, regression model. As you can see, uh, the only measure of association uh, or that um, that uh, was statistically significant was uh, in the model was learner frequency. But I want to draw your attention to the, the to the whole model. The, the whole model actually uh, explains. 0.12 percent of the variance so i was really disappointed with this first result uh, and then i'll talk about other disappointments as well because i mean this the, uh, this phraseological complexity doesn't seem to explain uh, uh, explain the scores uh, at all this the same for vocabulary scores where, where i hope that this explanation somehow will be higher it is higher but still it's it's not even one percent it's uh, one fifth of one percent it's uh, 0 0.2 so the, uh, this, the uh, all the measures of um, um associations between co uh, collocational associations uh, taken together do not explain the variance in 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 this uh, in the scores and also none of the measures is statistically st significant in the model um i also looked uh, we also looked separately for one type of collocations and uh, uh, by coincidence, there's also adjective and noun collocations, uh, but uh, not that I predicted that this will be the, <laughs> the focus of the uh, plenary, but somehow I, be, I believe that um, whereas uh, subject verb and verb object collocations are always obligatory in the sense that the sentence cannot be, exist without a noun, and a subject and a verb, or verb always needs an object, or the verbs that need an object need an object. So that it ha whereas adjectives are optional, in a sense, they introduce extra information, uh, which very often, or at least sometimes, can be omitted. So that's why I thought adjectival co 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 uh, collocations are perhaps more indicative of uh, phraseological complexity and uh, general language proficiency. So I actually focused something on adjective adjectival. Uh, how much time do I have? <laughs> Sorry, five minutes. Okay, adjectival uh, collocations. But I also manually uh, trimmed the color, uh, the the the, the color situations, getting rid of right petri dish, so so or fiction book or the twentieth century, which are not really fiction, and twentieth century century are not even uh, uh, proper adjectives. And here, of course, uh, when we look at color cor uh, color correlations. Um, of course, they are much more promising. So uh, there are uh, uh, correlations. That, uh, and there are a number of cor correlations between the scores and various measures of association. Uh, and uh, within the re uh, regression model, um, as we look at the holistic scores, quite a few of these measures are statistically significant. But again, the model itself explains very, very little variance in the in the final scores and of course I understand that the holistic score is given for a, a different number of uh, aspects of writing and uh, uh, I'm sorry uh, and um, and uh, phraseological complexity is just one of these aspects but still I mean it, it's hardly we hardly can say that uh, it, it, it seems to contribute to the final score uh, the same is true for vocabulary school uh, the, 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 uh, 
the prediction of vocabulary scores, so the, just the scores for vocabulary, um, only two uh, measures of association are statistically significant and the model has a very uh, low predictive power. And of course, the next step would be looking, uh, zooming in on particular essays and seeing what is happening there. So we have an example of a poor essay. Uh, uh, these are students at B2 level. So they're not six year old, seven year old stu students and they're of course auto learners. And we can see that the, the, uh, the this is a poor essay that actually got uh, very uh, low scores for vocabulary one and two. And as we can see in this essay, uh, there are only three ad uh, adjective noun collocations, boring book, difficult book and true life. Uh, so uh, indeed there are very few of collocations uh, and the scores for association are not very high, but here is the good essay. And again, I'm sorry, I'm moving too fast. And you can see good essay, which got very high scores for vocabulary, it uses a larger number of um, of um, adjectival noun collocations. But of course, many of them are not. I mean, they have high scores, but they this is again, we are going back to what was discussed in the plenary, uh, that they are not actually the collocations that uh, are welcome in, in, at that level, like spiritual sight, numerous responsibility, deep consideration, and uh, which may seem to be very unusual choices, but classical novel is purely a mistake because they, what the student actually meant was a classic novel. Right? not the classical now novel. So to coming up to my conclusions is uh, the study unfortunately has demonstrated no robust relationship between measures of phraseological complexity and essay scores. Uh, and well, what is the explanation and, and, and how we interpret the, these results? Well, maybe such a relationship doesn't exist in the, in the first place. Maybe I was too uh, over optimistic and this quest for uh, for the type of assessment that could be automatic on the one hand, but at least explainable or understandable to 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 at least me as a as a supervisor, what what has gone into this course? Maybe this quest is is futile. Maybe we will never could, um, arrive at this course. But another explanation is we still don't know how to capture uh, this uh, relay uh, this phraseological complexity. Maybe the measures that we are uh, calculating are all wrong and we need to some other ones. And of course we need another conference to discuss that. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was um, I, I meant to talk about way forward, but I, I think we can maybe we can get yes, to that in a question in the question. Any questions or comments? What do you think of the ways forward? Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. But, well, well, of course, so so and, and again, I, I, I don't know, this is pure coincidence, but again it goes back to, to, to the plenary session that it is the, the trimming of the data. Zooming in on the data, of course, is one way, at least in that project, uh, one thing to do. But uh, but another, uh, from the statistical point of view, perhaps uh, we will look looking at mean values, but maybe we should look at median values or above a certain threshold or below a certain threshold of values. We need to experiment, look closer, and that's why I'm saying that what seemed to be a pretty straightforward project <laughs> is. Once we look closer into the results, there are more questions than answers. So that's exactly it. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Thank you very much. That's really interesting stuff. Um, I was wondering with these uh, models that you presented and those um, low uh, predictive power, um, what the whether there's a possibility of collinearity between those measures because Sorry, of collinearity. So if, uh, because we have frequency and you've got MI and you've got log dice and they all somehow depend on frequency. And I'm wondering how that's going to affect. It was checked first and it was OK. Yes. OK. The yeah. Okay. I think it was below the threshold. Yes, this is my colleagues who respond mm -hmm. for that, so I can't give more details, but definitely was the initial step that we looked at. Great, thanks. Any more? Yes. Thank you, Nieska. Really interesting. I'm really interested in your 
measures, I think, or notions of originality and yield. Did you consider them? I think it's quite interesting. Can you say something more about that? This is actually when we started with my colleagues. Uh, well, analyzing the data, we we look at the uh, at at um, yes, close, and we saw that on on the one hand we have essays for which there are many many collocations, like the one the collocational yield is actually expressed in the table right at the end. You see, uh, like this is a good essay, and, it, uh, the, and and this student has produced many adjectival noun and generally more many collocations. So there are many collocations in the text, whereas, um, um, of course, these these measures haven't been uh, normalized. The, the, these uh, frequencies of these collocations, but. Because the essays are written in the exam format, uh, very controlled uh, conditions, so there is a time limit, there is an expectation of a certain length, so there is not a large uh, variability in, in the text length. But this is a poor essay, so there are very few collocations. Of course, these are only adjectival collocations, there are more of noun, uh, verb noun collocations, but generally students produced fewer collocations in the text. So that's the measure of the fact how many collocations we can actually spot in, in the, uh, that's the yield. And originality is to what extent the student uh, comes up with a nice collocation, which because like some collocations, uh, well, on the other hand, but of course this is not a collocation, but there are some standard that we always see that this teddy bear collocations in all the textbooks. So what extent students go beyond these teddy bear collocations and, and use something which is um, appropriate but unexpected. Yeah. Very much, Agnieszka. <laughs> now let's welcome Nathan Van der Beer and Clara Arbison, who will be presenting also on their colleague Fanny Forsen Lunden. OK, and the title of the presentation is Investigating the Construct Validity of Phraseological Complexity Measures Through a Cross-Methodological Comparison. The floor is yours. So uh, right before the break, so hopefully uh, we'll give you lots of food for thought for the, the coffee break. Uh, we have more questions, I think, than answers, so I think that's always uh, interesting. Um, yeah, and uh, so presenting the two of us on behalf of uh, Fanny, who also can't be here, although she'd really love to, I'm sure. Um, if you're interested, the slides are also available if you follow that link, and the link will be at the bottom of the slides. If you'd like more details for stuff, we can't go uh, into too much detail for. Um, so very quickly, the background, I don't think I need to say uh, how we're defining phraseological complexity. I think it's very uh, known to everyone here. Uh, but just so it's clear, this is um, how we've conceptualized it in terms of diversity and sophistication. Um, and then uh, Greece's definition of um, a phraseological unit. Um, and so I think we all know uh, that we've seen empirical evidence. Um, it's not a completely a clear story, but there are there is evidence that phraseological complexity seems to increase with proficiency. Uh, and if you look uh, longitudinally, although there are fewer studies, it does seem to increase over time. Um, but I think we also all know that mostly the research has been focused on English, um, with some exceptions on Italian and Dutch, um, French, um, but still the majority of cases uh, we've been looking at L2 English, um, and we've been mostly focused on a subset of uh, specific structures. And, oh, I'm not sure what's going on here. OK, well, uh, so mostly focus on adjectival modifiers, adverbial modifiers and direct objects. And why? Uh, well, these are structures that tend to be difficult for learners, so it's a good place to start. Um, but when we talk about French specifically, which has been my focus, we may be missing out on some very important structures. Um, so if you look at things like uh, answered angrily, so an adverbial modifier in English, uh, how would that be expressed typically in French? It would be répondu avec colère. Um, so answered with anger, so the use of a prepositional phrase here. Um, so if we're just focused on these 
three types of units, we're probably missing a lot of um, phraseological complexity in our learner text if we're looking at French or other languages, right? Um, so the question is, what are we missing? Um, and are we really covering the, the construct of phraseological complexity if we're only looking at very specific structures? Um, so that's kind of the seed that inspired this study is to investigate the content validity of phraseological complexity measures. And how can you do that? Uh, well, um, Drost proposes two ways. Uh, so asking a number of questions about the instrument or the test. And the second one is asking the opinion of expert judges in the field. Um, so this kind of sparked my interest. Uh, if we would ask experts in French phraseology, what would they say are the units that we need to investigate? Um, so in other words, yeah, what do units, what units do experts in L2 French phraseology consider the most important, right? If you would give them a text and ask them, highlight the most phraseological or the most important phraseological units, which units would they highlight? Um, and luckily, um, there's been a study where this has already been done. So I'll turn it over to my colleague, Clara. Right. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, the refer to expert is not here today, but I'll do my best. So in 2010, <laughs> Post by and Bachman conducted a study and they sought to investigate what linguistic features could discriminate between the separate levels. One of the linguistic measures of the study was lexical formulaic sequences. And we will focus on that in this particular context. The participants of the study were 42 L1 speaking Swedish learners of French and their proficiency level was rated at the A1 to the C2 level as determined by a DLUNG placement te test. Participants performed two written tasks, one that was the same for all levels and one that was specific to each level of the CEPHRA scale. Based on these learner texts, they manually extracted lexical formulaic sequences, and these were defined as combinations of at least two words favored by native speakers in preference to an alternative combination, which could have been equivalent had there been no conventionalization. And as a tool in their identification procedure, they used the restricted exchangeability criterion, which stipulates that for a sequence to be considered conventional or formulaic, the exchange of one word for an equivalent word must lead to a change of meaning or loss of idiomaticity. I will give you a few examples, but first I will just say that they did find that the use of formulaic sequences increased uh, across the proficiency levels and that there was a statistically significant difference between the A2, the B2 and the C2 level. And here are a few examples of lexical formulaic sequences. And as we can see, they can be subcategorized as clausal or phrasal. And the clausal ones typically include both a subject and a finite verb and or are expressions with a pragmatic connotation, such as je vous en prie, c'est pas grave, mais trop boulot, boudou. And we have the phrasal sequences, such as agréablement surpris, faire du sport, poser une question. And as we see, the structure of the phrasal sequences is similar to the ones that are typically targeted in the study of phraseological complexity. Another study relevant in this context is the one by Irman et al. from 2013. The authors compared two methods to identify multi-word sequences in uh, uh, corpus. They compared the automatic extraction of lexical bundles and the manual uh, identification of multi-word sequences, which they called the comprehensive method. And the automatic extraction focused on three word bundles. And for a bundle to be included, it had to be used in at least two separate texts. Uh, the multi-word sequences were double-checked against a dictionary and a reference corpus. Participants were Swedish L1 learners of English and Spanish, and there was also control corpus uh, with L1 speakers of English and Spanish. It was an oral task which consisted in a retelling of modern times film clip. 
The analysis yielded an overlap of 20%. Uh, so this indicates that there is a certain overlap, but this is far from perfect. Yeah, so this inspired us also to show that there yeah, is an overlap there, but what is the automatic method missing? Um, it was also interesting that this was done on the basis of the learner text themselves. So as long as it occurred twice in the learner text, it was a phraseological unit or a lexical bundle, right? Without any recourse to a reference corpus, right? So the learners could be using very phraseological units, but if they use it once, they don't get any benefit for it. Um, so that brings us to the current study. So our research questions are the following. To what extent do operationalizations of phraseological complexity uh, overlap with manually identified lexical formulaic sequences? Why are we interested in that? Uh, well, in other words, uh, what is the, yeah, the overlap between these two methods? What are we missing maybe when we're looking at phraseological complexity in the way that we normally do it with direct objects, adverbial modifiers, and uh, adjectival modifiers? What other structures are out there? We're also interested in this idea of sophistication, right? So sophistication is very hard to uh, define and to operationalize. We've talked about it as appropriateness or maybe genre specificness or use of technical terms, right? And I'm interested in how do we circumscribe this idea of sophistication? And is it so maybe that the higher sophisticated units are more likely to be identified uh, using the manual method? So this would show that sophistication is somehow related to conventionalization. OK, so the methodology, um, we first uh, double annotated the original text from Forsberg and uh, Barton in 2010. Um, it's been a while, so we wanted to make sure that this um, identification method was reliable. Uh, after that, we had an agreed upon list of lexical formulaic sequences, which we then grammatically uh, categorized. Um, so according to whether they're clausal or phrasal and then specific phrasal structures within that. Um, for the automatic method, we first spell it, corrected all of the texts, uh, then pre-processing, cleaning, extracted all direct objects, adjectival modifiers, and adverbial modifiers from the corpus uh, using Spacey. Uh, we're going to focus just on direct objects and adjectival modifiers today. Um, and then based on the uh, uh, French Cow 16 reference corpus, apply a CIDA PMI score to each of those units. Uh, so a quick note about the inter-rater reliability. Um, uh, yes, very quickly. It was very low. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we believe that it was uh, mainly due to uh, fatigue and lack of attention rather than disagreement, uh, but it's clear that it is low. Uh, and for the syntactic structures, a little bit higher. Um, so just a quick note as a, a, a clarification there. Um, so the results, so first looking at the typology of the manually extracted units. Uh, I have a few slides here, but I won't go into so much detail. If you are interested, please just check them out online for yourself. Um, so more phrasal structures than clausal structures. Um, if we look at types of clauses, we have more simple than complex clauses. Uh, but where we see the most, um, yeah, most of the structures that were manually identified uh, were phrasal units, especially verb headed units and noun headed units, um, along with uh, preposition, uh, prepositional phrases there. Um, and what I think is very interesting is if you look at 80% uh, of the manually identified types and tokens, um, the things that we're looking at generally tend to um, make up quite a large percentage of, uh, of these structures. So direct objects, tribal modifiers, adverbial modifiers. Um, but if you would add just a few different structures, you can get quite a lot more coverage. Uh, and especially what we see is missing are prepositional phrases. So whether those are attached to a noun or a verb or prepositional phrases on their own. Um, so including more of these prepositional phrases would probably be uh, a good idea, in, at least in terms of French um, studies of phraseological complexity. Um, and I won't go into too much detail here. Uh, this is very preliminary. Oh, I'm not sure. Uh -oh. <laughs> Help. <laughs> Let me just touch. <laughs> okay, well, we still have this screen, right? Um, so
OK, well, we'll just ignore this one. Uh, so we can see especially these pre prepositional phrases seem to be important at the higher proficiency levels. This is again very preliminary. Um, but in terms of French, probably this would be evidence to suggest that maybe we need to uh, spend some more attention on these specific units. Um, so the second research question about identification uh, and PMI. Um, so first looking at adjectival modifiers, uh, we found that in a model we're predicting uh, the PMI on the basis of uh, predicting, sorry, whether they are manually identified on the basis of the PMI. Uh, we found that there is a significant effect of the PMI, but it explains very low amount of variance. <laughs> there we go. Um, so higher PMI units tend also to be um, more likely to be manually identified. Uh, same thing for direct objects, but um, that model explains uh, a lot less of the variance. So there's other things going on in the identification of these units than just the PMI, but PMI does seem to be playing a partial role there. Um, so this is, I think, what I'd like to focus on. We have lots of questions for you, uh, so I'm very, look, you're very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Um, so first, what structures are we currently missing? Um, we saw that direct objects, adjectival modifiers, and adverbial modifiers account for some of the manually identified types of tokens. Um, and if we're thinking about where we want to invest our energy, at least for French, it's definitely looking at these prepositional phrases. Um, if we would want to increase the coverage to almost 80%, uh, these units would be a good place to start. Um, we see that there is a link between PMI and sophistication, question mark. Um, so a small but significant relationship between PMI and whether these units were identified, and these were identified on the basis of conventionalization. But that being said, many high PMI units were not identified, and many low PMI units were identified, right? So what does this tell us about the usefulness of PMI as a measure of sophistication when it comes to French? Um, are we missing out on sophisticated units when we're just using an association measure like um, like PMI? And maybe there is something special about French, right? So there's this idea that French doesn't have an academic vocabulary because we use the same words in French, academic French, as in uh, spoken French, just that, um, yeah, we use them in, di in different ways, right? And that's different than English, which tends to have an academic vocabulary. Um, so especially when you look at these delexicalized verbs. Um, so we have collocations with avoir and faire, um, maybe more so than we would have in, um, yeah, in English. Um, and then, yeah, coming back to this idea of what is sophistication. Uh, so um, Magali's definition relies on uh, Reed's uh, definition of sophistication for um, Lexis, right? So we have things like technical terms, uh, uncommon combinations, right? So then the question is, right, sophistication seems to be this multidimensional construct. Um, is it partially made up of conventionalization? Well, the results here would seem to say slightly yes. Right, but that's kind of the opposite of uncommon definitions, right? Um, so how much is it uncommonness or rarity? How much is it appropriateness or use of technical terms? But I think we really need to be clear with what we're trying to target when we're targeting sophistication. Um, and so along these lines, a recent study or a forthcoming study um, by um, uh, Magali and Hubert are looking at um, these PMI-based measures versus list-based academic uh, collocation measures. And there are some medium correlations there, um, but there's more going on with sophistication than just this, just PMI. Uh, so a few limitations. So of course, we mentioned the low inter-rater reliability for the manual annotation. Um, we didn't take the order of the units uh, into account, so we just used dependency-based measures. But in French, the order can be quite important uh, and even lead to a change in meaning. Um, and also the frequency in a single learner corpus does not necessarily mean that these are the most useful or interesting units to focus on, of course. Um, so verb plus just a single preposition are quite frequent and they increase over proficiency levels, but are these really indicators of phraseological sophistication? That's the question. Um, and the effect of the reference corpus as well. Um, the thing is with French, we don't have that many yeah, options of what we can use as a reference corpus. So in the future, hopefully, uh, if we get um, some millions of euros of funding, we can build better reference corpora for French. 
Uh, so we'll leave it with some questions for you. So how can we better circumscribe this construct of phraseological sophistication? What kinds of formulaic language maybe are we missing out when measuring phraseological complexity in the way that we normally do it? And how can we improve our phraseological complexity measures? Keeping in mind that these measures may work differently in different languages and how much do we need to keep that into account when we're looking at Italian or French or uh, German or Dutch, whatever the language may be. Can we just copy wholesale what's worked in English uh, when we're looking at other L2s? So we'll leave it there and very curious to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much. Sorry about the screen, <laughs> but we had to. Uh, any comments or questions? I might have one curiosity about the low interreader uh, agreement rate. Um, you went over it uh, quite quickly. Uh, you mentioned that you, your explanation was something to do with um, um, tiredness. Uh, what made you think this? After having made up our separate lists, uh, we. Am I supposed to use this or? Uh, yeah, yeah. No. OK, uh, we compared our lists and discussed the occurrences that only one of us had identified, and it turned out to be sequences that the other one tended to agreed, uh, tended to agree on should be included uh, as a conventional sequence. So one of us had simply missed identifying it, and hence uh, the explanation that we simply just missed occurrences in the texts. So not a very reliable method, but it was our conclusion. Great, thanks. Yes? A, a question related to your answer. Um, so you were the, the raters? Yeah, yeah. Essentially, the question is who were the raters? <laughs> Are the separator? Oh, or you mean for identifying the sequences in the learner texts? Yes. Yeah. yeah so. Okay. That was me and our colleague. Because um, I'm just wondering, um, could it have been a better idea not to use the actual researcher, but use a a um, um, knowledgeable but naive to the purpose of your experiment um, rater or raters? Hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm just to start off with the list that was already used in the 2010 mm -hmm. list. Mm -hmm. uh, so our basis of working was that list. And then mm -hmm. because in the original study, there hadn't been a double annotation. So that's why I recommend and we wanted to check. Yeah, how reliable was that list to begin with? Mm -hmm. uh, and that became yeah, kind of a, a way to question how reliable is this manual identification mm -hmm. method? But I think both, yeah, when you're looking top down or bottom up, both approaches have benefits and disadvantages, mm -hmm. right? On the one hand, you're open to identifying all of these different elements that make up a holistic idea of phraseological complexity, mm -hmm. right? But if you're, yeah, forced to always look at every single adjectival modifier and every possible combination, you're going to have some lack of consistency. Mm -hmm. So I think it's not necessarily problematic that there's this low level of interval reliability, but it just shows, right, how intangible phraseolo phraseology actually is, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. just because we have a higher yeah, reliability with the automatic method. I think the problem is there we're missing the validity, right? Whereas with the, the manual method, you know that, yeah, these are units that somehow speak to you as an expert in phraseology, mm -hmm. right? So this interplay between reliability and validity is, I mm -hmm. think, something that we need to explore a bit more in phraseological complexity research. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Just a very quick one. Thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting. Um, you said that still, like for French, for example, the question is still up. But, um, in my view, is the question not up for English anymore? Sure, yeah. I just happen to focus on French, but uh, yeah. The question, yeah, for English, why have we only focused on these three units? I saw in some presentation there's been an expansion there. 
right? Um, I think we're still stuck on collocations and, and for the most part, two words, sequences, right? But there's so much more going on in, in terms of phraseology, right? Especially when it comes to diversity, right? We're saying diversity and then we're measuring in terms of type token ratios of adjectival modifiers, right? But what is diversity in a learner text? Probably it's a diversity of different kinds of formulaic language or phraseological language, right? So definitely a lot more work to explore in English, I'm sure, as well. Do you think that the PMI question is settled? Uh, definitely not. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, my two cents are, I think that PMI is a measure of exclusivity, right? And exclusivity is a part of sophistication, but so is conventionalization. And we need to figure out, yeah, what are we trying to get at? Because I think sophistication in a lexical context is very different than sophistication in a phraseological context, and we still are not sure what we're measuring there. Uh, Thanks, Philip. So I, maybe uh, Gabriela will have some more to say on that. <laughs> we have time for one quick question, if there is one. If not, we can thank our speakers and go to the coffee break. OK, so there's a coffee break just downstairs and I might just ask. Arianna and Andrea to step up so these slides can be uploaded. So welcome to our fourth session and final session of the day. This is going to be an online or a hybrid uh, session, so I'm going to actually warn the presenters uh, when 10, 5 and 1 minute is left. Um, our first presenter is Davide Mastrantonio. Davide, I leave you the floor and you can share your slides. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm very sad I couldn't be physically there in Perugia and I say thank you so much to the organizers for, for allowing me to give this presentation online. As for the topic of my presentation, my main research concern is the so-called Italiano Accademico or Italian Academic Register. <clears throat> In this respect, this very week is going to start a two-year project funded by the Ministry of University and Research by European funds, which is devoted to the inquiry of academic lexicotextual structures and to the realization of an open access academic dictionary. The project is led by, you can see the title here in the slide, Dizionario dell'Italiano Accademico, Forme Funzioni Testuali. The project is led by University of Venezia, together with Universities of Milano and Universities for Foreign Years of Siena. When I saw uh, the call of this Congress, I thought uh, it could be quite interesting exploring the issue of academic register with the help of the notions of phraseology first, and figurative uh, speech metaphors secondly. Unfortunately, I can deliver very little of what I have promised. I will devote the first part to the discussion of the notion of Italiano Accademico, and then I will present just a few examples uh, collected, which um, I think might show that phraseological point of view is a very promising one. I will keep the theoretical frame uh, at the minimum on purpose, uh, and I am not addressing nor acquisition, acquisitional nor didactic issues, since I think that uh, systematic exploration of the academic register and academic functions comes first. Um, Italiano Accademico is an ambiguous label based on uh, contextual and uh, external parameters. It can be defined as the totality of texts or discourse practices <clears throat> including, of course, oral texts produced within the academic context or <clears throat> environment. We might think of a university handbook uh, as a <clears throat> clear example, <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> but also of office hour and even less, um, <clears throat> and even less formal conversation in front of a vending machine or during a break. I'm sorry. <clears throat> On the other side, <coughs> based 
on linguistic and internal parameters, academic Italian can be understood as the set of linguistic expressions displaying uh, the following properties, um, like uh, middle former register um, expressions, exp uh, field independent uh, expressions, the mainly denotative expressions or used in a denotative context and for denotative purposes, and expressions involved in discourse operations like making generalizations and abstractions. How uh, this is uh, actually, we will look at this second perspective in particular. Uh, how can academic Italian be represented and, and how was it started so far? Note uh, that I'm restricting my perspective to the Italian studies, so not taking into account the stemming tradition based on English for academic purposes. <clears throat> Their wait lists are the first academic object made available by scholars, by Italian scholars. Here we see example, samples from the alphabetic list of Silvana Ferreri, made available in 2005, and <clears throat> Stefania Spina. We, can, we, we need to, to, to notice that Stefania Spina also made available a list of collocations, as you can see here, for instance, uh, the second line of Frontale Problema, which is facing a problem, Frontale Tema, addressing a topic, and so forth. <clears throat> uh, as a second step, we might, we might call it so. Daniele Duano in 2019 um, made available a list of functions as well. You, here you can see concluding and resuming, concludendo and conclusione in sintesi, uh, or giving examples, emblematico, esemplare, <coughs> explicativo. <clears throat> uh, one need to, to note that this functions forms list, the Duano's functions forms list, was not based on a corpus nor on a textual studies study, but on, on the linguistic and textual competence of the scholar. The first step to which the project, um, which I'm leading now, uh, is partly devoted, is trying to obtain a critical forms functions interface, interface based on textual study. Uh, what is important in this respect and what um, probably modifies the very notion of academic Italian, as we are about to see, is that the categorization of forms, functions, interface, which is the first step, needs to be compared uh, or to be realized, taking, in, taking, taking into account the comparison with ordinary non-academic communication or discourse. Let me give you an example of this. I have chosen uh, uh, logical relation of adjunta, which might be understood as addition, uh, meaning the, the pragmatic act of uttering propositions or just signaling processes <clears throat> which are put one next to each other, belonging to the same logical dimension, showing no hierarchy. This relation can be schematized as we see in pink. So there is a first proposition, then there is a logical connective, <clears throat> and a second proposition. Uh, let me briefly give, read those examples and trying to translate. L'esposizione gli piace provoca a suefazione alla sostanza. So using opioids uh, makes people addicted e quindi suscettibilità alla sindrome della stenza. Gli piace possono inoltre, opioids can furthermore uh, provoke, pro, pro, con le probabilità indurre una condizione di tossicodipendenza, provoca a, a hard um, um, a drug addiction. Gli effetti della cocaina non si limitano alla depressione, ma provocano anche problemi fisici. So, cocaine's effects are not restricted to depression, but they provoke also uh, physical damages, uh, important physical damages. And then, uh, so in this case, we, we don't see uh, phraseology so far. Uh, limita la l'epilessia, epilepsy limita la vita dei pazienti perché agli aspetti sanitari si associa un forte pregiudizio. To, to medical aspects is connected a uh, strong uh, social prejudice. And last example, uh, le donne diventano tossicodipendenti più tardi degli uomini, 
ma poi consumano quantità, maggi mh, consumano quantità maggiori di droga, sottinteso, sono più resti a chiedere aiuto e resistono agli interventi di recupero, faticando di più per uscire dal tunnel. Come se non bastasse, la società è meno disposta a perdonare una tossicodipendenza alle donne. Quindi, women become uh, drug addicted at older age uh, rather than men. On top of that, come se non bastasse, la società è meno disposta, la society is not open to forgiving women uh, less uh, rather than men. So, those examples uh, contain many differences. But our attention is now drained by registered features. So all the expressions that we see in the highlighted in yellow uh, perform the same discourse function, which is aggiunta. But they can be ordered uh, by register, meaning that si as associarsi uh, occupies the, the top. So it's a high register form. Uh, inoltre, uh, non solo ma, are neutral forms, so they can be used in academic register. And in the end, we find come se non bastasse, which is, um, which occupies the informal ordinary uh, communication register. Um, if we keep this in mind, so the persistence of the same, the identity of the same function and the diversity of the um, ways it can be coded depending on the register, we can reshape the definition of academic register, probably, meaning middle high register coding, middle high register coding, way of coding of transversal functions that can be found already in ordinary communication speech, as is the case of come se non bastasse. This means that a major concern of this field of study, in my opinion, including the applied and didactic implications now left aside, is inquiring the discourse functions and the set of expressions, not just the formal academic ones, but also the informal ordinary ones. Let's now come to phraseology and to uh, figurative speech. 10 minutes, David. Yeah, thank you, perfect. When I was writing this presentation, I had at hand uh, this book that you see in the slide, um, which is about history of Italian language and particularly the contribution of Dante to nowadays uh, Italian. It must be highlighted that this is not a <clears throat> scientific monograph, rather a popular work. We call it divulgazione, so popular vulgarizing work. This means uh, that in some cases we are not sure if we are talking of academic expressions or ordinary communication expressions until we check uh, these expressions in a larger number of texts. Let's have a look at some examples. In example one, uh, we have multi-word expression sull'altro petto della bilancia. I briefly read the text. Nel terzo capitolo siamo soffermati su alcune parole comuni nell'italiano di oggi che non troviamo nella commedia. Da notaio ad abbastanza o nemmeno. Ma sull'altro piatto della bilancia vanno collocate parole a cui Dante per la prima volta dà cittadinanza. Uh, so on the one side words, um, uh, nowadays words which are absent in that Dante's time, but on, on sull'altro piatto della bilancia words which are already present in Dante's work. We might translate it roughly sull'altro piatto della bilancia as on the other end of the scale, the discourse functions, the discourse functions simultaneously performed by this one expression are roughly topic, progression and contrast, meaning we have talked about this and now we talk about that. And new content, so modern Italian words absent, absent in that is work, is in a logical relation of contrast or opposition in regard to the previous content, modern Italian words already present in Dante's work. Let me give you a second example. Allargando il quadro, oltre i latinismi, si può percorrere la stessa strada. <clears throat> so, um, I, I, I wouldn't be sure how to translate in a proper English allargando il quadro, ma it literally it means to broad, broadening the picture. Uh, of course, it can be, it resembles the, the, the expression looking at a bigger picture and, and, and things like that. 
Um, in this case, we have a collocation, although a not strict one. Instead of allargare il quadro, we might also say ampliare il quadro, for instance, and a figurative component, uh, as you can also see by the image. Uh, the functions performed by this, uh, by the, the highlighted uh, expression is uh, generalizing, so uh, from a more particular topic from, from to a more generic one, and as well topic progression. I give you a third example, and then I can probably go to conclusions. Uh, come si sarà notato, La parte del leone nella formazione delle parole la fanno i verbi parasintetici. Uh, as the reader might have noticed, um, within the field of word formation, this object, verbi parasintetici, uh, take the lion's share, fanno la parte del leone. Mm? We have this expression, fare la parte del leone, scattered in different places of the sentence, which means literally take the lion's share. Again, we have a phraseological unit with the metaphorical and non-componential meaning, which is used in, in, this, in this case for the sake of for the sake of arranging data into a hierarchy and highlighting the major role played by some of them. Uh, so when a certain phenomenon is considered very considered very important. So I go to some very, very provisional conclusions. I skip this one. This example. So since my inquiry so far was very narrow scoped, we cannot say I cannot say much on the register of these expressions if they belong belong to academic register or ordinary communication. What is important is that, that they perform functions that uh, are present uh, as well as as well in, in, in ordinary communication as in as in academic um, academic register. So in this case, uh, I have also noticed that um, we are we are treating so the examples are, are taken by a, a popular. Per, a, um, we might think that this kind of high presence of figurative speech might be uh, linked to the popular purpose of the book. Um, but I say probably because I don't know. Uh, no, we can no. So we don't. We cannot say actually if we are into academic register or ordinary one. Uh, nor we can say if these expressions are used only in a certain field and only by a certain scholar or certain scholars, or to what extent they are broadly uh, used also in other fields and by other scholars. And of course, we can't say that until we check a, a sufficiently large number of texts. What we can say, uh, on the other hand, is that the observed examples share, um, first of all, uh, this feature, they help structuring the knowledge and the text. Secondly, they do not refer to the field of the text, which is in this case, uh, history of Italian language. And last, they are made up by phraseological units and have a figurative meaning. As said, and concluding, these are but a few examples and cannot so far lead to generalizations, but they show on the one side that a phraseological approach appear a very promising one in order to better understand the nature of academic register and academic functions. On the other side, Phraseological and figurative elements needs to be put in a functional frame, meaning studied and in a second time taught as well, as means of structuring the text, texts and the knowledge. In this respect, we have seen functions like signaling a top topic progression or coding a logical contrast. So I think I'm finished. I thank you so much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Davide. Now it's time for question. Anyone?
Well, David, I'm going to have one question for you. Um, at the beginning, you you mentioned that you were you would not talk about uh, applications into teaching for this. But if you if you had to uh, think about a possible application of of your uh, findings in teaching, how would that be? How would yeah. that probably start, for example? Yeah, thank you for the for the for the question. Uh, when one one possible application I do have in mind, since the project, uh, the the print project which is about to start is devoted to this dictionary, which is concerned with uh, words, set of words specifically uh, considered in their academic functions, which cannot be easily found in dictionaries or which are somehow hidden among other meanings. Uh, so one application uh, is going to be uh, grouping those uh, phraseologic items um, by functions so that I, I think of L1, first of all I think of L1 Cont, environment uh, L1 um, uh, learning context in which uh, a teacher might explain while teaching how to write an academic text might explain that at some point you need to make examples for instance or you need you need you need to give examples or you need to 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 to, to give the conclusions and you start by uh, giving an idea of what the function is and then you give the equivalent of the forms that can be it can be used to perform that function. So I, I see this very first kind of application. So having a, a dictionary which can be um, which can be um, looked up looked up by by not just by words or by expressions, but also by functions. So let me now uh, see how I can conclude my reasoning. And then I open these, and I can see different uh, different expressions uh, related to different uh, registers, different different context with examples so that one can uh, the learner can uh, try to, to 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 take some examples and to and to and to use it thank you i don't hear you but thank you so much Okay, let's move on to our next presenter, Daria Karlamova. Hello, Daria, can you hear us? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, safe and sound, and we can see you as well. So you can share yeah. your slides. Now I will share these slides. Now you should be able to see them. All right, the floor is yours. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. So, um, good afternoon to all the participants of the today's meeting, in which I am greatly honored to take part. I would like to thank the organizing committee for the chance to uh, make my presentation online. Uh, my name is Karla Mavadaria, and today I would like to present uh, you my research on the topic of discovering the potential of automated uh, physiological interference error detection, transformer-based approach. So, um, in this ongoing research, uh, I have tried to implement a transformer-based uh, neural network to automatically detect the mistakes in student essays written in English that are motivated by the first language interference. Uh, here you can see the outline of the presentation. And let me start with the background to the research. Uh, at the core of, of my research, obviously, lies a notion of formulaic language. There are many definitions for it, and one of them is given in the slide. Um, so. Um, why is it so important? Uh, according to some estimations, uh, formulaic language makes up around 50% of all language or even more, depending on the definition, because a lot of expressions can uh, be considered from formulaic uh, if we just uh, take different paradigms. Um, thus, it follows that all L2 learners have to master um, the uh, formulaic language uh, in order to uh, advance in the language acquisition process. 
the problem is that every learner uh, already has a vast inventory of fixed expressions uh, from their native language. Mm, and so the these expressions, uh, as you uh, usually start to interfere with each other. Uh, as it is known, uh, the idioms from uh, L1 and L2 can either be congruent, uh, that means uh, when the form and the meaning are similar in both languages, or incongruent, when, the with, when this condition is not met. Uh, usually it is not met, uh, and thus um, the presence of congruent idioms can um, facilitate the learning process, while the uh, the incongruent ones uh, cause uh, learners to be confused and uh, accidentally uh, produce uh, wrong, um, wrong patterns. And um, basically, um, in a one way or another, transfer their um, the idioms from their uh, native language to um, uh, productions in second language. So. Um, these kinds of uh, mistakes are uh, generally referred to as uh, language interference. Uh, that's it. And so this uh, area is uh, often addressed uh, in great detail by uh, second language teachers. And that takes us to the next question. Uh, if we have uh, second language teachers, uh, why do we need a neural network at all? Uh, the first reason is uh, that due to globalization and ever-increasing intercultural and international cooperation, uh, the number of second language learners grows by the hour. And so uh, second language teachers uh, nowadays face a huge workload and uh, I believe they, that they would uh, greatly benefit from a neural-based tool that could facilitate uh, the process of uh, reviewing uh, works of uh, the students. Uh, as for the students, uh, there are a lot of um, those who prefer uh, self-education and for them, uh, the opportunities of getting adequate corrective feedback uh, on their written productions are highly limited. Thus, they would benefit from such a tool as well. So, uh, this, so the primary goal of this research is um, uh, to make the first steps to creating such a tool. Um, another goal uh, that the uh, present research pursues is testing uh, if the state-of-the-art neural networks uh, are able to detect uh, L1 motivated mistakes uh, specifically. Uh, undoubtedly, nowadays, uh, they can replace uh, human annotators. However, uh, as this particular type of mistakes is uh, especially tricky, um, there is some doubt as to, um, as to uh, how automated annotation can uh, com uh, can be compared to um, the accuracy of a human annotator. Uh, I would also like to briefly mention some limitations of the research. Uh, first of all, my main goal to, uh, was to learn to identify uh, such mistakes, not correct them. Um, not because I don't want to correct them, uh, because uh, but because the task of correction would require to deploy a generative language model. Uh, training such models uh, require resources that I, as university students, do not have at the moment. And secondly, the primary goal of uh, this part of the research was to prove a concept. Uh, so uh, the results provided in this presentation are to a degree preliminary. Uh, and the research is still continuing. Uh, the data sets and uh, all the parameters that I will talk about later are likely to increase. Uh, so. My main goal to, was to train a neural network that would be able to locate and classify the uh, L1 uh, motivated mistakes in a text submitted by students in their English examination. Uh, in order to accomplish that, I firstly needed to uh, develop some uh, theoretical background. Uh, my research was aimed at the uh, first language um, Russian speakers learning English as their second language. Uh, first of all, I needed to understand uh, what types of um, L1 motivated mistakes um, generally occur in uh, the students' essays. Uh, to do so, I turned to the REALEC corpus uh, developed in the School of Linguistics at the HSC University. Uh, the corpus comprises essays written by uh, second year uh, HSC virtual students uh, during their obligatory independent English exam. Uh, in its structure, it follows the IELTS examination in uh, that it has its writing, writing part uh, comprises two tasks. Um, the first task requires the student to describe a visual stimulus uh, while uh, accomplishing uh, the task in the provided prompt. Uh, in the second task, uh, the students have to uh, produce an opinion essay uh, 
facing uh, following a uh, provided prompt. Uh, so um, here is just the link to the real life corpus. Um, having manually annotated um, uh, 700 sentences, I devised my own labeling system that covered all the types of such mistakes located in the annotated sentences. Uh, I relied on the uh, description of different types of L1 motivated mistakes provided by Uriel Weinreich uh, in the work that, uh, to the best of my knowledge, was the first uh, explicit definition of um, uh, language interference as a phenomenon. Mm. So uh, here is the general over overview of my classification. Now I will explain it in more detail. So it has um, five categories in total, uh, and the first of them is uh, word form transmission. Uh, this category indicates that a grammar category is transferred from Russian into English, and the result is ungrammatical. For instance, in Russian, there are nouns that are derived from verbs with a certain affix, which may be accompanied by a change in the stem. For example, изменять uh, изменение. Here, by adding ing, uh, the student tried to replicate this process in English. Uh, and the result is uh, in the slide. Uh, the highest changing was in South Asia. As for the uh, second type of mistakes, uh, tense semantics, this category was used uh, in case uh, an English tense mirroring uh, some existing Russian tense uh, was used in a context that is grammatical in Russian but ungrammatical in English. For instance, in Russian, uh, when describing charts and infographics uh, related to the past, uh, it is possible to use uh, the present tense. Uh, thus, when students try to apply the same rule to English, uh, they produce a confusing sentence, like the one presented in the slide. In 1985, the percentage falls down. Mm. As for the third uh, category, it is rather obvious uh, because uh, it, is, uh, trans it is transliteration. Uh, it's, uh, it indicates that a student used uh, English letters to reflect the Russian word without any regard to whether or not uh, it exists in English. I also added to this category the transliterations that actually produce an existing English word. However, the difference in meaning still reveals the origin of the word used by a learner. Uh, for example, in the sentence uh, given in the slide, uh, we can still uh, understand that the word actual in its, uh, comma, in its common sense does not really work here. Uh, that is because it uh, still retains its... Uh, that's because uh, it uh, closely corresponds to a word uh, from Russian aktuálny that can be closely translated as uh, relevant. Uh, it is also worth noting that a well-known term false friends can also refer to such cases. Uh, looking from that angle, it can be posited that uh, students simply assume that a familiar sounding word in English must have the same meaning as in Russian. Uh, the next uh, tag is synonyms. It is one of uh, the, the trickiest. Um, it is one of the trickiest, uh, as it covers cases in which students use an English word to convey one of the one of the possible meanings of the Russian word, and it is the, the wrong one. Uh, so let us consider an example. Uh, in this case, um, they won't reach uh, the same result. Uh, the student was probably thinking of the Russian word destignus. Uh, what they failed to account for is the fact that the Russian word this Russian word corresponds to both reach and achieve in English. Uh, and in this case, uh, reach cannot be used as it, uh, as in English, it generally refers to um, uh, some point of arrival, while achieve is used to talk about uh, some result of a completed action. You have 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Um, so the last category is a copying expression. Uh, this category is used when a student has translated a Russian multi-word fixed expression into English word for word. For instance, in this example, uh, in the complex is a word for word translation of a Russian fixed expression of complexity, which can uh, be closer translated as overall. Uh, so after devising uh, this classification, I had to decide what types of mistakes are the closest to being defined as related to formulaic expressions. Uh, and uh, those were uh, the categories that I intended to um, uh, to examine closer. Mm. So I needed to pinpoint the exact qualities that make a formulaic expression for the purposes of uh, this research. And returning to the definition that I have displayed previously, there is one key aspect that drew my attention. It was stated that the formulaic expressions have to hold a strong relationship in communicating meaning. 
And so I decided that for, for this particular case, the mistakes categorized as synonyms and copying expression uh, satisfy this condition the best. As in the learner's mind, those are collocations used to express a certain explicit meaning that they uh, consciously want to express. Uh, and I also added tense semantics, as uh, in my view, in uh, those cases, the erroneous tense form is still invoked uh, by the context and the urge to convey a specific meaning. Uh, however, both uh, word form transmission and transliteration uh, lack such uh, semantic connections uh, because uh, they stem from um, the uh, form of the Russian verb of the Russian words and the uh, students urge to um, replicate uh, those forms. Thus, I only focus on the uh, former three categories for the analysis. The final dat data set that was used for the neural network training uh, only contained the mistakes of uh, these three types. Uh, now I will explain the process of fine-tuning the neural network. So uh, I used the spacey architecture as the uh, basic framework. I went with this option as it was by far the most convenient out-of-the-box solution. Uh, specifically, the architecture allowed uh, me to easily fine-tune an already existing transformer neuro neural network uh, to check if uh, this actually will work, um, if this actually works. Um, additionally, the uh, SpanCat component of uh, spacey pipeline allowed me to easily implement the markup of the mistakes. Uh, prior to the, to the fine-tuning, I carried out multiple small-scale tests on the dataset that was uh, about, um, um, that was about um, 300 sentences long. And uh, later, I repeated it with uh, 700 sentences that I annotated initially. The aim of those tests was to determine the best configuration settings and the best performing transformer model. Uh, the tests showed that Roberto Base was the most promising architecture. In the slide, you can see the results of some of the tests. Um, but after the first uh, real fine tuning on the full uh, data set, uh, the results uh, appear to be underwhelming. As illustrated in the slide, the overall F score was only 33.58. However, looking at the detailed break breakdown, I noticed that the F scores for each category were significantly different, uh, as illustrated in the table in the slide. Uh, this led me to another idea. Maybe the results would improve if each tag was handled by a separate transformer. To implement such a solution, I needed more data. To fine tune a single transformer, at least a, a thousand examples are required, and I needed uh, over 2,000 more. Uh, so I chose to augment the data um, uh, to uh, save some time and um, uh, and uh, speed up the process. Um, I used uh, mainly three approaches. Uh, the first approach was making use of other datasets in the real lab corpus. So I mainly looked through some datasets uh, from the aforementioned corpus uh, and uh, uh, borrowed the mistakes that uh, were relevant for my dataset. Uh, for example, the mistakes categorized under tense semantics uh, could be found among the mistakes tagged in the corpus as choice of tense. Uh, it was to a degree simpler than annotating manually, but still required a lot of involvement as each example needed to be uh, carefully analyzed. Uh, the second approach was automatic generation. I made use of uh, a Python 3 library uh, to transform already existing sentences to replace one or two words with other close words. Uh, it required the least amount of effort and uh, brought a fair share of sentences, especially in the sense semantics category. However, uh, it was a rather questionable choice and uh, I will explain in more detail when discussing the end result. The final and by far the most effective method was a rather complicated one. To gain the data, I performed the following actions. Having found a certain erroneous context, I manually corrected it and looked the context up in scale corpus. After that, I copied the sentences that came up and it automatically replaced the correct target element in the sentences with the erroneous ones, uh, thus uh, ending up with a number of sentences replicating the initial error. Uh, this approach was beneficial uh, and less labor consuming. And uh, in the sentences um, in the sentences produced uh, with this approach, uh, the neural network could basically only focus on target errors as the rest of the sentence was uh, automatically correct. You have uh, four minutes. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Um, so here's the breakdown of, of the final data set. And um, here are the metrics for, uh, resulting, uh, for, result, for resulting pipelines. 
One of them is the one uh, comprising three separately fine-tuned transformers, and the other one uh, on the right for a single transformer that was trained on the whole data set to detect all three categories of mistakes. I decided to still train it uh, just to compare the two pipelines. And now uh, let's quickly dis discuss the results. Uh, overall, both pipelines are more or less capable of detecting the mistakes. The three-part pipeline uh, detects significantly more mistakes, but it also marks a lot of false positives. Uh, I will now quickly go over uh, some of the correct predictions to better explain them. Uh, in the first sentence, uh, the usage of make is erroneous, because in English this word is used to talk about creating something deliberately, uh, usually by hand. And here the word cause would be more suitable. Uh, however, in Russian, a word like создать can be used in both contexts. Uh, here, one could argue that the phrase создать вред is not too widespread in Russian, uh, but it does exist, uh, and thus the, the prediction can be deemed correct. Um, as for the second example, uh, the collocation on harmful production is a word-for-word -word translation of a Russian phrase на вредную продукцию, on harmful goods. Uh, it can be argued that it is only the last component that is erroneous, thus making the label of uh, synonyms more suitable. Uh, however, in Russian, there is no word that would unite the concept of production and goods, so uh, I'm inclined to uh, deem the uh, prediction as correct. Uh, as for the third sentence, it showcases the poor performance of the 10 semantics uh, transformer specifically, uh, because uh, there are uh, two erroneous verbs, uh, become and get, uh, and only one of them was marked as erroneous. Um, I believe that the poor performance of uh, this pipeline of this transformer is due to the presence of automatically generated sentences that I mentioned above, uh, as they were often un ungrammatical and could have easily thrown off the neural network. As for the single transformer pipeline, it detects uh, significantly less of uh, L1 motivated mistakes, but it is much more precise. Uh, I will now once again briefly go through the examples. Uh, as for the first sentence, um, the word create is used incorrectly, as in English it references the process of making something that has never existed before, uh, while make does not have such a connotation, and it would be more suitable here. Uh, in Russian, however, the verb создать entails both of these meanings, so the prediction is correct. Uh, as for the second sentence, I, I don't think I really need to comment anything aside from the fact that um, uh, in Russian um, it is uh, uh, more common to say достаточно um, большой, enough large, uh, than uh, large enough, большой достаточно. So uh, the prediction is correct. And as for the third uh, sentence, I believe that uh, as for the third sentence, I believe that, um, well, uh, as for the um, 10 semantics overall, uh, in this pipeline, uh, there are uh, significantly less uh, false positives for 10 semantics specifically, and I believe this is due to the fact that the additional examples have uh, diluted the data set. You have the one minute. Mm -hmm. uh, of the problematic sentences. And now just to wrap, to wrap everything up, uh, let's discuss the outcomes and the perspectives of the research. First of all, uh, my research proves that automated detection of such mistakes is entirely within the realm of possible. Uh, both of the pipelines can be used with some skill. My research also shows that the single multi-label pipeline requires larger datasets but provides more correct results. Obviously, further research is required, and in the near future, I want to expand the dataset even further to see if it improves the results. Additionally, I want to um, um, choose more robust metrics for quality control of uh, the further results, and I want to try out different encoders to possibly find the one that will produce uh, a better performance. So thanks a lot for your attention. I will be very grateful for your questions and comments, and any feedback is highly, wel is highly welcomed. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Daria. Now it's time for questions, comments, curiosities. Paolo, did you raise your hand? I tried to clap and press the wrong button. Right, thank you. Anyone with technical background maybe has uh, some more? Yes, yes. 
since you're here, you can also come over. So maybe. <laughs> Hello. So I don't have technical background, and it's not. It's. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, it's not a technical question. It's um, about the error annotation. So I wondered if you have any information about the uh, rate of reliability of that. It looked like you did it sort of by yourself, and error annotation from what I've seen is kind of notoriously unreliable. I wonder if there was any information or data about that. Uh, yes, uh, thanks a lot for your question. It is a, an, a relevant question indeed. Uh, an, inter an inter annotator agreement uh, was indeed carried out, um, but unfortunately I did not uh, have time to include that in the presentation. So I hope that someone would ask so I could uh, share this information. Uh, as for the... Um, as for the internet teacher agreement, uh, I um, uh, I asked uh, for help. I asked uh, some of my fellow students for help, and um, after and having explained to them uh, my uh, classification, I um, uh, I asked them to um, I asked them to annotate. Um, I think. Um, I think around 50 sentences or 70, 70, because uh, this was at the time when I only had um, the 700, um, the 700 uh, sentences uh, uh, done by myself. And so I, um, I asked them to annotate um, 70 sentences, uh, which was uh, one tenth of the materials I had at the time. Uh, and um, I calculated the um, I calculated the uh, internet teacher agreement, and it ended up somewhere in the 80s or um, or in the 70s. Well, it it was uh, more or less reliable. I understand that it comes with um, that the possible limitation uh, might be that uh, the sample for the annotators was too small, and I still cannot in, uh, exclude the uh, possibility that they um, uh, that they might have um, uh, discussed the sentences because there's no telling when it comes to students. Uh, but um, I plan to redo the inter annotator agreement at some point uh, further in the research and. Um, and like, um, well, and uh, uh, maybe change something if the uh, results turn out to be unreliable, but I don't think that uh, the numbers will drop much lower. So that's that. Thank you, Daria. Are there any other questions? No, so we thank once again Daria. Thanks a lot. So we move on to the next presentation that is going to be hybrid. So we're going to have Mariana Bienati here and Paolo Brasolin from um, distance. <laughs> floor is yours. OK, so please, Paolo, yes. Okay. OK, uh, so uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for having hold strong until, until this last session, this last presentations. Uh, my name is Ariana Bianati, and today, together with my colleague uh, Paolo Brasolina, we are going to uh, present our joint work titled Between Order and Disorder, an Ecological View of Lexical Complexity Measures. Next. Right, so. Uh, First of all, um, I will uh, briefly outline the background that fueled our curiosity and drove our research questions of this study. And then uh, little disclaimer, um, there will be a little bit of math, uh, but <laughs> a little bit, uh, but uh, Paolo um, is the expert and we are left in his uh, good ends. So, for the method and the results part, and then I will uh, briefly discuss the findings and try to draw some preliminary conclusions. Next, thanks. Uh, go directly to the yeah. 
we would like to start our presentation by um, a well-cited, well-known, uh, not, not so debated the um, definition of complexity in general that comes from this book by Rescher, um, originally uh, 1998, but this new edition of 2020 um, is what we cited, uh, that defines complexity as uh, a matter of the number and variety of an item's constituent elements and of, uh, of the elaborateness of their interrelational structure. Ne next. And then when uh, this um, general definition is then transferred to lexical and phraseological complexity, so linguistic complexity, then we have different interpretations. Uh, and one of these is uh, the one that complexity is a multidimensional construct. For example, De Klerk uh, in his work of 2015 uh, uses this um, uh, free partite uh, uh, view of complexity uh, of diversity, sophistication and density. And I think that I'm not saying anything new to you. Um, and I think that that was inspired by a seminal paper, a fundamental paper um, written by Wiltenhaus in 2012, who actually uh, suggested it on a more theoretical level and then uh, declared use it for um, this study on vocabulary development. And as well, we have the same idea of um, um, multidimensionality of complexity also in phraseological studies. Uh, for example, the work by Paco is very well known, but we have here an exponent as well <laughs> of many studies that have been conducted with this uh, framework. Um, and phraseological complexity has been defined as a combination of diversity and sophistication applied on uh, syntactically dependent units. And we heard a lot of this next things. Right. Uh, however, if we look at a strictly structural point of view, uh, then we cannot uh, discard the view that was proposed by Pallotti in a very uh, well-known paper um, of uh, 2015 um, that um, says that we should, if we if we look at complexity from a strictly structural point of view, uh, we should discard both density and sophistication as they do not deal with structure and they rest on the idea, for example, density is the rest on the idea that is uh, more complex because it's used by more advanced learners uh, and sophistication um, rests on the idea that um, rare words are more difficult because they're cognitively more difficult. Right, so for example, citing Pallotti, a rare word like tar is not in itself more complex, structurally complex than a one, more than a common one like car. Next. So uh, what we what we did was to uh, build uh, up on on this idea that uh, complexity is something structurally intrinsic and we saw the problems of sophistication having to rely on, on reference corpora and the fact that a change in the reference corpora changes everything. Uh, and we wanted to like look at, in a direction that is um, that has been like studying complexity a lot and uh, came up with very rigorous and solid um, definition, notions and operationalization that is classical information theory in the um, works of Gelman and Kolmogorov. So we can borrow from this field and uh, um, at least two notions um, uh, have been proposed. That, there, that is Kolmogorov algorithmic complexity, that is the amount of total information of a system, and Gelman effective complexity, that is the amount of non-random information on, um, in a system. Both of them can be operationalized as the length of the shortest description of the measured information in a universal description language. The only thing that changes is the kind of um, information um, in which we are interested. In one case is the total amount of information, in the other case is the non-random one and uh, Paolo will be happy uh, because defining non-random is non-trivial but we let this for another time. Right, so next. Uh, yeah, sure. And none of this is news because both uh, typ typological literature and applied linguistic studies have been citing this kind of concepts. So, yeah. Um, 
but let's look at their behaviors uh, more closely. So Kolmogorov complexity, being interested in the total amount of information increases with disorder. Um, so it peaks when there is complete disorders as in the snowy screen that you see on the right of the, um, of the graph. Um, instead, what we are interested in usually is not complete disorder, but Disorder, yes, until random, randomness starts prevailing. So we would like to capture the rich structure as in the cabbage section that you see in the middle. And Gelman effective complexity is actually what it does. So it peaks when there is rich structure and it vanishes for both simple order as in the chessboard or uh, complete disorder as in the snowy screen. Um, and this has been already done in other fields such as ecology, um, and we would like to see if it is applicable also to linguistics. So next to the research questions. Yeah, so what we would like to do. First, we would like to see if what we use uh, is actually either of the two, no? either Gelman or Kolmogorov. So which notion of complexity is measured by the used measures that we usually use for lexical diversity? And if none of the lexical diversity indices um, that are used is measuring Gelman, that is our uh, target, uh, are there such measures designed in other fields that can be used on text? And then I hand over to Paolo for the methods. Thanks, Ariana. So uh, this is a bird's eye view of what we did. First, we gather a few corpora, then we synthesize some more data to uh, complement them. We processed it, which just amounts to tokenizing and lemmatizing everything using Stanford Stanza. Then we uh, computed a few selected metrics on every text. And finally, we faced the data and analyzed a few patterns. So the four corpora we chose try to span the uh, spectrum from expert to learner. The first one, Eric Science Blog, is short form, uh, uh, highly technical um, academic prose published online. Uh, the second one is a small slice we took from Coris, which also is academic prose and is expected to be a little more heterogeneous in terms of styles, complexity and text length. Then there is two learner corpora. One is the yet unpublished Ithaca, which is text from high schoolers. And finally, uh, Leonid, which is a uh, text um, written by middle schoolers. Now, the synthetic data, what, uh, what is it that we tried to do? Basically, we took the um, original data and tried to synthesize more data by pulling it uh, into the two different direction of the order disorder axis. Basically to try and pull towards order, uh, we took the first fourth of the text and repeat it. And then to pull even further, we took the first 16th of the text and repeated it. Basically this artificially creates more order and repetition. Then in the opposite direction, we first shuffled the tokens uh, which is um, equivalent to sampling the text uh, using the original probabilities uh, of the uh, tokens. And to randomize it even further, we resampled it, ignoring the original probabilities and just picking words at unique words at random. Uh, you have so, 10 minutes. Thank you. So what are the metrics that we chose? The first one is an old friend. The type to token ratio is just uh, the count of token types divided by uh, the count of tokens. Um, it's simple, it's well known, and it's mostly ineffective when comparing text of different lengths. And this is a known effect uh, due to the diverging increasing rates of uh, the two involved numbers. There are a few uh, suggested solutions, uh, givels, defined R as an empirical correction, uh, basically using a different exponent in the denominator. But we can also try to patch it um, via statistical means. Uh, for example, using the moving average TTR, which just calculates the TTR on a moving window and averages the results uh, along the texts. Both of these metrics try to answer the question, how diverse are types? 
Now, let's get a little bit fancier. Um, once we count all the tokens, we can calculate the, their probabilities or relative frequencies, if you prefer. And once we have that information, we can compute the entropy associated with every token. What's that? Uh, entropy quantifies the amount of information associated to observing a given token. Or um, in a more intuitive way, it quantifies the surprise associated with observing a given token. Why is that surprise? Because the smallest the probability, the biggest the information uh, associated with the token is, and the biggest is your surprise when you observe it. You can average the entropy of every token, ob obtain um, entropy associated with the whole text. And it can be proven that the um, maximum value entropy uh, assumes on a text is the logarithm of the number of types. That can be annoying for some uses, so one can normalize entropy and define uh, uh, evenness, which is a similar quantity, but independent of the number of types. Both these metrics uh, answer the question, how surprising is the average token in the text? And now that you know about entropy, let's get even fancier. Um, one might ask, what is the um, difference in uh, surprise I have between two ad adjacent tokens? Uh, you can define that uh, just as the difference of uh, entropy between a pair of token, which is gamma ij in this case, and then uh, again, average it over the whole text. In this case, you need to average it uh, over all possible pairs of token or uh, bigrams or tra status transitions, depends on your point of view, but it's just equivalent descriptions. If you perform the calculation, it turns out it's always zero. So this is uh, underwhelming, but an interesting quantity is its mean squared deviation from its average. This need not to be zero and has already been used in a few different fields uh, to quantify uh, complexity and richness of structure and usually goes by the name of fluctuation complexity. And I want you to notice that in that last formula on the left, not only the probabilities of each token appear, but also the probability of uh, each bigram. So now uh, we have uh, all the text, all the synthetic data, and we compute all the metrics on all of them. We, we will plot some uh, box plots looking for patterns, and we are interested, uh, especially in two orthogonal direction. We want to seek patterns across the uh, original corpora to see whether the metrics can actually differentiate between experts and learners. And then we want to seek patterns for every corpus, um, across its variants uh, to classify essentially the behavior of the metrics into Kolmogorov and Gelman complexity measures. So what did we find? Uh, TTR based metrics uh, behave more or less as expected. They are sensitive to increased order. As you see, the blue part of the spectrum is lower and are insensitive to increased disorder. So they are by definition, unable to detect shuffling and barely change on uh, the uniform variant of the texts. R uh, is a slight improvement over TTR, as you can see it has higher variance on the Coris corpus and lower values for the learner corpora. And uh, um, as far as global behavior is concerned, only uh, the moving average TTR exhibits uh, somewhat Kolmogorovian behavior across variants but uh, it ends up being basically flat across different corporas. This is probably uh, an issue due to the small window size we had to choose to uh, make it work on Leonid, which has pretty short texts. Entropy oh, and evenness are a bit more interesting as they uh, do detect disorder and uh, react much better to increased uh, uh, order. And uh, Evenness is uh, Kolmogorov, as you can see, and uh, Gel, uh, pardon me, uh, Evenness is Gelman, while Entropy is uh, Kolmogorov as a global behavior. But this is the star of the show, which is fluctuation complexity. And as all the features we desire, it's higher on expert corpora, lower on learners. It's more dispersed on cores, which is more heterogeneous. 
decreases with increasing order, decreases with increasing order, disorder too. And so overall exhibits markedly Gelman behavior. So now the question is, do we have a winner? And back to Ariane that wants for this. Right, thank you. And yeah, I will briefly discuss uh, these findings going back to the first definition of complexity that we uh, saw. That it's complexity is a matter of the number and variety of an item's constituent elements and of the elaborateness of their interrelational structure. Well, TTR based measures uh, seem to uh, not account for variety of the elements since they are concerned only with the number of the types and they don't see the structure because they are back of words approached approaches. They are um, affected by text length dependency and common solutions are either empirical normalization or statistical averaging, but they don't seem to fit either Kolmogorov or Gelman complexity. Entropy based measures um, for sure account for different like for variety in the information of the uh, single types that we have in the text, but they fail to account for any structure by definition because they are as well bag of words approaches. Um, however, they are, sing, uh, they are principal notions and they resemble Kolmogorov uh, when entropy is not normalized per lexicon size and Gelman when it is normalized by lexicon size. Factuation complexity seems to satisfy Rescher definition because it accounts for the number and the variety of elements via their probabilities and for their interrelational structure via probabilities and net information gains of bigrams. So the fact that always is always computed on transitions between states gives this um, interesting result of being different on real text and a little bit lower on shuffled ones. Um, furthermore, it exhibits a markedly Gelman behavior, capturing our intuitive notion of effective complexity. Next. So what are the take home messages to wrap up? Uh, TTR based measures uh, capture repetition for sure. We saw that they were sensitive to increased order, but probably not complexity. Uh, so let's be careful when we use them of the construct that we are measuring. Uh, entropy based measures are an improvement, but they still are. They see text as a bag of words, so they don't capture the structure the nice structure that you can see in the cross section of the red cabbage um, and fluctuation complexity does a better job um, in capturing this intuitive uh, notion. Um, next. So what do we have on our hands? Um, we seem to have one be well behaved metric measuring Gelman complexity of text is a metric that has been used in other fields that comes from a field that is very solid in these studies. However, while high scores denote richness of structure, and we're, um, we know that it's like that, uh, low ones are opaque because we don't know if they're caused by either by order or disorder. Computing a Kolmogorov measure that complements Gelman measures could answer um, that question. And so what we would like to do next, and we're very happy to hear your feedback, um, is to um, study and a little bit deepening um, our research into Kolmogorov measures, since there has been a lot of um, studies um, dealing with that, and uh, how, how far can we get by complementing the two measures, and uh, if we can extend this study with new metrics, uh, new corpora, and new synthesis to give um, more um, perfect. I'm done. <laughs> um, a more thorough overview of this bell shaped or uh, orthogonal shape. So thank you very much and we welcome your questions. So thank you, Ariana and Paolo. It's time for questions. I saw the first Nate here. There you go. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Um, I think Gabriele will be very happy. It's very uh, <laughs> related to his uh, theory of complexity. Um, yeah, and I think you've touched on a lot of important things that we really need to keep in mind with what are we measuring when we're measuring, we say we're measuring complexity. 
Um, but I would ask you, right, despite the fact that this fluctuation complexity seems to be useful for um, for measuring pure, simple view of complexity, right? What is the, the second language acquisition theories that would explain this, right? What Why are the learners, um, why is their proficiency explained by fluctuation complexity, right? Is there some sort of developmental reason there, right? Because we're not just a theorist of complexity, we're also a second language acquisition researchers, right? So how do these tie together? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, this is left for further research. I'm, I'm looking uh, at uh, Gabriele now because um, he uh, was, I think, uh, one of the um, advocates for um, actually having a very well-defined a priori definition of complexity and then see if it correlates with proficiency. So we didn't do that in this study because we were already yeah. Full of, of, of other problems to deal with, um, and Paolo was truly a manna dal cielo to, <laughs> <laughs> to solve those issues. Uh, but for sure, um, this is something that needs to be empirically proven, empirically studied. Right? We, I, I don't, um, I don't know if I want a concert of complexity that is already uh, entangled uh, with proficiency. Yeah, and, and to be clear, I'm not saying that it should be, but I'm saying like, what are we expecting a measure should do when it comes to learners, right? So like looking at usage base, like is this because of contingency learning, right? That we're expecting uh, a high surprise or high entropy in a learner text, right? So we may not see developmental trends with proficiency, but we should have a theoretical reason for using a measure before we use it beyond just, oh, this seems to fit a, uh, a philosophical reason, uh, definition of complexity. But what are we expecting in terms of our learners? So, yeah, so maybe, right, LS and usage-based theories, how does that connect to? Yeah, this is, this is for sure a super interesting question. So two things comes to my mind, and I don't know, Paolo, if you want to intervene, you just stop me. Eh? This could be somewhat connected to our backup slide in the sense that maybe the clarification about what we are secretly modeling could yeah. shed some light. Yeah, if you want to show that. Yeah, thanks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we are secret. Secretly modeling. Sounds yeah. really obscure, but it's it, it's a lot of text. Um, so basically, this was thought uh, to answer a question about text length dependence. But actually, um, this uh, sheds some light about what we are actually modeling when we talk about entropy, because uh, there's a lot of uh, ink about trying to normalize and make these metrics text length independent, but uh, we um, come up with the idea that perhaps this is just due to uh, conflating sample size issues with not having a defined idea of what we are modeling and the notion of uh, intensive uh, and extensive measure, which is, uh, for example, densities uh, versus weight. Uh, so the point is that once you use entropy as we did, uh, this implicitly forces um, the system you are studying not to be the texts. Uh, specifically, uh, tokens are the states. The lexicon is the state spaces. So it's the family of states that the system can be at any given moment. And the text is a um, sequence of states. So it's a trajectory that the system takes in time. So basically, the system is actually the writer. And what you are doing by taking the text and calculating those probabilities is building an um, approximation of the um, ideal model that will represent the uh, mental lexicon of the writer. So text length effects uh, do not affect the value of the metrics, or at least well-defined metrics but they do affect the, um, the uncertainty on those numbers. 
And I think that uh, clarifying that what you are modeling is not the text itself, but the, the writer maybe can help answer at least a, a, a little bit of your question. Yeah, hi, thank you. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, speaking of um, text length, could you say maybe a few more words about the text length dependency on the measures that you? Yeah, explored? yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so to, to clarify, um, basically metrics like entropy, evenness and fluctuation complexity, which are defined on the collection of probabilities that uh, token types have, are not text dependent. Uh, Usually, one is led to think about text dependent by the due to the shortcomings of TTR, but these metrics do not have them, and the reason is uh, somewhat subtle, and it is what I try just try to describe. One, uh, since entropy is extensive, so it's a global property of the system. One is led to think that yeah, maybe if I take two copies of the same text, uh, entropy will double. Uh, that's not what happens. Entropy does not change. Uh, maybe if I take two completely different texts and join them uh, one near another, entropy will be the sum. No, that also doesn't happen. And the reason is that yes, entropy is expensive, but the system is not the text. Uh, the system is the writer. So what you, you are doing, uh, taking longer texts, is not um, taking a different system. It's just uh, taking a, a bigger sample to approximate the dynamics of the system which you are studying, which is the writer. And that's ultimately is the reason why all these metrics are by definition not text length dependent. The are uncertainty with which you can calculate them is, and that is an interesting and well posed question. And uh, just to tie this up, this is the reason, the, the essential reason why TTR does not really work and isn't really fixable from this point of view because it's a property of the sample, not the system. Thank you. So one last question. Just a quick, sorry, just a quick question on the mathematical part. Uh, yeah. You have, you are classifying your metrics into Kolmogorov, Kolmogorov style behavior, let's say, yeah. which your weights increase, and then as a Gilman behavior that increase and then go down with a parabolic shape. Can you exclude the, the existence of metrics that are bimodal or multimodal? I mean that they go up, down and up again? No, uh, no, absolutely not. I mean, uh, these two classes of um, com me complexity measures are defined as such just because they capture intuitive ideas what we would like complexity to be. So uh, if one could come up with some useful description of complexity, which maybe behaves in more complex uh, ways with relation to our notion of order or disorder, that's certainly possible. And it certainly is possible to actually come up with computation. We produce more complex behavior. These two uh, are, are just um, abstractions and uh, way behaviors which you would expect from uh, um, metrics capturing some kind of intuition. Uh, Kolmogorov is uh, uh, how long is the algorithm you need to produce a given output. And Gelman complexity is uh, how much non-random stuff is in what you're looking at. Th these are the basic ideas. There could be others. Thank you for the answer. So thanks a lot, Ariane and Paolo. Unfortunately, <laughs> time flies and we need to move on to our last presentation for today. Thanks, Paolo. Thank you.
Here we are. We have so here we have our last two presenters, Sibel Ibeck, yes, and Sen Chan. Jem Chan. Okay, the floor is yours. Hello everyone, thanks for staying for the graveyard slot. <laughs> sorry for that, I was supposed to present actually earlier, but I couldn't. I'm sorry for the inconvenience as well. And I'm very happy to be here as well uh, and to present uh, in front of such an audience. Uh, so, language communication relies to a large extent uh, on combination of words that customarily co occur. And um, these uh, multi-word items are also suggest that the language we use every day is composed of prefabricated expressions rather than being strictly compositional. And um, these units are the key to comprehension and fluency as they re reduce the processing effort. And these also serve as an indicator to the degree which students belong to the particular discourse community. And uh, in both respects, actually, ideology um, has been shown to be one of the aspects that unmistakably distinguish, distinguish native speakers of a language from L2 learners. So our study um, consists, actually combines uh, three corpus driven methods as the um, to examine the phraseology of novice uh, and expert academic writing. Uh, these are frequency lists, keywords and lexical bundles. Uh, learner corpus, actually we combine learner corpus research with the contrastive analysis. And uh, there are two dimensions of contrast. First, novice academic writers, L1 and L2, and the second one is novice and expert writers. So our uh, actually, main goal is to um, explore the areas that phraseology may distinguish between native uh, speakers of English and advanced DFL learners. So here are the corpora we used in our study. We used Tickle as the Turkish DFL learners uh, corpus. This is actually a sub corpus of ICO, uh, International Corpus of Learner English. Uh, the argumentative essay gathered at our own and also University of Mustafa Kemal, by a team uh, led by Mr. Jem. And uh, Loplus is again an administrative essay from A level essay and British student, university student essay. Actually, Loplus also has the American students essay and literary essays as well, but I had to, we had to include, um, exclude them. And uh, we use the PNC as the L1 expert corpus. Uh, out of 100 million words, we created our corpus um, around 182,181 words. Uh, we chosen uh, academic research published miscellaneous from the social sciences domain. So we first used, first step was the subsection actually, uh, subsection of a frequency lists. We wanted to have a look at the uh, LY adverbs since they are highly representative and apparent in the academic prose. Uh, and they are also finite function diverse and uh, occurring within all syntactic classes of adverbs. So here are the types and tokens of our uh, adverbs in our corpora. Uh, for the cutoff points, we cut off um, to, at three in Twitter and not as well. However, uh, 10 in the BNC. These are the types and tokens. First, I wanted to, we wanted to make sure and normalize the sizes since the corpora sizes are not equal. Um, this uh, look like will results reveal an underuse in Turkish learners, which was which is expected. 
And uh, there's an overuse in Nautilus uh, as well in comparison to the BNC. Uh, also, the uh, following circuit, Haas and Hasselgaard's uh, syntactical classes uh, of adverbs, we categorized them into six uh, categories. The most challenging part was this because um, we had to go through it took a lot of time since we had to look at their context uh, to see uh, which group they really belong because sometimes they may belong to more than one group or uh, totally depending on the context. Uh, this is the syntactic classes of uh, LY adverbs. Uh, their representation in the three corpora suggests that um, actually suggests what LY adverbs um, suggest in uh, general. Adjunct, adjunct and modifiers are the most uh, three frequent adverbs in uh, the written texts as well. Uh, and this is the breakdown of LY adverbs in the NC corpus. And the most of the adverbs were context bound. Uh, and uh, Elvon published papers, the academic expert writers uh, display a phrasal complexity um, typical of structurally compressed language like absolutely sure or merely irritating. And these are the unique expressions used in the experts used by expert writers. Uh, they were not found in our article and uh, in Locus as well. And this is the breakdown of adverbs in Locus corpus. And in our tickle corpus. So then we have a look at the uh, repertoire of the words. Uh, is that L2 writers tend to use modifiers uh, typical of spoken rather than um, written language. Um, and these are, for instance, completely different or slightly different uh, kind of structures. This was also apparent in Granger's um, and Rayson's study as well. Uh, we also had a look at the most frequent LY modifiers in the three corpora. As we can see, the only um, only the uh, most frequent one in three corpora and only especially and probably are the uh, are the common uh, adverbs in three corpora. And uh, then we have a look at the number of modifiers, the tokens uh, shared by the L1 writers. Um, we can see that they are higher than the um, novice L2 writers. Right. And this suggests that compared to the expert writers, um, novice writers rely on more restricted range of adverbs in their written productions. Uh, second step was the keyword uh, analysis to see what constructions uh, expert academic writers employ that L2 novice writers lack in their essays. And uh, we adopted a similar approach to Groom here uh, by taking a closed class grammatical keywords as the basis for further qualitative analysis. Um, the most salient grammatical keywords were of, that, to, and for, and typical lexical bundles containing these grammatical keywords um, are as such. And BNC corpus was used as the study corpus with the learner tickle as the reference corpus. And the second step of this analysis uh, consisted of, consisted of um, analyzing three and four word lexical bundles, which comprise these keywords. And um, here are uh, 10 of the most frequent um, usage when we compare the bundles. Uh, 
uh, unit used used in the DMP expert writing variety of a wide range of development of in terms of and also expert writers use um, specific linking devices such as in terms of in relation to um, to express connections among ideas uh, more explicitly in the text. And work to be constructions are used frequently by expert academic writers, for example, for the typo, um, appears to be, for instance, in the BNC, this is not also apparent in our typical corpus, and believed to be. These constructions are very, very frequent uh, in expert writing. Uh, well, students actually, we have to. Uh, well, these are not apparent in tickle. Instead, novice writers use model uh, verb constructions a lot. Like we have to, that you can, could be argued as. And the last one is the lexical bundles. Last approach, um, this actual lexical bundle carry another um, importance for me because they are uh, any more like children of mine because I also studied them in my PhD for years. Um, there, there have been many studies um, stating differences in the use of these bundles, both in no novice and expert writers. And um, for the analysis of LBs, uh, forward lexical bundles with a minimum frequency of 10 for BNC, 3 for locking, 10, 5 for tickle has been ranged, and the disperse, dispersion range was 3. Um, and the bundles comprising topic specific words were excluded, such as the introduction of the topics or the um, name of the essays. Content bundles were disregarded. Uh, I'm sorry for this table. <laughs> It's very, very yeah. And on the other hand, what also uh, Philip mentioned, and I <laughs> immediately highlighted, on the other hand, it's very frequent in our tickle purpose. Also, this was also the case in uh, Czech uh, EFL learners, also uh, Norwegian EFL learners as well. Uh, novice writers, actually, when we look at this, uh, we can see that our uh, L2 writers seem to employ a broader range of recurrent bundles with the top ones um, occurring with high frequencies. Actually, this was also uh, what Philip mentioned that they use uh, different kinds of uh, bundles more than uh, expert writers. This was also the case in our data. And they tend to reuse a small number of bundles to a greater extent than native speakers. This was also the case in Hasselgard's study. And Turkish EFL learners tend to overuse a relatively small number of academic bundles when compared to the both Locus and BNC. Uh, this was also the case in Chen and Baker's and Adelan Erman's studies. Their learners were uh, Korean and, uh, no, sorry, Chinese and um, Swedish. Learners, Sofia FL learners. Uh, so after we extracted these bundles, we classified them according to their functions, and we used Fiber et al.'s functional classification. There were three uh, categories: sense bundles, course organizers, and referential bundles. Uh, so functional classification of lexical bundles in the BNC. Um, Nocnus and Intico. And I also wanted to make sure to normalize the size of the corpora and the localizing of results of functional types between the corpora. As we can see, Intico again, the uh, shape learners have underused. Uh, most of the expressions compared to the native ones. Um, as for the locknus, is the case that we see an overuse in the locknus data in comparison to the BNC. Uh, this was also apparent in many studies uh, since they use different kinds of constructions. And I also um, cut down was also 
way lower than the BNC. I have to mention that. And uh, again, for the tickle, uh, there were many, many um, repeated expressions. That's why there's an um, overuse in the uh, And functional classifications revealed that um, among writers, both experts and students use descriptive research oriented patterns like the ways in which or it's impossible to related to expression attitudes. Uh, these bundles were not also apparent in uh, Pickle. Some of the examples from the BNC. And also more sense oriented patterns can be observed among novice writers, such as I would like to, and I think it is. Uh, this is also the case in Fargo et al's study that uh, novice writers seem to express themselves more in uh, their written texts. And one of the examples again, I would like to from the tickle. And novice writers produce bundles comprising modal verbs a lot. It could be argued, could be argued that can be seen. The form plus can be seen in. And these are my references. Thank you. Thank you. So, round of questions, curiosity, comments. Integrations. Hi, thank you for the very interesting presentation. Um, yeah, I also have a place in my heart for lexical bundles, so I'm glad <laughs> you talked about those. Um, about lexical bundles, um, I found it difficult for myself to use the the Biber at all classification that I found a lot of bundles, at least for French, that don't easily fit into one of the categories. Is that also something you experience and do you have any reflections on that? Categorize them. Also for the study as well, I've been uh, trying for months. Um, I had to go through their context simply, and I used one man's grammar at least one by one, page by page. Yeah, that's, that was the case in all of my studies. But generally, the categories worked. It just took time. Or would you suggest new categories? Or any thoughts on that? Thank you. Any other questions? I have a very quick one and I was wondering if OK, it took many years even to categorize and classify these bundles. Uh, have you maybe with a smaller sample try to have someone else uh, annotate it or categorize it to see if actually your intuition uh, coincides with while deciding any of these uh, that's why i had to use a um, list of fiber and cortex uh, lists there were more than two or three lists and for the bundles that's um, not apparent in the lists i had to go their contexts to see in which meanings they were used. And I had to ask, of course, um, my supervisor, as he said as well. And yeah, for those bundles, um, we had to, after checking their uh, contexts, we had to go through them again and again in previous studies I mean, to see uh, which categories they were added to. 
Okay. I suppose though that even natives may have to have a, a double coder just in case. <laughs> so well, I think this session has come to its end. I'm gonna leave the floor. Yes, this session has come to an end and the first day of our conference has come to an end. So thank you to all the presenters and um, participants for this first lovely day. Thanks for the discussions. Um, we will be meeting at 8 p.m. at the restaurant Da Cesarino, which is a short walk from here. I just want to remind everyone who booked for the dinner that you don't need to pay up front. You just pay at the restaurant after you've had your meal. Um, <laughs> so just relax. In case um, some of you want to join us for the dinner but did not register for the dinner, you can come along if you like. The restaurant is very accommodating in terms of numbers and also in terms of special dietary requirements. So if you haven't booked and if you need a special meal, just come along if you feel like it. Um, there's no problem at all. But before we go on to the dinner, there is something else that's left, which is the visit on the terrace of this building. So Stefania will take you upstairs where you'll be able to see this 360 degree terrace that we have in this building and from which you'll be able to view uh, Perugia by night. So thank you all and see you later.